Good morning, everyone. It is so lovely to have you all here today. My name is Allie Cole. I am the symposium director for the Journal of Law and Public Policy for the University of St. Thomas. Thank you all so much for being here. We are so excited for all of our panelists today. Um, but before we begin, I'd like to introduce the Dean of our law school, um, Rob Fisher, who has some opening remarks before we begin. Good, thank you, Allie. I wanna welcome everybody to the Journal of Law and Public Policy's Fall Symposium. I wanna thank all the students who've worked hard to make this happen, especially Allie Cole and Professor Charles Reed for providing enormously helpful support. Uh, it's fitting that this symposium on neuroscience and the law is taking place at a Catholic law school as insights from neuroscience shed light on so many questions that are central to our pursuit of human flourishing and the common good. Jacques Maritain, perhaps the most influential Catholic philosopher of the 20th century, was instrumental in the development of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In doing so, he was able to facilitate consensus across diverse cultures, worldviews, and faith traditions. He was intensely interested in how our minds work. He believed that the moral sense of humans comes through intuition. The possibility of consensus did not depend on shared philosophical premises. He firmly believed that understandings of right and wrong could be shared. And that consensus was more, in his view, a function of inclination than concept. Knowledge by inclination, according to Maritain, quote, is obscure, unsystematic, vital knowledge in which the intellect, in order to bear its judgments, consults and listens to the inner melody that the vibrating strings of abiding tendencies make present in the subject. Jacques Maritain would love to be here today. He embodies the Catholic tradition, knowing that science is no threat to faith and that the depth of our moral insights depends in part on their grounding in reality. How do we know what we know? Why do we believe what we believe? How do belief and knowledge function in relationship to our will? These are central to the question of human identity and human flourishing. I'm so grateful to all of our speakers for sharing their expertise with us today. Welcome to the Journal of Law and Public Policy Fall Symposium. And I'll turn it back over to Allie. Thank you so much, Dean Vischer, for those really wonderful words. Um, we are, I think that you made really great points about how this is really important for our school and what we're gonna discuss today. So with that said, I will hand it over to our, um, our faculty advisor, Dr. Charles Reed, um, who will introduce our first panelists. Dr. Well, Reed. Good well, good morning, Allie. Thank you, Dean Vischer. Thank you. I wanna thank you, Dean Vischer, for your, your your words this morning and also your support for the journal as, as we've gone along. So thank you. I want to uh, thank Allie Cole and, and Carl Erickson and Jack Buck and the other students who have played such a, a major role in all of this. And um, I'd like to thank Xander Moser, our, um, our computer support person who's uh, provided enormous help for us also. Um, uh, all of this, uh, every human endeavors are cooperative endeavors. And um, there are many other names I, I could mention uh, that um, I, I cannot get into, but uh, I want to thank everyone who's, who's played a part in this. That said, we, we should launch uh, our event. And the, this morning's panel, our first speaker is Professor Jennifer Brobst. She's a professor of law at the University of Southern Illinois. I've uh, looked uh, uh, at uh, her prior scholarship. It is very, very impressive. She's written on uh, I, one of my favorite articles is her article on, on revisiting consent to assault in, the, in gladiator games, by which she means boxing and martial arts and football. And uh, it's, a, it's a very provocative article. Um, she's written other... Uh, other important works, Miranda in Mental Health is another important work. Um, and this morning she will address the, uh, the balance, uh, the balance that exists that should prevail between crime victims' perspectives, uh, having been uh, grievously wronged or harmed in, in the course of criminal misconduct, 
and uh, the neurological disorders of the perpetrators. It's an important balance to strike. And Professor Brokst uh, uh, will strike it very well, I suspect. So I want to thank her for participating. Um, and um, shall I introduce the other speakers now, Ali, or after the uh, after Professor Brokst? Let's have Professor Brokst go first, and then we yep. can introduce everybody subsequently. That's that's a good idea. Thank you, Professor Brokst. Please. Thank you very much, Dr. Reed. And thank you to the Dean and to Ms. Cole in particular, I know worked very hard on this and the other student editors. It's a pleasure to be here. And I would add Dr. Reed that Gladiator Sports article was one of my favorites as well. I really, I really enjoyed, enjoyed that one. Um, you'll gather from Dr. Reed's comments that my practice area has been in mental health law, but also criminal law which is um, not a very common overlap. I'm a former prosecutor, but also a legal director of a medical mental health center for about 10 years that worked uh, very closely with both victims of crime and criminal defendants, particularly young people. And, and so the interplay of uh, moral culpability in particular and capacity has been a longstanding interest of mine. I'm gonna share my PowerPoint here and so we can get going, there we go. And I have a much longer title, but I'm for today, I'm giving you a snapshot, um, given that I only have 15 to 20 minutes of what might be um, perhaps um, some of the more interesting uh, specific parts of what I will be writing about. So in general though, I'm particularly interested in retribution as opposed to uh, rehabilitation as an aspect of where neuroscience can help. And I will just say from the outset that in the research related to neuroscience and defendants, I keep repeatedly reading that neuroscience doesn't help very much with determinations of moral culpability and that psychology, psychiatry and determinations of capacity help more in terms of intellectual capacity, impulse control. So just to begin with an outline, you'll see to the left, my proposal uh, to participate in this symposium specifically addressed mass incarceration and the decarceral movement to reduce that. You'll see here on the left, um, in red are the rates over time of uh, increasing incarceration in prison. Blue is in jail. There is uh, an undeniable, undeniable increase, of course, in terms of how we're using the prison system to address uh, social control and human behavior. And of course, we know, as you see here uh, in the middle column, if we're talking about neuroatypical defendants, defendants who might have a traumatic brain injury or a genetic condition, um, uh, persons who are on the spectrum, persons who have cognitive disabilities. We have, of course, uh, they say that there are more people in the prison system with serious mental illness than there are in mental health institutions. So that being said, that's the state of America and how we're approaching this. In the meantime, we have US Supreme Court decisions that are providing an insight into an evolving uh, approach, I think, to mental health in the criminal justice system. Atkins, of course, addressing cognitive disability and the death penalty. Um, Roper addressing neuroscience and the juvenile brain and the death penalty. All of these showing greater empathy and greater understanding that uh, persons are capable of rehabilitation, persons are deserving of uh, a greater leniency. And then we come to Collar in 2020, the decision that said uh, addressing insanity in state courts and suggesting that um, states still have a great deal of discretion in whether they, uh, whether and how they approach moral culpability in criminal defendants who have serious mental illness. In the meantime, we're also seeing, particularly with sex offenders, uh, experimenting with longstanding involuntary commitment after 
risk assessments like static 99 measures so that they may never be released if they are deemed a permanent uh, risk to society. We're also seeing a lot of research, and I know I'm summarizing very quickly and it's 8.30 in the morning or 6.30 in the morning for Californians, but this concept of why don't we anesthetize inmates? Why don't we address their, um, um, with medication, uh, how, whether inmates are a danger to society and there are serious debates around the morality of that and how it impacts justice, particularly for crime victims as well. I have written in the past about use of surveillance. Um, if the prison system and mass incarceration is deemed unjust, well, then what do we do with uh, persons who have been convicted who are out in the community? And so I have been interested and I'm interested in my co-panelists on this topic as well in the use of artificial intelligence, um, even as well in solitary confinement in the prison settings that we just simply isolate people. But we have, again, concerns related to it causes madness and it exacerbates the problem. And then finally, and very important, I think that the concept of who gets incarcerated in the first place, um, why in mass, it, mass incarceration disproportionately impa impacts communities of color, poor communities, and we cannot escape the reality that we're talking about communities that don't have access to good health yeah. in the first place. And so that's a component in terms of the fairness of all of this. But I am extending this conversation to the impact on crime victims. Um, I have early in my career um, worked as an advocate on crime victim issues. I have since extended that certainly to defendants' rights. But the conversa conversation seems to be missing the voice of crime victims on how they feel about um, all these different alternatives in addressing our mass incarceration problem. Do crime victims also agree that persons should find alternatives out in the community? Or do they agree with involuntary commitment? Do they agree with use of medications to essentially anesthetize inmates? And shouldn't their voice be heard? So I took upon uh, myself on this research to examine how what's been happening with the courts just when I thought the crime victims' rights were really on an uptick. So this is a very loose timeline. I've got, I call it a dual timeline above the line is, is just generally um, sort of a trend in time in terms of the crimes victims voice and rights um, increasing over time below the line um, approaches to defendants. I know it's very, very general here, but if we, if we look here at the left and we consider truly early days of a view of the criminal justice system in terms of a private prosecution, there, of course, the crime victim's voice had tremendous impact. It, it was not deemed a public prosecution until a little bit later. And it may also have been that certain sentences had criminal defendants actually sentenced to uh, work on the property or the farm of the person um, who had prosecuted them. And it was a much more closer relationship between the crime victim and um, the defendant. Of course, we, as mental health uh, research and treatment began to become, uh, I hate to say better, but it, perhaps it, it has certainly become better and um, more knowledgeable and we're still working so hard on that. Rehabilitation became a real opportunity for defendants. It also happened to coincide here in the middle um, with an increasing hostility toward crime victims until there was a certain point when I was a prosecutor in the 1990s that uh, crime victims, it, I used to think it was like they were just a body. They were just evidence, you know, and, um, and sometimes not even really a witness. And we also saw defendants filing civil defamation claims against victims who reported crime. We saw um, the anti-SLAPP statute, strategic lawsuits against public participation having to be enacted to protect victims of crime from, from civil attacks. We saw judges putting victims in jail for contempt when they no longer wanted to cooperate with the system. 
and something needed to be done. We had this crime victims rights movement that, um, that really was quite successful. Every state constitution, um, federal statutes all provide crime victims with numerous rights. And then of course, um, neuroscience started uh, to really take hold, which I'm delighted to see. Um, and, and then the pandemic hits. So just to give you an example of how far we've come in terms of crime victims' rights, and this includes crime victims who, who have, um, I think the, my favorite right that I've seen in court is that, that victim impact statement. I've certainly had crime victims approach me during the plea process, but the victim impact statement is just so powerful and influences um, in particular the judge at sentencing and in particular, given what kind of defendant we have, including neuroatypical defendants, crime victims will have an opinion on what's appropriate there. Um, here in Arizona this year um, was quite a remarkable case um, out of the Supreme Court where they applied their own state constitutional provision. They agreed that the victim's attorney did not have to sit in the gallery, could sit with the other, uh, the prosecutor and the defense attorney when the victims, uh, crime victims rights were at issue and needed to be uh, exercised. And there was also this statutory right to full restitution, could not cap restitution without the victim's consent. And so they were quite powerful. And then um, I wanted to point out that when the decision was rendered, it was still during the pandemic. And, and the court stated that um, a trial court's discretion and how to manage these rights to address seating arrangements during the pandemic must honor the victim's constitutional right to be present, heard, and to be treated with fairness, dignity, and respect. Of course, these are all things we also should be um, treating the defendant with as well. And I think you'll see a theme in my presentation of, of bringing in humanity and truly a societal voice to a greater extent into the proceedings uh, in a criminal case. There are numerous sentencing theories. My own article will get into the weeds and retributivist um, theories. There are very, there are an awful lot, but you'll see these general categories that first year law students learn in criminal law um, that are uh, very much still at issue. Um, all of these are still being tried. We could argue that in the beginning, solitary confinement um, was deemed actually uh, rehabilitation, particularly if, if one was um, only given the Bible to read or was supposed to contemplate on their sins. And so some of these, um, but one might consider involuntary commitment to feel like punishment. So there'll be a, a robust discussion of that in the article, but for our purposes today, um, I just want to share with you some of the, the most interesting points. Do What can we do in terms of having the crime victim's voice address neuroatypical defendants and other defendants at sentencing? Are we really there in terms of crime victim's rights? Well, we have to consider proportionality. And our US Supreme Court has uh, certainly talked about evolving standards of a mature society, which lends itself to considerations of mental health research improvements, as well as uh, new conceptions of the crime victim's role. But it also says it does not mandate adoption of any one penological theory. And then a later, um, well, an earlier decision, but referred to later, um, was uh, that it really, our bar is that it only forbids extreme sentences. That gives a tremendous amount of discretion. Um, to, to the trial courts to determine what factors to consider at sentencing, whether mass incarceration truly is a problem, what our alternatives are. To give you a state example out of Illinois, um, I thought the language in this particular decision was telling. Here, we're talking about um, factors that uh, Illinois state courts can consider in sentencing, which factors predominate and the Constitution itself suggests seriousness of the offense. And of course, seriousness will impact how much harm was done. 
to the crime victim, as well as restoring useful citizenship to the defendant, which will, of course, consider the defendant's capacity, the defendant's mental illness, the defendant's neuroatypical conditions. And it also says Illinois doesn't have to compare itself to any other state. And, and it gave such freedom to considering the factors. Um, but I noted that it had a, a lot of language here. It was a child sexual abuse case of an interest in protecting vulnerable members of society. It didn't say uh, recourse for this one crime victim, but for society. And this particular quote, you'll see that, the child's life may be forever altered by residual problems associated. associated. So um, I, that language strikes me. And if you read the decision, I can tell that there must have been a victim impact statements, um, a, a good strong use of the crime victim's rights in this case. And along comes COVID. So this is um, just one point I'll make and then I'll finish, but uh, COVID tested everything. And I, uh, for a different article, began to look at the compassionate release cases along with um, a law student, Al Lundy, who helped me with the research here at SIU. And I was interested in what factors um, permitted uh, the court to feel comfortable with releasing somebody early because of COVID, because of other factors, because this created an obvious opportunity to reduce mass incarceration and to really think through in an emergency context, what matters, what matters. And, um, and especially for vulnerable inmates. And I wondered, are they going to care about the inmates with Alzheimer's? Are they going to care about the inmates with diagnosable mental health conditions? And the statutory factors and the sentencing commission factors and the case law also, they, they created uh, a set of factors that was easy to see patterns in. And this is what I found. They looked at criminal records, behavior in prison, severity of convicted offense. They did look at medical risk factors, but not as much as I thought. They cared about the support network out of prison, whether someone had a safe place to go to how much time had been served, the COVID rates in prison, not as much as I thought that they would, sentencing disparities just a little bit. And then this last factor, the inmate's ability to engage in self-care in the prison system. For example, was there a reason that they couldn't protect themselves from COVID when another inmate could? And you could all imagine certain kinds of um, conditions that that would be more of a problem. The Board of Prisons and the courts have not focused on all of these factors equally. They made choices, um, which we've seen throughout in terms of, of sentencing theory. So they had little mention, little mention of an inmate's intellectual capacity or mental health trauma and making decisions on whether to release people and no mention of crime victims' rights. And when you look at the statutory language, you'll see they didn't have to, but there is, as I'll show you in this slide, Look in blue here. They can consider, along with the obvious factors of medical condition, age, this is not just COVID related. This was um, uh, under the compassionate release, which has been around for a long time. They could consider all of these factors. But in blue, it had a catch-all, other circumstances. And, all the, and we also have a little bit of a split in terms of how much of the court can create its own set of factors or if they have to defer to the Board of Prisons for this, but there was so much they could have done with other circumstances and they really didn't very much. So of three cases, let me show you, um, all 2020 here in Michigan, denied a compassionate release claim, the offense is drug trafficking, we have a 50-year-old with hypertension, asthma, diabetes, mild kidney disease, tested positive for COVID, um, but asymptomatic, had a wife and children at home, not granted compassionate release. We have out of uh, Connecticut, the District of Connecticut, a mail and wire fraud case. And most of these cases have been um, financial or drug crimes where they uh, got all the way up uh, to the courts of appeal. Uh, asthma, here it was a former attorney and mayor who essentially, you know, corruption issues, stole over a million dollars from legal clients and a disabled brother. That decision, the court opinion, it was scathing in its lack of sympathy for this particular inmate. 
And here it was granted. And it was an, a single instance of selling cocaine, uh, nonviolent criminal history, um, some latent uh, lung conditions, possibly tuberculosis, uh, extraordinary family support with a wife and children. And they granted that particular case. You might see looking at this, and these are fairly representative of the dozens of cases that I looked at, of uh, some discretion that you might think were the factors consistently and fairly applied. Um, it's like a resentencing at a certain point, at which point they were not considering neuroatypical conditions and they were not considering crime victims views on all of that. And I do think in terms of retribution, um, which I'll discuss more in the article, but retribution in a modern sense is still meaningful. And I will tell you, I think it benefits all defendants, including neuroatypical defendants. There's a sense of uh, making amends for the defendant himself or herself, it increases a sense of self-efficacy if they can make amends. It creates a certain degree of closure as opposed to indefinite mental health treatment for defendants. And I think it benefits some victims, not all. And of course, some victims are deceased if we're talking about homicides, but we also have family members you might deem a victim and they benefit. And I think it benefits society to still consider um, the sense of just desserts and the sense of that that is preventative for us in terms of social order. And it overall, if you increase the crime victim's voice, you increase society's voice in these proceedings, and it might have made something like these COVID emergency release cases error. And it might make um, all of the inequities we see in terms of mass incarceration on the basis of race and class um, fairer if you, if you increase that crime victim's voice. Because in many cases, particularly in violent crime, people are um, engaging in crime in their own communities. So I will stop there and I really appreciate this and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Professor Bropes, thank you so much for your presentation. I, I have worked up some questions for you as you were talking and, and we'll probe them. But first, I think we should move to our next speaker, who is uh, Nadine. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask you, Nadine Lee or Liv? How do I pronounce your name? It's Nadine Liv. Nadine Liv. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to introduce you to our, our audience. Uh, uh, Nadine Liv is, um, you're a PhD researcher at, in, the, uh, in Israel. And I looked up your bio. You have a very impressive uh, biography. You, you have training in international law, counterterrorism, cybersecurity. And today you'll be addressing a very provocative topic. And that is the question of the human brain and its uh, increasing interface with computers and, and the implication all of this has for law. And in your proposal, you, you mentioned a number of very, very interesting uh, questions that we'll get into this morning, uh, such as, I, I love this particular phrase, brain hacking. I want to know more about brain hacking. And there's other, other interesting topics also to address in your presentation. So, uh, uh, Dr. Liv, well, not quite Dr. Liv, I will turn it over to you and, and thank you again so much for being here. Thank you so much. Um, so, good morning, everyone. I want to start off by uh, thanking everyone for attending our virtual conference on neuroscience and the law. And I would like to thank the organizers of the symposium. So, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nadine, and I'm a PhD student from Israel. I'm uh, writing my doctoral dissertation on the legal implications of brain computer interfaces, which will be the topic of uh, the talk today. The use of brain computer interfaces is a promising field that is expected to grow in the coming decades. The progress of this field has been driven by a combination of improved understanding of the functioning of the brain, technical developments, and the growing power of artificial intelligence systems. Now, with this progress, we're about to see a number of unprecedented legal issues throughout the entire legal continuum that are not being addressed by the existing legal framework. 
In this talk, I will explain what brain-computer interfaces are. I will present an example of a normative inconsistency concerning the use of BCIs from the realm of criminal law. And then from the specific to the general, I will advocate for adopting a reform of neural rights. So first things first, what are brain-computer interfaces? So brain-computer interfaces or BCIs are systems that translate the electrical activity of the brain into signals controlling external displays and devices such as cursors on computer screens, internet browsers, robotic arms, switches, or prosthetic limbs. Now, oftentimes when I talk about brain-computer interfaces, people think of science fiction. So I would like to show you a short one minute video of where things stand with this technology today. So the current medical research has shown that you can read neurons in human brains, which is an important proof of concept that this could be done. But as you can see in the video, current BCIs are attached to big wires and boxes that come out of your head, which may cause a risk of infection, and they are not comfortable. So tech companies are working against the clock to develop this technology for both therapeutic and recreational purposes. Facebook has invested about $500 million in a company that connects the brain to computers using a non-invasive technology. Elon Musk invested $100 million from his own personal capital in the Neuralink uh, company that develops invasive BCIs aimed at helping patients with paralysis or amputated limbs regain the ability to communicate with their environment. Now, he hasn't hidden that the ultimate goal is to connect us directly to machines to improve ourselves with artificial intelligence. And the estimates are that in 20 years from now, the use of BCIs for therapeutic purposes will evolve and expand, and that BCIs for enhancement purposes will become widely used for gaming, fitness, and for well being. And when put into practice, this technology is expected to bring about some inconsistencies to the legal system as we know it. And one example is the principle of conduct in criminal law. We know that the principle of conduct, the actus reus, requires that a criminal act or an unlawful omission of an act must have occurred. A person cannot be held liable for just thinking criminal thoughts and it is customary to understand the acts as a person's bodily movement that is contributing to the occurrence of the offense. But the use of brain computer interfaces is problematic for criminal law as the traditional doctrine of understanding the act requirement as a bodily movement is not compatible with BCI mediated actions. Brain computer interfaces allow users to control devices without moving their bodies. Now the users, they imagine certain things and the brain computer interfaces read the neural activity and operate the output device accordingly. Users who affect the world using brain computer interfaces 
do not perform any conduct. So when they commit crimes using brain computer interfaces, it is unclear how they have satisfied the actus reus. But imposing differential criminal liability on people based on how they committed the violation, whether by a bodily movement or by a BCI mediated action would be unfair. So it seems that BCI mediated actions should be qualified to satisfy the act requirement. And the question is how? The most intuitive and plausible way of bridging this gap would be to qualify a BCI mediated action as a bodily movement. We can do that by recognizing neural activity as an indicator of movements. The factual basis of the offense is perceived as an objective dimension that comprises all physical components of the offense in the tangible world. The core of the act is a bodily movement that is currently understood as muscle activation. However, the physiological system to allow motion, the musculoskeletal system, moves on command from the brain in the form of neurons firing electrical pulses. And until now, muscles have been the sole executors of brain commands, as well as the sole observable and measurable markers for their occurrence. With BCIs bypassing the body's biological muscular output channels, they may allow a new array of outputs to affect the world, but they still rely on electrical pulses to initiate intentional movement. So one way of solving this problem would be to shift our focus from where the action ends to where it begins. Now, two things are important to emphasize here. First, as Thompson Kramer notes, not every brain activity is an act, just like not every bodily activity is an act. For example, neural activity that is responsible for maintaining the body's homeostasis is not an act, it is an activity. And the second thing is that qualifying brain acts to satisfy the act requirement does not entail criminalizing thought because we apply causation tests to accurately attribute liability for the result to the offender. Now, having said that, some scholars have expressed concerns that if the act is satisfiable by neural activity, a user's action may satisfy the act requirement before she is aware of performing it or even having the intention to perform it. While this is a valid argument, the criticism is not different from the criticism the Libet experiment raised on the notion of free will. These experiments had previously established that even with conventional acts, decisions are unconsciously made in the brain and only later make it into consciousness once the decision signal had become strong enough. Now, the question of whether we have free will is not unique to BCIs. It is a profound question at the very heart of criminal law. And this topic is not covered in this uh, short talk, but it is covered extensively in Professor Sapolsky's brilliant book, Behave, which I'm sure he will talk about later today. So as seen, there are a few peculiarities that brain computer interfaces bring to the legal arena. But all in all, these peculiarities can be addressed by employing suitable mechanism that would enable us to apply the law equally. And this is almost a technical matter. Then what is the central problem that arises from brain computer interfaces? And that is the fact that we are facing a new era that will bring about new threats to fundamental freedoms. When the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted in 1948, the future challenges of brain computer interfaces and artificial intelligence couldn't even be imagined. And so there are no provisions in the human rights document to tackle new risks produced by technological innovations. Rights that are once taken for granted, such mental privacy or cognitive autonomy are now exposed to possible violations. Now, in order to function, BCIs must monitor, collect, and process users' neural activity, which is intrinsically private and sensitive information. 
Facebook is currently developing uh, wearable EEG-based BCIs that treat and interpret users' thoughts, emotions, and intentions to enable the user's hands-free communication without saying a word to its platform. This information could allow Facebook to come to conclusions regarding a user's memory, emotional reactions, and conscious and unconscious interests. When Putting this technology into practice, Facebook will gain access to read the neural and mental activity of millions of users and will be able to detect brain signals whenever a user's brain responds to something worth noting. So Facebook will study users' preferences. It will identify political and religious views and sexual orientations, and that even before the user herself is conscious about it. And if nothing changes, it would still be able to sell users' data to third parties. Now, although this data can be regarded as personally identifiable information and receive protection in the US because there is a reasonable expectation of privacy for brain activity. However, at present, there are no legal protections from having your mind involuntarily read. There are no specific legal or technical safeguards to protect brain data from being subject to data mining and privacy intruding measures similar to other types of information. <clears throat> Currently, we have to live with the negative consequences of social media, and it's probably too late to go back for that. We don't want the same thing to happen with brain computer interfaces. They are so much more important because they are related to the manipulation of a brain activity, which is the physical uh, basis of the human mind. So how do we solve this? How do we move forward? In Chile, a commission designated to address the challenges of the future presented last month in front of the Senate two law projects that aim to protect people's brain data and mental privacy in the face of brain computer interfaces and artificial intelligence. The first is amendment to the constitution that defines mental identity for the first time in history as a right that cannot be manipulated. It states that any intervention, even for health reasons, must be legally regulated. And the second is a bill that includes five revolutionary fundamental principles. The first principle is the right to personal identity. This, personal, this principle states that boundaries must be developed to prohibit technology from disrupting the sense of self. When BCIs connect individuals with digital networks, it could blur the line between a person's consciousness and external technological input. The second principle is the right to free will. This principle states that individuals should have ultimate control over their own decision-making without unknown influence from external technologies. And the third principle is the right to mental privacy. This principle states that any data obtained from measuring neural activity, something which is referred to as neurodata, should be kept private. And moreover, maybe importantly, the sale commercial transfer and use of neural data should be strictly regulated. The fourth principle is the right to equal access to mental augmentation. This principle states that there should be established guidelines at both international and national levels regulating the development and application of mental enhancement neurotechnologies. And these guidelines should be based on principles of justice and guarantee quality of access to all citizens. The fifth and last principle is the right to protection from algorithmic bias. This principle states that countermeasures to combat bias should be the norm for machine learning. Algorithm design should include input from user groups to address bias foundationally. And if passed, Chile could turn into the first country that has a law that protects neuro rights. But if we truly want to protect our neurodata, we must do so by dint of design. And to that end, 
the most current project is Professor Raphael Euste's technocratic oath. Professor Euste is drafting an ethical framework for entrepreneurs, physicians, and researchers developing brain-computer interfaces and artificial intelligence. And just like doctors must follow the Hippocratic Oath, those who develop and administer neurotechnologies should follow the technocratic oath. So to conclude, access to the neural processes that underlie conscious thought implies access to a level of the self that by definition cannot be consciously filtered. This risks profound violation of individual privacy and dignity with the potential to suppress free will and breach the ultimate sanctuary of human freedom, the human mind. Personal identity, agency, and moral responsibility may be diminished by merging neurological and digital experiences and such could change the nature of humanity and human societies. And that is unless we reform not only our laws, but our entire perspective on neurodata and the protection that you should receive. Thank you for your attention. Ms. Lee, that is a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. That's a very, very thought provoking uh, uh set of ideas and uh we appreciate your being here again uh, i have a number of questions i'd like to pose to you uh but we'll do that after the um, after our final speaker uh this morning goes and uh, and that will be uh professor um, cynthia boyer of the university of toulouse and she will be talking on um, uh, the question of um, neuroscience, racial bias, and the death penalty. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting, provocative proposal she sent us. It blends ideas of political philosophy, um, political philosophy. Uh, she talks about neoliberalism. She talks about uh, how, uh, thanks to a Supreme Court decision from the 1970s, Lockett versus Ohio, uh, the, uh, uh, the criminal justice system has moved from an evaluation uh, of, um, of an individual's uh, circumstances within society, a broad social structures such as racism to a much narrower concern with, with, with uh, the individual uh, standing alone and she proposes to challenge some of these ideas. Dr. Boyer, I want to thank you for being here. And uh, please, if, if you could, uh, uh, could uh, come on. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, thanks very much for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be to be here and to take part in this uh, wonderful symposium. So I would like to thank you, you uh, Dr. Reed, for for this. I would like also to to thanks um well to say thank you, a big thank you to the students editors, uh, Jack and uh, and Ali, of course, and the University of Saint Thomas for organizing this uh, wonderful event. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk about, uh, just for a few seconds, to talk about my research. I'm, um, I'm a Conlo scholar, and uh, I'm also a political science scholar, so I work on the intersection of, of law and politics. And uh, this work that I'm going to present today uh, is as uh, a consequence of further work conducted on, 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 on this topic. That is to say that I started my research on neoliberalism and the death penalty, uh, through the look at um, decision and uh, its jurisprudence. And then uh, I went on and I worked with Harvard Law on critical race theory. And this is um, the addition to this, which is ne neuroscience. Uh, so I'm going to, to share my screen with you and I hope it's going to, to work. Um, so let's start. So here it works. Um, so the advent of neoliberalism in the 1970s, uh, first as a new school of, of, school of thought, and then as a policy and practice of government had a significant impact on the consideration of the individual in society. The Locke versus Ohio decision as part of this uh, particular context, um, as it sets the stage for the collective's mutation toward a reevaluation of the individual 
Council for Environmental Freedom had initiated a new form of rationality in the law relating to the death penalty. From previous advances uh, in the consideration of exo exo exogenous principles, such as poverty, racism, and violence, the locate, the locate case law um, moves to focus on indigenous individual factors, such as childhood and personality. But scientific evidence now seems to prevail over psychiatric expertise alongside, alongside psychological and psychiatric expertise, neuroscience data, particularly cerebral imagery, are invited to criminal trial, which needs to be questions about, questioned about its importance and evolution. Neuroscience has thus, be, has thus become uh, an argument uh, used by the defense lawyers, and this process can help explain certain behaviors and put in uh, several states uh, as courts, sorry, uh, this process can help explain certain behaviors and courts in several states allow it. To what extent can neuroscience um, data guide uh, the decisions related to the assessment of the responsibility of a person? That's the issue here. All the resulting jurisprudence since 1978 has removed a fundamental discrimination factor and the overall societal assessment of racism due to this orientation towards uh, to, towards the individual. Yet race is interestingly linked to the formation of the United States as an independent nation and to its historical evolution. It is a part of its, of its essence and its corollary. This social construction created to intellectually and um, ethically legitimize the determination of relations between individuals in a perspective of subordination has led to uh, the development of an institutionalized system that has been articulated for decades on this for the foundation of domination. By focusing on the interesting characteristics of individualism and thus leaving aside the struggle for recognition of the societal and institutional prejudice that was consolidated and anchored in America's evolution, the law has opened a sizable gap in practice regarding discrimination and racism on significant issues, namely the death penalty. From this perspective, the first part of this article demonstrates that with regard to death penalty cases, the work of neurobehavioral sciences also may at first represent a contradiction to the neoliberal model fought within the code of theory. However, unlike uh, this neoliberal model, which ruled out exogenous factors, the second part of this article aims to determine the importance of these factors in the evaluations provided by neuroscience and evolution to the motivation and rationality of the ruling with regard to protein, protein complex and human behavior. Depending on the set of cultural, historical and social data that may open the door to a rehabilitation of prejudices relating to racial discrimination. So in the 19th century, Cesare Lombroso founded scientific criminology. He claimed to spot criminals from an anatomical features of the face and skull. Science came to help justice. Where are we in the 21st century? The same quest, quest still animates certain and many biologists, um, but not only biologists. Of course, the vocabulary and methods have changed. The imaging has replaced uh, the analysis of factors and bumps of the skulls, especially in death penalty cases. The death penalty uh, raises serious questions regarding the unequal and arbitrary application of the law. Indeed, the appropriateness of a death penalty verdict has long been considered on by relying on myriad elements as indicated in the model uh, in the model penal code drafted by the American Law Institute in 1959. The code states the factors which determine whether the sentence of death is the appropriate penalty in particular cases are too complex to be compressed within the limits of a formula. And uh, indeed, until now, until now psychiatrists called uh, upon the, to make prognosis have been keen to distinguish psychiatric dangerousness, which uh, is the symptomatic manifestation of a mental illness, from criminological dangerousness conceived as the predisposition of a subject to commit an offense or a crime. 
Indeed, there is a very weak correlation between crime and mental illness. Frankly speaking, criminological dangerousness expresses less a permanent state than a sudden, serious, threatening, and by, defini by definition, unforeseen risk. However, we are now seeing a shift towards a fairly subjective notion of dangerousness conceived as a permanent state. The challenge of a thing the risk of dangerousness is basic, basically trying to predict from an individual's behavior what is behavior of lasting potential. Estimating a person's dangerousness therefore amounts to judging their past and prejudging by deduction their future. In other words, a deterministic philosophy manifests itself here, within which the sciences can find a place to accommodate and come to the court and come to the court. So traditionally, it's true, the exact sciences um, and the law are part of a really relationship of strict otherness. Unlike law, which is based on normative and duty to be, science empirical is interested in the factual and has a vocation to say what is. Science is characterized the pursuit of objectivity while law is based on subjectivity and deep conviction. The relationship between science and law is therefore originally a model of separation. However, today things are getting more complicated as scientific experts are getting closer to justice, which makes the separation more delicate. Ideally, the relationship between law and science should be based on a collaborative and interactive model the only one able to avoid the two pitfalls of conflicts and fusion. The relationship between law and science can indeed become conflicted, conflicting when we present the legal as uh, the law as a break on the progress of science, or conversely, when we assert or when we assert the critics of scientism. But it can be, but it can be um, but it can also become fusional, and the dangers are of such rapprochement is no less great. The risk that then being taken of transferring normative power to scientists. So my work focuses on the decisions of the Supreme Court relating to the death penalty and uh, in connection with neuroscience. And um, I, I question the criminal determinism. And, uh, and therefore, I, I work on on the different aspects, such as how re reliable is this new tool according to uh, the, su the Supreme Court's uh, decisions, so at the state level and the American Supreme Court. And, um, and uh, I, I make a, a comparison uh, between the different uh, significant differences uh, that the different states they make, and uh, also what appears in, their, um, in the court's rationality and motivation the implications of using narrow neurobiological evidence for mitigating uh, all for mitigation of, of criminal punishment. The implication of using it to assess the competency of a criminal and, uh, and criminal defendant. And if there is a testimony by an expert on the matter, uh, the, the powerful evidence that it brings or the lack of, uh, of powerful evidence that it brings and also the outcome of the case. So the potential use of uh, neurobehavioral behavioral science is made according to uh, an ideological aim. The so-called neoclassical theory of economics derived from the theories of the Chicago schools uh, is based on the postulate of a fully rational economic agent usually referred to as homo economicus. From this perspective, behavioral economics, which integrates the work of neurobehavioral sciences, first represented a contradiction to the ideal model of neoclassical theory by emphasizing uh, that the economic ad agent on which neoclassical theory is based makes ir irrational choices. It first set out to describe this irrationality as a result of cognitive bias and then proposed ways to correct them. An illustration is based on the prize award in, in 2017 to Richard Sellers, um, who was awarded the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, for his theory of nudges. And Richard, uh, Richard Sellers' uh, contributions have built a bridge between the economic and psychological analysis of individual decision making. 
his empiric empirical findings and theoretical insights have been instrumental in creating the new and rapidly expanding field of behavioral economics. This should be seen as a sign that far from calling into question the dominant economic theory, behavioral economics proposed to remedy this irrationality by correcting what it recognized as behavioral biases. Ultimately, it owes its success mainly to the possibilities it offers of saving mainstream economic theory by providing tools to correct the irrationality of the real economic agent and bringing closer to the ideal economic agent of the neoclassical model. In short, if the dominant economic model does not keep its promises, we must see the effects of the behavioral biases of the economic agent, not the results of failures of the ideological model and behavioral economics has the merits of offering tools to rationalize neuroscience, the economic agent, according to its expected reason. It is a very movement of neoliberalism which seeks to homogenize all social fields around neoclassical theory. There are therefore no longer failures at the level of society, but at the level of man that can be corrected by the deployment of neuroscience. Applied to, this, uh, applied to the field of law, the neurosciences within the court set aside the societal elements to focus on individual elements whose study can allow the correction. This fits in the same perspective as neoliberalism, um, even if the imperfect nature of, sorry, even if the imperfect nature um, of, um, of the irrationality of the behavior of the individual could suggest, suggest the opposite. However, the flaw in this irrationality of the individual revealed by neurosciences can allow, and this is the subject of my second part, a redeployment of societal elements inherent in this irrationality of the individual. Because the study of neurosciences offers new perspectives that can open, that can open towards more factors in the construction of behaviors generated by the brain, um, inducing an opening conducive to the rehabilitation uh, to the rehabilitation of exogenous factors no longer in opposition to endogenous factors such as inherent characteristics to an individual but in addition to the definition of these characteristics all posing again the immense question and opening up to the conception of free will thanks very much Uh, Dr. Boyer, thank you uh, so much for your presentation. And um, as I mentioned, I have some questions for each uh, speaker. So um, I'll begin by posing a question or, or perhaps two to each of our speakers. And uh, then we can have a discussion. Um, let me begin with... Uh, with Professor Brobst. And I have really two questions for Professor Brobst. And uh, the uh, first question is the, uh, concerns the, um, the movement uh, that you've identified from private prosecutions to public prosecutions. And uh, we see in, in that movement, I've always understood that movement to be a movement away from, shall we say, private vengeance to, um, uh, to a notion of, of a dispassionate judge, uh, judging according to the public, the common interest, the common good. Um, you propose uh, bringing back the, the idea of not private vengeance. I don't understand your, your paper to do that at all, but at least to bring back a, a, a more robust role for, for victims, but to do it sensitively in the context of understanding um, Understanding the the um, the weakness the weaknesses the, the 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 mental state, if you will, of of defendants who may be neurologically impaired, it's an important balance you're striking. I, I look forward to reading your your paper. That may take the uh, the form more of an observation, perhaps, than a um, than a, um, a a question. 
But I also have a, a, a more discreet question, and that is uh, some of the comments you've made regarding um, compassionate release. And um, when I heard you uh, identified some of the factors that uh, are concerned with, uh, with with compassionate release, you've identified things like behavior in prison and self-care, precisely the sorts of, of concerns that a neurologically impaired uh, inmate would not be able to uh, to fulfill very carefully. Is this therefore a form of insidious discrimination against the neurologically impaired? Is that a legitimate question? But bef uh, should I, I, I think what I'll do is I'll pose a question also to, to um, Nadine Liv and then to um, Cynthia Boyer. My question, Nadine Liv, is this. Um, I'm uh, extraordinarily fascinated by many aspects of your paper, but particularly your discussion of um, the developments in, in Chile regarding um, a, a set of rights uh, that are, are very well thought out, a right to personal identity, to free will, uh, to uh, to a right to the to privacy regarding all neural neural da uh, data, a right of equal access to mental augmentation, a right to protect uh, from algorithmic biases. It, it is a, 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 a stunning, important, comprehensive set of rights. And I'm going to ask you, uh, Nadine Liv, if you would like to incorporate that. I think it should be incorporated. But what what are your thoughts about incorporating that into um, into our, our evolving standards standards of international human rights law? And and finally, uh, uh, Doc, uh, Dr. Boyer, um, uh, a very important question uh, set of questions you've posed, and. Um, I'm particularly interested um, uh, with, with uh, some of your observations regarding racism, some of your observations regarding uh, neoclassical economics and its uh, deficiencies. Uh, you raised an important question about uh, the distinction that Lockett uh, versus Ohio draws between uh, structural questions of racism, of, of, of poverty, of, of larger social circumstance versus narrower questions of, um, uh, of um, personal human development. And my question is, to you is, can, uh, does the Lockett uh, distinction really uh, continue intellectually to be de defensible in light of what we know about the impact uh, that racism has uh, and other structural social circumstances have uh, on um, continuing cognitive and, and neuro, neurological development. Are we uh, seeing, in other words, in recent literature, uh, a, a coming together uh, of a set of phenomena that, were, uh, that the Lockett Court tried unsuccessfully, I think, un unsuccessfully in the sense of, in an intellectually indefensible way of, of separating out. Um, so that, that is my question. And then I, I, I'm fascinated by some of your observations on uh, on um, neoclassical economics, if only because it, it, it confirms my own suspicions that neoclassical economics relies essentially on, uh, on an underlying and uh, basically false uh, legal fiction, if you will, and that of, of the fully rational human being, a hu fully rational economic actor. So I want to thank all of you for your, your, um, your participation. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll allow, uh, uh, we'll go with Professor Brobst if you want to go first and uh, Nadine Liv and then uh, Cynthia Boyer, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Reed. So you uh, mentioned some of those uh, early approaches and the transition from private prosecution into public prosecution. And I think one of the biggest concerns was inconsistency that if you had an individual really asserting why it hurt, why the act hurt them, in particular, it might not be representative of the needs of the community or the danger to the community. And any prosecutor today would recognize that some crime victims would say, you know, please show mercy. 
this was my husband or um, because of their faith uh, that they didn't believe in um, punishment per se. I've heard that. And, and yet others, it truly, you might see some vengeance or uh, just um, the, the trauma to the victim. They, they have a very hard time letting it go and, and we could risk uh, extreme punishment. But we, we, we went too far. It was my point. And I think that we still need to have um, that public prosecution and the independence of the judiciary and the role of the jury the role of the prosecutor in charging is all necessary, I think, for public safety. But I do think that the in, in bringing back the crime victim's voice to a greater extent, ensuring that the rights that they do have under state constitutions are actually enforced, uh, weaving them into areas such as I've discussed with some of these emergency cases with compassionate release to a greater extent would be important. And I think that it not only uh, presents a more direct and humane uh, approach, because of course the family member who sees their say spouse put into prison could also say, I understand. I understand that they have mental health conditions and I can share with you what's very good about them too. Um, that nuance is needed. I think that uh, the more remote criminal cases become from the reality of what happened. You already see it three years on in a court case when it seems so sterile with a jury that that victim's voice brings it right back to life. That could be done um, as, as well at, at every stage, even um, after the person has been incarcerated. I think that's important. Um, and I also think that the crime victim's voice would help balance having the prosecution and policing be too intertwined. Uh, we've seen this in the UK where the public uh, prosecutor had to be, you know, actually divided from um, the role of um, policing. And as although we, I think, have a system that separates it more now, I worry that we, um, that you see some of these systemic problems in part because the society's voice has been muted. As to the second question regarding COVID compassionate release, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of suggesting that there could be some um, discrimination occurring when the factors for release in terms of the ability to engage in self-care are not respected. And that's not just for COVID. I mean, if we're really talking about inmates who are suffering um, in incarceration and in a, a truly in a system of mass incarceration and disproportionately communities of color, men of color, uh, at, who have never had an opportunity for uh, proper mental health care or a diagnosis related to uh, some kind of um, neurological condition that it's, it's unforgivable, honestly, and that, that our legal system needs to start reinforcing the importance of the humanity of the sentence in terms of their mental illness. And it's um, entirely inadequate. Say when I uh, used to live in North Carolina and you could have maybe one or two psychiatrists for an entire system all doing tele-mental health, I think our society needs to take a closer look at our system as a whole. Thank you. Professor Probst, thank you. And um, I will go to Nadine Leaf. Please, uh, if you would, um, go next. Thank you, Professor Reed. Um, so I definitely think that we should all implement um, new amendments to our legal system. In my research, I aim not only to, uh, to detect and to find where the gaps are, but I also try and to solve these problems. Um, and I also would like to refer to a question that I saw on the uh, Q&A chat uh, with your permission. Oh, and uh, mm -hmm. um, so someone asked about how, how is it different from what's already going on in, in Facebook right now? And truth be told that some scholars argue that Facebook doesn't really need brain computer interfaces because they already now study our behavior using uh, machine learning algorithms and influence our behavior already 
um, as we've seen in the documentary, the social dilemma. So the short answer to that is it's not that different at all. But the longer answer is that first, maybe we should have established protections to our neurodata much earlier. And that as the field is about to expand and evolve, then since we haven't done it so far, now is the time to do so. And one last uh, final comment. It's for you, Professor Reid. I uh, know you were uh, you wanted to hear about um, brain hacking. Uh, I'm afraid due to time constraints, I had to choose just one or two topics, but I will make sure to, uh, uh, to write about this in the paper. Well, well, thank you so much. Again, a, a very important paper, very provocative set of questions. And, and finally, um, uh, Professor Boyer, and let me find my notes. And um, again, uh, a, a very, a very important set of, of questions here. And um, and uh, so let me just uh, begin with a, a couple of observations. Um, and uh, that is, um, or I've already made those observations. I'm sorry, Do uh, Dr. Boyer. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, well, uh, very right. well, some, some weeks ago, Sandra Loquette uh, died uh, um, in her early 60s. And um, unfortunately, uh, the heritage of, um, of, of, of the Loquette case um, has been very well contested. The reason is very simple. It's the fact that the American Supreme Court um, had, has had uh, different problems um, and um, a lack of consistency uh, in trying to, uh, to, to narrow uh, the, the individual elements and it, it attempted to define the individual elements and then um, following different um, different decisions on um, the different uh, Supreme Court justices they uh, departed in their um, in their um, uh, in their views and in their arguments such as uh, Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas uh, decided to uh, to stop following their own stare decisis. So therefore, there is this absence of consistency regarding uh, these principles. And what is very interesting um, and what really neuroscience can bring is the fact that as it's going to emphasize individual elements, it's going to provide a certain ground to bring back all your societal elements. Because as I was saying, uh, neuroscience is, uh, is of course connected to neoliberalism, but it may depart because uh, it's going to bring politics into uh, the legal arena, even though politics is already present, politics and the role of politics is dual, uh, because of course um, elected judges and elected prosecutors, when it comes to death penalty cases, there is this concept of accountability that comes into play and uh, it has an impact on, um, on the ruling, uh, indirectly it has an impact on, on, on the ruling, but also the entire environment, um, of course, pressurize, uh, brings some pressure, brings some pressure on uh, the legal decision, even though it's not very clear, but of course uh, it may have an impact. So uh, therefore, as we currently assist to different movements such as Black Lives Matter, and uh, the fact that discrimination comes to, uh, to be more and more present um, and uh, the talk uh, comes to be more and more present, it's going to, to be uh, very interesting to see the way neurosciences are going to, to help to focus on certain, some, well, on some elements by opening up to uh, very more generally discrimination and other societal issues that are going to, to create uh, a good balance um, in mitigating factors and aggravating factors on, on both sides uh, of the spectrum. Thanks. Unmute Hi. myself. Thank, uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Professor Boyer. And, I have a um, question from the Q&A, if I may. Okay, and I was going to ask the, the speakers, though, if they have any questions of one another. That's okay, we can do that as well. We you just have one question. First. Okay. Professor Brooks, uh, uh, Dr. Boyer, uh, Ms. Liv, do you have questions of one another?
I had a short question for Dr. Liv. Um, I appreciated her interest in promoting privacy and particularly ahead of the game. Uh, I, I've been, I know she's taking an international view, but I wonder if she has found that chipping away at uh, trying to carve out some privacy rights. For example, American state constitutions have done a better job in my view, certainly than Congress has in terms of informational privacy and human autonomy and privacy. Um, if she is, is just seeing just little moments of this or just incidents of this around the world, I, I, I'm hopeful that they will pick up the pace. I don't think it's too late at all. I think we've heard three presentations here in this panel that are all um, sort of the rise of the humans. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that neuroscience is also very human in a lot of ways. So I'm just interested to, if she really does see some, um, I think she mentioned Chile, but uh, other areas as well that are promoting privacy in a legally effective way. So um, there's a trend right now that is um, that's going on, and there is uh, well the Council of Europe um, had a resolution also last month that is um, calling for its uh, uh, for its members uh, to adopt regulation to specifically protect neural data um, from all neurotechnologies and specifically from brain computer interfaces. So that's, that is something that is going on in Europe at the moment. Uh, there's another initiative in Canada. Um, it's not a bill yet, but it's something that people are working on and they have all kinds of similar, uh, neural rights. Um, that's kind of similar to what's going on in Chile, but this is something that is also going on at the moment. Um, so these are the two places I can think of right now. And I just, I, I just want to stress that, yeah, we do have privacy protection, but the thing with neural data is that it should receive a different protections, something that is more supreme, like a constitutional protection. And this is something that I think we all should think about every time that we um, open Facebook, or when we think of these um, um, enterprises like Elon Musk's. I also wanna add that in no way I aim to, um, to hold innovation. I'm all for innovation and technology and progress. But just as we wanna, uh, just as we wanna maintain innovation, we also must maintain our, um, our values. And this is something that we should do hand in hand. And I think one of the things that we, we should be doing right now is take lawyers and legal scholars and have them work together uh, with the developers. I think that that is something that can help us in um, achieving this goal. Well, uh, Dr. Lee, thank you so much. And uh... Uh, Ali, perhaps it is time then to uh, turn the floor over to questions from the audience. So our first question um, is from an attendee. This is for you, Dr. Lib. Um, uh, he wanted to know where this differs from marketing, showing advertisements that emphasize colors to influence certain reactions. Um, and he gives the example of hunger when you see the color red. Um, and then he wanted to go to elaborate and kind of elaborate on the question and ask that about how the thought of stopping a company from outright controlling your brain versus indirectly through homeostasis and psychology connected with blood flow and the color red. Um, is there, do you have an opinion on this even if there isn't any direct research on this? Right, so first, um... I, I'm not a doctor. I just got to say this. Um, I'm still working on my PhD. So that's the first thing. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that's a great question. I think it's a great question. And as I said, some scholars 
actually worked on this topic and they argue that it's not different at all than, than, than the things that's going on right now. Um, Facebook uh, doesn't really need a brain computer interface because they already now study our behavior and they manipulate it and influence it with machine learning algorithm. So in that sense, there isn't actually a difference. But this technology is about to evolve and that's what personally frightens me. I'm afraid that we're gonna move forward with this technology and yet we haven't established any protections. So again, the short answer is for now, there isn't much of a difference. It's not that difference at all. And part of the research is uh, techniques of uh, neuromarketing. Um, so definitely it's not that different at all, at all right now, but what's gonna be in a year or two years or five and 10 and 20 years? That's what I'm worried about. I want us to get ahead of it. Thank you very much um, for that response. We have another question from um, the Q&A. Um, I think this is for all three of you. So whoever would like to answer first, please go ahead. Um, so since the beginning of the pandemic, some researchers in the medical and pharmaceutical fields have done a lot of damage to the image of a scientist or as having a hidden agenda and lying or misinformation without regards to the public. Does that concern you um, as a general matter? I can put my two cents in. Um, I think that the courts are almost too deferential to science still. And I think politics is not deferential enough. But in terms of uh, looking at how forensic evidence has been used in the court system, for example, fingerprinting. Uh, you know, if you took a, a scientific evidence class, which I teach sometimes, uh, it's remarkable how the courts will not uh, dig. And perhaps it's the blame should be placed on the practicing attorneys who, who don't dig enough in terms of the reliability of the evidence. And, but the judges don't either. And I actually I attended a, a conference once where uh, a judge apologized for this. And I, I worry about that with neuroscience, given that it's not just cutting edge, but what we might call bleeding edge. Uh, that they will be too deferential uh, and, and without just taking their time and really making sure they understand what the evidence means. And at the sentencing stage where some of this might come in, and we have ineffective assistance of counsel claims, if attorneys do not raise a psychological, psychiatric, now we could argue perhaps neuroscientific evidence on behalf of the defendant, um, let us just hope that the judges understand it because it could, it could certainly be misused and become arbitrary. I'm, uh, Allie, do you see any further questions? We don't have any more um, questions coming through the Q&A right now. So if you wanna use our last few minutes, oh, we have one more question um, from the Q&A. Um, how do you change that deference to scientists? Is it through increased education, better explanations for lay people? I personally believe strongly in good um, continuing legal education. And I think that uh, helps a lot. And just for the law students uh, in, the, in the audience, uh, I highly recommend as a litigator that when you don't have a case before the judge, if you find good judicial education materials on an aspect you don't think the judge really uh, quite understands well enough yet, take it, to, take it to chambers and say, I just thought this might be of interest to you. Don't do it when you're in mid-trial, but when, when you don't have a connection to the court or you could give it to the, uh, the chambers as a whole, to the front desk and say, because judges are very busy and sometimes miss out on um, the continuing education that they need. And that is a very effective and efficient way to do it. Um, and not a news article, but something that they would respect and would be on their level. So another follow-up question from the Q&A to that um, is we have somebody who's asking more about the stakes of it when the death penalty is in place as opposed to a post-sentencing apology. 
um, in that one is more grave than the other, I think is the sentiment um, he's trying to communicate. Is that for Dr. Boyer? Oh, yes, yes. Um, thanks, Steve Burchell. Is that question for anyone on the panel or for Dr. Boyer or who? That'd be great if you could let me know. Okay, may, may you repeat the question, please? Because I'm not sure I, I, I understood it correctly, please. Um, so his question, as it's phrased in the chat, says he's worried more about when the death penalty is in place rather than a post-sentencing apology. Um, I think building off of the conversation that Dr. Prost just was beginning. Your input would be welcome as well, Dr. Boy. Well, I'm going to let my colleague uh, answer. <laughs> Professor Probst, do you have um, any observations on that question? The, um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll weigh in in terms of the role of apology in the justice system. And I think it lends itself to consideration since this is a symposium on neuroscience that we need to consider capacity here. So there are certain uh, conditions in which a person lacks empathy that, uh, lacks an ability to, maybe they do understand the emotions of others, but they don't care. Uh, and, or they simply misinterpret cues and social cues from others. And with respect to the death penalty, I would, I would imagine when you're weighing all the mitigators and aggravators, um, uh, that, that, that balance is, is very delicate in a death penalty case. In, particularly in terms of remorse. And I can, um, although I did not take death penalty cases and then I shifted out of practice and into academia, I, I did find in every single sentencing, the judge cared about remorse. And, um, and it didn't have to be an apology, but that we give great weight to that, which I also think, um, I'll just go back to my presentation in terms of the role of the humanity of the proceeding the role of who the crime victim really is, that this isn't some intellectual exercise in terms of um, somebody broke the law, but it's someone did a harm. And the way we as humans, and I hope that neuroscience will re-emphasize this, is that our system is about uh, just desserts, making amends and finding a resolution, finding that that there can be some closure, we can move on, people can be rehabilitated, people can, um, victims can heal to a certain degree. And that, that sense of apology, I think is still vital. So I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you so much. We have one last question um, from the chat from um, Carl Erickson. And he's interested in knowing if any of any of our panelists know of any scholarship or have thoughts on the possible relationship between U US crime rates and the possible relationship to environmental lead. Um, he's read that the neurological development effects of lead may have led to an increased propensity for violence and impulsive decision-making among people growing up in the 50s and 60s. Um, so if anybody has any input on that particular subject. I'm familiar with it. I remember when it first became raised. Um, I have not seen an effective use of that data in court yet. And I think that in addition to the impact of lead, um, I worked uh, when I mentioned I was a legal director at a mental health center, it, its primary focus was on PTSD. And of course we have tra uh, trauma informed lawyer in these days. It, it addresses how we look at defendants. It addresses how we look at crime victims and the impact on society. That has had more traction, which is interesting. You might think, you know, something like lead is measurable, but it goes back to showing though that um, 
the difference between neuroscience and psychology and its impact on the criminal justice system. Just because you can measure something doesn't mean that you can transform it into our concepts and theories related to justice, related to culpability. There's so much more to it. We can, we can um, but, but in terms of cognitive ability where psychology can help explain that, we, um, we can do more with something like that around, um, certainly around sentencing. It's easier around sentencing than our very limited use of the insanity defense, um, which is in my view, not generous enough. I think the insanity defense um, setting aside collar and giving states the right to address this, it's, it's a long time coming that we need to consider irresistible impulse to a greater extent and particularly conditions like bipolar disorder and that volitional capacity. I think we have to recognize that. And that, to be honest, lead will impact that. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome addresses aggressiveness. People are born with these conditions that we should be recognizing that in the legal system. Allie? Are we ready for the break? I believe we might be. It is 10.02. Um, so unless either one of our first panelists have any other last remaining remarks, it will be time for our morning break. And thank you so much. And let's have a virtual round of applause. I know it's, uh, it's difficult, but it's a fantastic morning presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your input. It was really a wonderful first panel. So we will be back up at about 10.30. Um, I will ask our panelists for the 10.30 panel to be um, ready to go talking. We'll test everything around 10.20 if that works. So now that it's 10.29, Dr. Reed, are you prepared to start with our second panel? I am absolutely prepared. And uh, I think we will have a very uh, lively, important discussion here. So I will begin by introducing our first speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Adina Roskies. And I should say, um, uh, doctor, doctor, you have not one, but two PhDs. So if we want to be very Germanic about it, it's doctor, doctor. So um, welcome this morning. And um, when you have a, a doctorate in philosophy, a doctorate in neuroscience, and I've, I've read some of your work and you do an, a, a wonderful, masterful synthesis of um, philosophy and uh, neuroscience. And you try, as I understand it, to rescue concepts like free will, even um, in the context of neuroscience. Neuroscience can, it can seem to many to be, um, uh, I think you mentioned at a couple points in your work, mechanistic. And, um, and you uh, find reason to think it is, it is not always that. You find room for, for human agency, you find room for, for human volition within um, an evolving field of, of knowledge that might seem very deterministic, very mechanistic. You make room for, for humanity, if I will. And so I'm looking forward greatly to your, your presentation. So uh, Dr. Roskies, please. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, everyone can see this? Yes. Yeah. OK, great. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, while I very much uh, agree that I'm trying to blend neuroscience and philosophy and law in a way that saves things like free will. Um, I do want to point out that I don't want, I do think that neuroscience is mechanistic. Uh, what, I, what I reject is the idea that mechanism implies uh, lack of free will or mindlessness or lack of agency. And I'll, I'll maybe get to those things toward the end of the talk, but we can certainly talk about them in the question session. So today, uh, I really want to focus on two different ways in which neuroscience has uh, made arguments about the uh, not the the lack of free will or the illusion of free will. One is an argument from determinism, and the other is an argument about the inefficacy of conscious will. Um, so I want to uh, address both of those 
uh, different research programs, and I'll argue that that neither of them actually succeeds in undermining the notion of, of free will. Um, and at the end, I'll uh, talk a little bit more about the philosophical implications and, and a summary. So um, I'm going to start out just by giving people a, a view of the landscape, uh, the philosophical landscape about free will. And so discussions about free will tend to, to uh, be framed in terms of the truth or uh, falsity of determinism. And, and the question of determinism is seen as central to the possibility of free will. But there are a number of different philosophical positions that you could have. So if you see on the left, uh, can, I, can you all see this cursor? On the left, there are people, there's the proposition that the universe is indeterministic. On the right, that the universe is deterministic. So let's start here. Um, if the universe is deterministic, there are people who think that we don't have free will. And they, don't, they think we don't have free will because they think that free will is incompatible with determinism. Uh, and these guys are called the hard determinists. And I think that um, you might hear something like that from Robert Sapolsky later on today. Uh, but you might think that free will and determinism are incompatible, uh, but yet think that it's OK because the universe is indeterministic. And therefore, we have free will in virtue of that indeterminism. And th those folks are called libertarians. Uh, both of the, these hard determinants hard determinists and libertarians are incompatibilists in thinking that you can't have free will with determinism. Um, but then again, there are these, this other group, which uh, I think many philosophers fall into, who uh, can admit that the universe is deterministic or, uh, or it could not be deterministic either way, but they think that it's compatible to have free will, uh, even if determinism is true. Okay, so you can rescue free will if you're a compatibilist, regardless of the truth of determinism. And I think this is the background uh, against which to, to view a lot of these neuroscientific arguments, because I think almost all of them take hard determinism to be uh, the case. Um, now, determinism is a technical term, and essentially determinism means that if you had a complete specification of the state of the universe at any time, and a, and a complete specification of the laws, that would be sufficient for fixing the state of the universe at all other times. Okay, so uh, there's a very specific and it's a very stringent uh, requirement to determinism. Um, so the general view is that if our brains are shown to be deterministic, then the consequences for free will would be significant. And that's really largely because people tend to be uh, naive, hard determinists. Uh, but I want to consider today whether the brain sciences really threaten to prove determinism to be true. Uh, there are two, I think, global reasons to think that they can't. One is called, uh, by me, the problem of fundamental neural indeterminacy, and the other, the problem of exhaustive neural determination. Those are mouthfuls, but uh, I think just to sum it up very quickly, the problem of fundamental neural indeterminacy is that we can't really tell whether things that look to us to be deterministic or indeterministic uh, are really metaphysically deterministic or indeterministic. And the reason is that the only real handle we have on those things um, is predictability. Uh, we tend to think that if we can predict something, it's deterministic. And if we can't predict it, it's indeterministic. Um, but we may be able to predict it even if it is indeterministic, uh, and we may not be able to predict it if it's deterministic. And to, to just illustrate those of the those two things, um, chaos, for instance, chaotic behavior, uh, which is uh, sort of graphically illustrated here, is unpredictable. Uh, by definition, if you don't know the governing equations, you cannot predict future states, even though those governing equations are completely deterministic. And then on the other hand, you have quantum mechanics where we think that it is fundamentally indeterministic, but at the macroscopic level, it's entirely predictable. So, you know, you look at the world and it might look predictable, uh, it might look deterministic because it's macroscopic, but that doesn't mean that's fundamentally deterministic. So I think this notion, an operational notion of predictability uh, cross cuts the determinism indeterminism question in a way that doesn't enable our scientific, especially at the neuroscientific level, 
um, our scientific advances to tell us anything about the true metaphysical status of the world. The second reason I think that the brain will never, will never be able to tell whether the brain is deterministic or indeterministic is that it's a massively interconnected system. Um, so what you see on the right is the wiring diagram of the only animal for which we have a complete wiring diagram, and that's the C. elegans worm. <clears throat> and it's uh, got 302 neurons, and you can see how complex the interconnections are even with 302 neurons. If you scale that up to a brain size with uh, 10 to the 12th neurons, each of which has 1,000 or, or 10,000 connections, you can understand how massively complex that is. And it means that it's, it's impossible to isolate uh, subsystems. So if you see something you don't predict, you can't tell whether that's the result of an indeterministic event or just the result of deterministic influence from somewhere else in the system. So in order to actually tell, you would have to have complete knowledge of each of these pieces and their interconnections. And I think no matter how good neuroscience gets, it's never going to give us that level of detail. And so we won't be able to tell whether what we see is really determinism or deterministic or indeterministic. So that's why I think neuroscience is not going to settle the question of determinism. Um, the other main way in which neuroscientists have argued against uh, free will is by showing or by claiming to show that conscious will is inefficacious. In other words, that our brain decides things before we do. Um, so I'll call this the classic approach. Uh, and it's, it's, the argument basically goes via this phenomenon <clears throat> that's measured through EEG called the readiness potential or RP. So this potential is first documented, um, you know, half a century ago uh, by Kornhuber and Deek, uh, and employed by Benjamin Libet in conjunction with a report about the timing of consciousness in order to undermine the notion of free will. Um, and it's really become a, a very central issue. People have done a lot of work on the RP and trying to understand its role, but it's also percolated far beyond uh, neuroscience and has uh, become very popular in philosophy and even in the popular press. Um, so in the limit paradigm, uh, the subject has an EEG cap on his head. So there's uh, recording brain signals from the scalp at the same time that the subject is spontaneously and, and supposedly freely willing his movements. Um, the movement is being recorded by an EMG machine. And all the time that this is going on, the subject is also looking at a clock with a rotating dot and is asked to note the time, you know, where that dot is in the circle at the time that they spontaneously will their action. And then retrospectively to report where that dot was in order to obtain a time for willing or what they call W time. So just to uh, show you what this might look like, here you have an EEG cap and you're recording <clears throat> generally from the central electrode and you ask the subject to raise their finger periodically. Um, and you uh, take a lot of trials. Each, each one of these traces is the scalp recording of a single trial and you average those together and you get the RP. So this classic shaped uh, change in potential negative going potential prior to the movement. So this zero time is when the EMG machine shows that you've moved. And this has been interpreted as, interpreted as preparatory activity for volitional movement. Um, I really would like to move, oh, here we go. Um, okay, so the Libet interpretation then aims to measure the, conscious, the time of the consciousness of willing and action relative to the time of the neural signals. And just to summarize a lot of work, <clears throat> um, we're going to look here at the type 2 RP, which is spontaneously uh, willed actions, no pre-planning. And what uh, people have found, and this is a very reliable finding, is that you get uh, a, a EMG response, you get movement at a certain time, and when you, when you average all these traces together, and you look at the time at which people report being aware of willing uh, their movement, it tends to be about 200 milliseconds prior to the movement itself. 
Now that is not problematic in and of itself, but what Libet noticed is that the beginning of this RP predates the time at which you're consciously aware of moving. And this he took to be very problematic because as he took it, if you think of this as the decision point, it looks like your brain has already decided to start the movement before you're aware of willing it. And so he uh, interpreted this as being the inefficaciousness of conscious will. Um, so he had a couple of ways that he thought perhaps uh, we could save conscious will. One is that perhaps we could have free won't. That, that is, maybe we could veto an action in that 200 milliseconds between becoming aware of willing it and actually um, causing it. Um, but it turns out that that doesn't work at all because uh, vetoing things has the same kind of uh, preparatory activity. And so that's not a solution. Um, and Libet says in these voluntary actions that are not spontaneously and quickly performed, that, that is in those in which conscious deliberation or whether to act uh, or of what alternative choice or action to take precedes the act, the possibilities for conscious initiation and control would not be excluded by the present evidence, suggesting that there might be situations not like the ones uh, that he measured in which the time course is different enough that you might actually be able to uh, exert conscious will. So the veto possibility and the longer time scale would still be open under his view, but he thought that um, in general with these spontaneous actions at least, uh, they're not uh, going to be free because they are not able to be consciously willed. So I just want to outline uh, three commitments of this classic view. One is that it's post-decisional. That is that the RP, the readiness potential, is neural evidence uh, of a decision to move, which uh, begins at the onset. That decision is, is marked by the onset of the rise of the RP above the baseline level. Another is that it's ontologically real. That is, the RP is a real causally efficacious signal that, that initiates action. Um, and it has a distinct and measurable onset. And finally, that it's non-conscious, that is um, the RP precedes subjective awareness of decision. And that leads to the widely accepted doctrine that conscious will is inefficacious and therefore not free. Um, so now philosophers and other neuroscientists have uh, critiqued this. Um, so al although it's very, very, um, it's been very, very popular and has, has affected people's discussions about free will. It has not gone without uh, some kind of critique. Um, and for instance, they say, for instance, that uh, the experiments don't really probe the decision to move or not, but when to follow an instruction since they're being instructed by the experimenter to do this task. Um, other critiques say that the simple motor acts that are involved in this task are not the right paradigm for investigations of free will, um, or that longer timescales are the significant ones, as Libet himself notes. And for an example, Goldwitzer's implementation intentions seem to have causal efficacy. One of my favorite criticisms of the task is that the task itself uh, involves two subtasks. Um, one is sp to spontaneously move your finger, and the second is to report the time of awareness of your intent to move. And that itself requires two different components. One is recognizing your own intention to move. Um, and secondly, to index with respect to the clock, that's an external object, uh, when your intention to move is satisfied and then to report that result. Um, and this shift from your inner monitoring to a uh, perception of this outer object is an attentional shift and that shift takes time. So really what your, um, this, this awareness of your own attention to move is a meta state, which depends on uh, you're already consciously willing something and then must therefore logically follow in time upon it. And so, uh, even though people report their W time to be here, what I'm saying here is that this is not the time at which they consciously will to move, but this is when they become uh, metacognitively aware of their willing to move. That's a consciousness of intention, which means that the intention itself has to predate it, and we don't know exactly where in this time course it would be. 
So I think that that undermines the classic interpretation. Um, but I think that uh, recent results in neuroscience have, have also uh, given us other reasons to be really suspect of this way of interpreting the, R the RP. Um, so the, the three criteria that I laid out before, I think are gonna be called into question when we look at these other models. Um, so what we do know from, uh, from uh, years now of neuroscientific investigation of the RP is that it is a signal in the EEG visible prior to spontaneous voluntary movement. When you time lock to movement onset and average over multiple epochs and usually multiple subjects. When you look at individuals, there's quite a bit of variability across individuals. It's very difficult to resolve the RP in single trials because the traces are so noisy, noisy that any signal is really masked by the noise. Um, it does seem that the timing of the RP seems to be related to planning so that the, if you plan movements, you show an earlier rise in the RP. Um, but we've noticed also that not all subjects exhibit an RP. Um, they can still do the task and the shape and onset of the RP are very variable across subjects and across different kinds of trials. Uh, and more importantly, the RP so far hasn't proven to be a very good predictor of movement onset. And if it were a causal signal leading to movement onset, you would think uh, that you might be able to use it to predict it. Um, now, there's other work that really calls into question the role of the RP as causally uh, effective in causing action. Um, so it doesn't I think reflect a commitment to move because it's been shown that it's possible to uh, measure RPs even in cases where people with ultimately withhold movement. So you can actually generate an RP and then not move. Um, RP has also been present in tasks that don't involve motor components, uh, but involve, for instance, cognitive decisions. And they're also found to be present in tasks involving decisions not to move. And all of this, instead of uh, being consistent with the interpretation that the RP actually is reflective of an initiation of a process of movement, um, it's consistent with the RP being re reflective of a decision process itself, but not necessarily a decision process that is the initiator of movement. And uh, Aaron Sugar and colleagues have recently uh, put forth this computational model that they call the stochastic accumulator account, which is essentially using a standard diffusion to bound model, which is what psychologists and neuroscientists have been using to model decision processes for years, um, and showing that the RP results from averaging many trials, time lock to movement, if what's going on underneath is just a regular decision model. But under this interpretation, the RP doesn't reflect the time of decision. Um, the decision time is itself the effect of the bounded accumulator model reading, reaching a certain threshold. Like for instance, if this blue line is the threshold, you see this kind of random walk of the model and at some point it reaches threshold and that's the decision point. Um, so here what you see is the way in which different trials can ultimately lead to a threshold crossing. And if you, uh, run this model a number of times, what you find out is the waiting time between trials. So you're asking someone to continually spontaneously move their finger with at random intervals. Um, the model essentially replicates the empirical data on waiting time um, just by uh, instituting a regular diffusion to bound model. And then when you time lock all of these traces to the point at which someone moves, what you'd get is exactly what the RP looks like. Uh, so this is a completely different interpretation of the kind of thing that generates the RP. So if you think about the uh, regular uh, classic interpretation, the idea is that there's some kind of baseline level of neural activity and there's a neural decision to initiate movement at the point at which the trace leaves the baseline. And then at some point there's enough activity uh, to get um, 
to get the movement to happen. Sorry, I have been unable to figure out how to turn off my telephone. Um, on the other hand, then when you have uh, the sugar model, uh, that's a pre-decisional model. So what you see here is the evolution of activity and the decision happens at the point at which the threshold is crossed, which is immediately prior to action and not 200 or, or 500 milliseconds before the action occurs. So essentially nothing has been decided at this point. This is just the evolution of activity and the decision occurs here rather than um, well before the movement occurs. Right, so the neural decision to initiate movement is very shortly after followed by the movement itself. So the implications of these stochastic models um, is that where the RP is already detectable, there's no decision to move that has been made yet. Um, so the decision actually follows the time at which people report being conscious, uh, conscious of willing an action, which is exactly what common sense suggests. Um, it may reflect the buildup of a signal of which the agent becomes aware uh, around that W time, which is also what you would suggest if consciousness results from a temporally extended process, which many people have uh, thought to be true. So then the RP is actually a kind of artifact. It emerges from biased sampling by averaging EEG traces time lock to action. And it doesn't necessarily reflect an underlying neural process that's present only prior to action because you never end up sampling the cases in which action doesn't occur. Um, it also implies that there's no physiological significance to that onset point of the RP, the point at which it deviates from baseline. Um, that point isn't real in the sense that it's, it's an artifact of averaging and it doesn't reflect a causal process that has any um, you know, so individual trial relation to action. Um, and you can get something that looks like an RP signal from time locking and averaging a variety of other potential real uh, but small neural signals in the data. Okay, so when you think about the three commitments of the classical model, um, let's, let's see what the stochastic model says about them. Rather than it being post-decisional, it says that it's pre-decisional, so the RP reflects evidence that contributes to a decision to move. Rather than being ontologically real, it's artifactual. The RP is an artifact of sampling a causally efficacious neural process, which is the de decision process itself but the underlying signal has no measurable onset and may not resemble the RP in, indiv in individual trials. And third, um, it, we really don't know whether it's conscious or non-conscious. The RP may reflect a signal that gives rise to subjective consciousness of a decision or intention, but it may not. But nonetheless, um, because the W time precedes the decision time, it doesn't call into question any of the classic or any of the uh, folk psychological um, or intuitive positions that we may have about free will. All right, so if the onset of the RP is meaningless, relating W time to it is also meaningless. So this completely undercuts the Libet style arguments for unconscious decisions. Um, now, according to the stochastic model, the decision in these kinds of Libet style tasks is actually due to noise. Um, in these cases of spontaneous action, when you have no reason to act at one time versus another, um, it's perhaps appropriate to let decisions happen using noise or whatever kinds of mechanisms can operate in these conditions. And I would argue that the fact that the decision happens due to noise in these, uh, these kinds of decisions that are set up to have no reasons for choosing one alternative or another or choosing to move now as opposed to later, um, that that poses little threat to our philosophical uh, conceptions of free will. Uh, now, when we think about the stochastic accumulator model, there are questions about how that model interacts with philosophical positions. And that I think is not entirely straightforward. So depending on what your philosophical position is, um, you may or may not think that this accumulator model view of how action is initiated uh, challenges free will. So for instance, uh, an agent causation theorist who thinks agents are special and sort of outside of the causal 
network of, um, uh, of science that they are uncaused causes, I think they would not be satisfied by this accumulator model because the decision to move now is actually caused by noisy information that, that um, passes the threshold and that probably won't satisfy them as an agent cause. Um, however, it would satisfy most libertarians if it turns out that the noise is indeterministic and we don't know whether or not the noise is indeterministic. Um, and I believe it would satisfy most compatibilists, right? So a compatibilist could say, look, in cases where there aren't reasons governing our decisions to act, then noise may be the, the, exactly the kind of thing that you would want to allow us to make random decisions. Um, but that doesn't have implications for other sorts of decisions like making decisions for reasons. Um, and even in the uh, stochastic decision model, the deviation from the baseline that allows one to cross thresholds is a result of intentional and conscious decision, right? You're putting yourself in the task set of moving your finger spontaneously. Um, however, some people might still be worried uh, because if the noise is really what's driving the action, then you might argue, you know, why is this decision in these cases up to me rather to someone else? So there, there are different philosophical positions that would cause someone to take this model and interpret its implications for free will differently. Um, there are other kinds of, uh, or other variants of this kind of stochastic model that more clearly reflect volitional processes such as motivational strength. Um, and then you could have a story in which the threshold crossing events aren't entirely due to noise and are causally connected to volition. Um, and as long as you have some sort of volitional component, that might be enough to secure agency or free will for decisions, even if you're an agent causation theorist, right? So um, we might accept that we have agency, even if we aren't aware of or in control of all the causal influences on our decisions for them to be free. Um, and in fact, you know, it's, it's pretty clear social psychology has shown that there are decisions that influence our behavior that we're unaware of. Um, but very few people have taken that as uh, an argument that, that we have no freedom at all because uh, it's, it's perfectly compatible with free action that there are still things that bias uh, the things that we do or causally affect the things we do. So I want to summarize a uh, couple points. Neuroscience is not going to resolve the determinism question. The classic or post-decision models assume that the RP onset has physiological significance and open up a space for comparison between onset time and W time, and thus for arguments about inefficacious conscious, conscious will. But the family of stochastic models that I uh, introduced can equally well model the RP. Under these models, the classic RP is just a natural consequence of analysis techniques, but it doesn't entail that in individual trials, there's an electrical potential with the characteristics of the RP that signifies action initiation. And rather, uh, in the underlying decision processes give rise to decisions that occur approximately when we're aware of, of them occurring. Um, so I would say that none of these models or neuroscientific results challenges the efficacy of uh, conscious will, even though the model details might affect uh, the way in which we interpret uh, various decisions and the way in which they're related. Um, and I guess what I wanted to, to just say uh, to connect this more to law is I don't think that, that any of these neuroscientific avenues of exploration are going to succeed in uh, convincing us or should succeed in convincing us that we lack free will. Um, but I do think that there's plenty of neuroscientific evidence that is relevant to determinations of responsibility. Um, and largely that I think goes through the notion of capacity. So I think if we have a capacitarian idea of free will, that is we have to have certain kinds of capacities in order to act freely, like capacities to reason and inhibit our actions and various other capacities that I think the law clearly recognizes, um, 
then if we can show neuroscientifically that people's capacities are severely impacted, I think that those are the kinds of neuroscientific um, pieces of evidence that may actually be much more significant for law. But I think that, that uh, looking for global undermining of uh, notions of free will and responsibility um, are all flawed and I don't see really any avenue for, for those uh, to impact the law. I think I will stop there and um, I'll look forward to your questions later. Thanks. Dr. Roskies, thank you so much for your presentation. It, uh, it's a very important presentation. I have some questions that I, I've worked up for you, uh, but we, again, um, we'll pose those um, at, at the end rather than uh, do that right now. And we should instead move to our next presenter. Allie, do you have uh, something? That... Dr. Reed, our next presenter will be Dr. Shen. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Professor Shen, let me uh, get my notes out for you because I okay. had Stacy's uh, notes on top. We we bait and switch, yeah, during Professor Roski's <laughs> Okay, well, let me introduce you then. Um, and um, in preparation for the, this uh, event, of course, I read some of your work, and uh, you've done some very important work. I'm particularly drawn to your your article on. Um, uh, talking, speaking about um, law and neuroscience 2.0, and a point you make it within that article that I, I have uh, intuitively stumbled upon myself. And uh, I have taught criminal law and I have taught contract law. And I've discovered in the course of, of teaching the, those two disciplines that they each uh, discipline takes a different approach to the idea of, um, uh, of uh, pressure exerted on the will, if you, if you might. And the contracts, of course, we see this with uh, ideas like undue influence. In criminal law, we see the insanity defense and diminished capacity. And I found it important the way you, you distinguished between these ideas and, and, and developed some, some of these ideas very well. I may uh, reference your work in, in, in my future teaching. Thank you so much. And well, um, I, I think at this point, uh, I, I've looked at other uh, parts of your work and, and good luck in getting aging judges to agree to cognitive assessments. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll save that for an, uh, another day. Right now, Professor Shen, uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And, and please, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Ali and to Jack and to uh, everyone at uh, the journal as well for organizing this symposium. There are a few things uh, I enjoy more than talking about law and neuroscience. So it's a pleasure to be with you today. I thought I'd take a little bit different uh, tap uh, today. And rather than zoom in on one particular thing within the field of law and neuroscience, I'd zoom way out and ask a definitional question. So this is a symposium on law and neuroscience, and sometimes also described as neurolaw. But what is it? What is law and neuroscience? What is the field? What are the contours of the field? What is in, what's outside? Um, that's what I want to probe a little bit with you today. And I'd invite your thoughts on what this field is and how it should be defined. I've got some views, and I'll share them with you. But uh, I'm interested to see what you think. But here's where I want to start. I want to start with an image that I love to show. It's not from uh, my own work. It's from uh, just a wonderful team. And you'll see the site there. And here's the image. I hope you can see it. And if your screen is large enough, what you'll see is that um, there's a beating brain. The reason I like this is that you can do it right now. Feel your skull. You can't really feel that right now. Now, there are certain ways I'm sure you can. Unlike the heart, you can, you, you've taken your pulse, you can do that. You can hear right here. When you were a little kid, you did that little experiment with your kit and you could hear your heart. You had some sense of what was going on in there. The brain is so mysterious, it's so mysterious. And what I like about this image is that it reminds us that everything that I am doing right now and everything that you are doing right now, whether you're paying attention to me or answering your email or worrying about something else or thinking about COVID or whatever else it is, 
this is where it's happening. This is not just in the brain, it's the brain in communication with the rest of the central nervous system, engaged with the environment, facilitated by development over time and genetics and a whole bunch of other things. So it's not the brain in a vat, but this is, um, this is where the action is. This is what we study in my lab, the legal implications of that beating brain. Um, the motto of my lab is every story is a brain story. And I think that's true. I think the challenge, and this is really, you know, Dina just pointed one of the great examples out. Every story is a poorly understood brain story and some are not understood at all or haltingly. And what do we do when we have some information from neuroscience and related fields, but not enough? What do we do in the law? Do we respond at all? Do we change anything? What do we change? What evidence do we introduce? Those are some of the questions that this field is wrestling with. If there's nothing else that I leave you with today, um, here's the big thing for me. And that's the reason that this is the motto of my, my lab uh, at the University of Minnesota and at uh, Mass General Hospital. It's to correct the notion that the heart is the center of thinking and emotions. Now, part of it is just we're caught up in the language. But imagine, when's the last time you had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation or that you or a loved one had a broken heart? or that you loved with all your heart, or that you criticized someone for being heartless or liked someone because they had a big heart. Every time you use that word heart in those instances, you are talking about neurobiological mechanisms, neurobiology. The heart pumps blood, that's what it does. It should win an award, I love the heart, but the heart wins the award for best supporting actor. The brain is the true star of the show. And it is ultimately what I'm going to suggest to you that what unifies the field of law and neuroscience is not a particular method, is not a particular area of law, it is an organ. And it's interesting because sometimes I've heard my neuroscience friend describe this not as an organ, but as a process, as an information processing you know, device or not even device, just information processing. So exactly what the brain is, I'm not even sure. I don't know that anyone is exactly, um, but whatever it is, it's at the heart of the things that we care most about. If you don't go that far with me, the rest of everything I say won't make any sense, but I hope you will. Let's take a journey. All right, so what do we do in my lab? We do empirical work, we do education work. We do it across a number of areas. I won't go into all those things, um, but there are, if you wanna learn more, two places, there are many places to go amongst them lawneuro.org. We'll share the slides afterwards, a searchable bibliography. Um, Dean and I and others uh, today were involved in something called the MacArthur Foundation Research Network on Law and Neuroscience, started by the, uh, an idea held by Dr. Sapolsky, who you hear about a little bit later today. Um, I continue this work at a center that I run uh, with colleagues Bruce Price and Judy Edersheim at the uh, Center for Law, Brain, and Behavior um, at Harvard, and there's our, our site. And I want to thank uh, all the many students and my colleagues at the center who have facilitated this work. So we're really driven by law, law concerns, justice concerns. And the idea at the center is that better decisions aligned with science, including though not limited to neuroscience, may produce better outcomes aligned with justice. Of course, you can also imagine certain alignment or misalignment with the wrong science producing outcomes aligned with injustice. Again, going back to this, uh, this challenge. So what's the question for today? What is neuro law. There is no accepted definition yet. Google tells me, Merriam-Webster tells me that this term doesn't exist, so we've got to answer it ourselves. And here at least is a working definition. Here's a working definition. Legal use, legal being broad, we're going to see that. Use meaning broad, meaning everything from a conceptual shift to an evidentiary tool to an expert testifying, but use being broad and governance, and that's important too. You heard that in the first section. So it's not just that, oh, neuroscience has some new information and we might use it in a law. It's also that law as regulator, FDA, FTC, and so on and so forth, internationally, um, other global bodies governing the use of this. What are we talking about? Neuroscientific tools, new concepts, new data. We'll see if that holds up. We can come back to it. Here's what I wanna to touch on today, three things. One, just a few words about this goal of like, what are we trying to do if we're trying to define this and why does it matter? And then the middle chunk will be most of it, just giving you a sense of the breadth and the depth of law and neuroscience right now. And I'm just gonna give you uh, all real cases, all legal cases, uh, you know, so for the lawyers in the room, if you're wondering, is this ever show up in law? Yeah, not only will it ever, it is. Um, 
hundreds and uh, actually, in fact, thousands of cases. Uh, I'll give you some snapshots. And then at the end, a few thoughts on how we might pull all of this together. All right. So I'm interested as both an intellectual enterprise, but also as a matter of practice for thinking about what exactly is law and neuroscience and what value does it add distinct from things that already exist? And I think we've got to think about being both too narrow and too broad. So to narrow a view, in my um, uh, opinion, would be to say that neuroscience and law is just about criminal responsibility and criminal sentencing. Well, that's a part of it. Or that it's just about government regulation of new neurotechnology, though that's a part of it. Or it's just about civil litigation of brain injury cases, by the which of which there is a lot, but it's more than that. So it's got to be all of those things and more, but it can't be everything. So for instance, there's a world called neuroethics, which think about ethical questions. Some ethical questions are related to law, but they're not the same. So it can't just be the same as neuroethics. It can't be that we've just heard a lot about free will. It can't be that every question about free, free will is a question for neuro law, in which case you wouldn't need a field. We just say, you know, the philosophy and moral philosophy is, is enough. And it can't be that every question about the brain implicates the law or else the field of law and neuroscience would just collapse into neuroscience and neurology, uh, neuropsychiatry. So um, we've got to figure out, again, some way to be not too narrow and not too broad. One more thing we have to ask at the outset is, wait a second, there's a thing law and psychology. It's been around a long time. Um, in fact, if you Google law and psychology, you'll find there are societies, there are edited volumes. You can go ahead and get degrees in law and psychology. So is law and neuroscience just law and psychology by a different name? I don't think so. I don't really have time to go into exactly why, but I would suggest to you that one very big difference is the use of neurobiological data. So law and psychology has little to say about epilepsy in the law, for instance. Law and psychology has, as I've seen it, nothing to say about the development of biomarkers for early detection of dementia and Alzheimer's and those legal implications, right? But there's certainly a lot of overlap in law and psychology, um, but it's not exactly the same. What about law and psychiatry? Same thing, lots and lots of law and psychiatry, but when you get to law and neurology, hardly anything. Law and neuropsychiatry, nothing. Why don't we have more interdisciplinary conversation already between the neuro versions of these fields? Again, it's for a longer discussion, but it's, I think, in large part because the practice of psychiatry and the practice of psychology in general, with some notable exceptions, doesn't involve a lot of direct brain data. And if any one of you knows anyone who's dealt with any of the following, depression, substance use disorder, ADHD, almost to a T, unless there was some suspected um, uh, uh, you know, traumatic injury, they're not getting brain scans, they're not getting blood draws, they're getting cognitive behavioral therapy, they're getting um, talk therapy, they may be getting pharmacology also, so there is some interaction there, um, but it's just not discussed in neurobiological terms. That, by the way, again, for another day is changing. The fields of psychology and psychiatry are changing. I think we'll see some changes along the way. But, all right, so where are we at? We don't have an accepted definition. I've suggested to you that law and neuroscience, we don't know exactly what it is, but I think it's not just the same as law and psychology. It's not just the same as law and psychiatry. So there's something here. So rather than try and define it, you know, sort of just theoretically, I'd like to define it from the bottom up. That is, in this next set of slides, to just go through what does law and neuroscience look like on the ground? And maybe that will give us some sense of how we want to define it. One thing to say at the outset is there's a really long history of law and neuroscience. I've talked about it, others have as well, and there's one piece. Um, I'll just mention to you that um, on this screen, you see sort of going backwards in 40 year increments, attempts to look at violence and the brain. Uh, all the way back to Egas Moniz, that's the uh, prefrontal uh, lobotomy, the tool for the prefrontal lobotomy there that can a stamp on the uh, side of your screen. And this made, this was really interesting to law. Let me give you a quote from uh, students writing a note in the Yale Law Journal, 1948 Assessment of Psychosurgery, which by the way, wins a Nobel Prize. Here's what um, was written in the Yale Law Journal. Quote, psychosurgery has startling implications for rehabilitation. Perfection of so relatively simple and inexpensive a rehabilitative technique as a prefrontal lobotomy promises to be a major contribution to the cure of criminals. That's 1948. That's law and neuroscience. Right? That is, go back to that slide I gave you. It seems like, boy, that's um, uh, better decisions aligned with science, like the prefrontal lobotomy. Shouldn't those give you better outcomes aligned with justice? Professor Shen, isn't that what you just said? Uh, yeah. 
What's the problem? The problem is we have to interrogate the science. What's the additional problem? We're lawyers. We're in the law. We're not trained in medicine. We're not trained in neurology. We're not trained in neuroscience. So how do we as lawyers evaluate this? And how do we evaluate, especially when it comes with the credential of a Nobel Prize? Answer, we work together. And there are a lot of fields that are doing that. Um, this field of neurolaw has grown a lot over the last 15 years. It's been on the cover of the New York Times Magazine. There are more and more articles being published. We just published the second edition of our Law and Neuroscience Casebook. And just in the six years since the first edition, you know, tons, hundreds and hundreds of new citations. By the way, 90% of the material is only published since 2000. That is every case, every opinion article, every scientific publication only since the year 2000, 90% of them, uh, and a good half now only in the last five or six years. It's a fast moving field, which raises question. This was from a, an event we did earlier this year um, uh, up at Harvard. What is the next frontier? Where's all of this going? Let me give you a sense of, again, just the breadth of types of cases. They involve, these are all just from the 2020, brain death. They involve the effect of pesticides on the brain, um, brain injury, uh, the um, violence in the brain from sports injuries. And this stuff is showing up in courts. What was once philosophical inquiry, did my neurons make me do it? Did my brain tumor make me do it? Are now in a lot of context, um, actual court cases. And it's often the case that it's not just you know, a little footnote, and the lawyers will know this, sometimes you just add something in a footnote, and it's not a main part of your argument. It's showing up front and center. Here's an example. So um, there's so much has happened since 2017 that this incident has almost, I think, somehow passed from collective memory. But at the time, you may recall that in Charlottesville, Virginia, around UVA, there were protests and counter-protests, white nationalists on the one hand, um, those protesting their views on the other. And that car that you see there was driven by a man named James Fields, there he is pictured on the right, age 20 at the time. He kills Heather Heyer, that's a um, picture of her on the left. And uh, through a negotiation in the plea, he wasn't gonna get the death penalty, but the question was, would he get life without the possibility of parole? In the sentencing memorandum that went before the judge, his defense attorneys put neuroscience front and center. It's page one, it's their main argument. They say, now I quibble with the language, but the point is that it's here. Contemporary neuroscience proves, they say, that the line of constitutional protection should extend beyond 18 up to 21. And they specifically point to the advent of this functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI evidence. Now the prosecution had a response and said, look, we don't really think he fits into this pattern. My point is that it showed up. It showed up front and center and it's showing up a lot of places. It showed up at the Supreme Court in thinking about whether states could regulate the sale of violent video games uh, to uh, youth. It showed up just uh, within the last couple months in terms, and it's showed up again and again in death penalty cases um, uh, when the individual who is facing the death penalty committed his or her crime uh, somewhere between 18 to 21, uh, and there are arguments that neuroscience has a role to play there. It's showing up in our applied work. It is just how do you go about the business of doing criminal justice reform? This was a program that we ran this past summer that's ongoing with prosecutors and defense attorneys and advocates and youth themselves in Massachusetts looking at justice in the developing brain. It's showing up in plea bargaining. I had time as a really interesting attorney, Stephen Cobb. I sat down with him for a couple hours um, recently to talk about his work. He gets brain scans of a number of his clients. He shows them during the plea bargaining stage and he gets better outcomes for his clients. It's much more than criminal law. Um, here's a case that was a fascinating case for me. This is a picture, not of the actual event, but it really captures it. City of Bloomfield Hills called Allen v. Bloomfield Hills. And this crossing guard gate goes down, ding, 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 ding. And this school bus, for whatever reason, tries to run the crossing guard gate. The train, conducted by Charles Allen, hits the bus. Thankfully, there are no kids on the bus, but the driver gets seriously injured. And this is where the legal thing kicks in. Um, the driver, the conductor of the train, Charles Allen, didn't have a, really a scratch on his body, or they healed pretty quickly, but he had ongoing lasting mental scars. He was diagnosed with post-traumatic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. Everyone agreed he had PTSD and everyone pretty much agreed that the cause of the PTSD was this incredibly traumatic event. The legal question was this, 
Was it bodily injury? Again, he doesn't have a scratch on his body because there's an immunity statute, as there are. Most places, um, it would have to be bodily injury in order for his suit against the city of Bloomfield Hills to go forward. He proffered brain evidence. He said the brain is a part of the body. PTSD is physically instantiated a brain. Through the logic, PTSD, even without another scratch on the body, is a physical bodily injury. District court said, no way, think of the slippery slope. Appellate court said, we see the logic of your argument, goes up to the Michigan, Michigan Supreme Court and it settles. So there's no law there, but these cases are showing up. Again, this has nothing to do with criminal responsibility. This has to do with conceptual, this has to do with mind-body dualism, but this is real law. These are real cases. There are also a number of cases around substance use disorder and addiction. I'll just flag one which came up uh, two years ago in Massachusetts. This is the defendant involved, Julie Eldred. Um, I think many of you know that sort of requirement number one on almost every probation uh, list, parole and probation is stay drug free. She had an opioid um, uh, addiction, she's in, she gets let out of parole. And again, uh, rule number one, uh, condition number one, stay drug free. Well, seven days later, she relapses, seven, 10 days later, she relapses. She argued that based on the Massachusetts state constitution, it was unconstitutional to require her to stay drug free because she did not have control over whether she stayed drug free or not. She analogized to cancer, to telling someone, okay, don't get cancer. You know, how, how can I control that was her argument. Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court um, for a variety of reasons, both procedural and substantive didn't go that way, but um, the briefs were filled with neuroscience, neuroscience and law, not, 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 not hypothetical cases, real cases happening, we'll see more of these. What about memory trauma and asylum law? A role for neuroscience? We think, yes, we're working on these issues. If I had more time, I'd talk about it. That's an entirely different area of law where neuroscience matters. Um, one of the ways in which it matters is that there is a presumption when one is seeking asylum, and of course you have to tell your story about why you're seeking asylum. What if that story changes from your first instance to the second? Should we infer that you are deliberately intending to de deceive in order to get into the country? Maybe, but maybe not. And maybe the neuroscience of memory, how memory works, how episodic recall works, could inform the baseline, the default uh, presumptions. Here in Minnesota, I know a lot of you from Minnesota, we've been leading a multi-year project around youth sports concussions. This doesn't have to do with criminal responsibility. This doesn't have to do with free will. This has to do with how do you keep kids safer? How do you balance risk and reward? Been in the Minnesota legislature around these issues. Earlier came up uh, issues of artificial intelligence. Uh, plays a big role here, both because of the data being collected, the way they're being analyzed. Can it be used for good or for harm? Part of the conversation. Now, a lot of the cases I've shown you, uh, and if I showed you more, there are more of them than ever before, but they're still a small segment. The vast majority of legal cases don't involve any brain evidence, which raises the question, well, wait a second, is this just like a little tiny niche thing? And again, maybe, but I don't think so. And I think one way to think about neuroscientific evidence is this instant replay. Now, there are probably many sports fans in this audience, and you know that the vast majority of plays don't get any instant replay. It's you know, 90, 95 or more percent, even in professional sports, there's no instant replay. But certain plays, we're used to this image, all right? When do we have use instant replay? When the stakes are high, was it a touchdown or not? When, someone's, when, the, when it's a close call, like the foot is just on the line where the inbounds are out of bounds where someone disagrees with the initial call on the field and crucially where you actually have video evidence. There's hardly any instant replay in grade school or high school. It's not because you think the refs get it right all the time. It's because there's just no video camera evidence. And there were no pictures like this up until you know, the mid 20th century. Well, we didn't have the opportunity to do this in law to look at images or other types of brain data. Um, and now we do. And I could imagine it being used again in a certain set of cases high profile, high impact borderline cases that are precedent setting uh, in the system. It's not just brain data, it's sort of biomarkers more generally. And I will simply say that there is tremendous uncertainty about how the law is gonna handle probabilistic data, probabilistic biomarkers of mental disease and disorder. Here's one example based on work that's being done here at the University of Minnesota and internationally. What are the legal implications of early detection of elevated risk for autism spectrum disorder? Here's what my colleagues across the campus do, uh, Jed Ellison and others. Um, they take six little six month year old toddlers, babies, not toddlers, even babies. They scan their brains. They then can predict with increasing accuracy 
whether at age two, those kids will be on the autism spectrum disorder. Why are they doing this? To identify opportunities for early and intensive intervention, which the behavioral evidence has shown is likely to have positive outcomes. But oh boy, and this is the headline, you know, there's the from it, but oh boy, is it raising legal implications. First of all, just insurance coverage, like is insurance gonna cover it? And is that a stigma then for later in life? Do you want insurance to know? Is the government have a responsibility to intervene earlier and earlier? And again, what about when it's just probabilistic? What does it mean to say I have an 80, my child has an 82% chance likelihood? That's still, we just remember the polls from just last week. That doesn't mean that it's bound to happen. Do you tell the parents? What do you tell the parents? These are questions that have never been confronted before because we've never been able to get this sort of data before. This is also part of law and neuroscience. You might wonder if this brain evidence can um, persuade jurors. Those who know this field will know this case, but if you don't, let me just mention it to you because it's quite instructive. This was a case, um, the answer is yes, it can. We don't know, there's debate in the literature about how persuasive it can be, but at least in some cases, it seems to make a difference. Here's one. Uh, this was uh, Grady Nelson, you see a picture of him there. He did a number of horrible things. He stabbed uh, his wife over 60 times and killed her, tried to uh, kill his stepchildren, thankfully they survived, a litany of sex crimes and other violent crimes. The only question at sentencing was whether or not he was going, it was clearly guilty. And his uh, defense attorney, Terry Lenneman knew it. The only question was whether he would receive the death penalty or life without the possibility of parole, 2010 case out of Florida. So they showed this image, the image there in the uh, lower uh, corner of the screen, quantitative electroencephalography, quote unquote, brain mapping evidence. I mean, I'm on record you know, criticizing the use of this uh, evidence in this particular case, but here's what I want you to hear what the jurors said about this. So the jury tied 6-6, which means that Mr. Nelson did not go to death row. He went to life without the possibility of parole. Here in their own words are what jurors said, quote, when the brain, juror, juror Dolores Cannon, the hospital secretary, when the brain evidence came in, the facts about the QEEG, some of us changed our mind, end quote. Juror John Howard, airport fleet services worker, uh, the evidence turned my decision all the way around. The technology really swayed me. After seeing the brain scans, I was convinced this guy had some sort of brain problem. Now they didn't all buy it. Juror Leon Benbo, retired mailman, all that scientific testimony, that was a waste of taxpayer money. That's phony. There's nothing wrong with that guy's brain. So I don't know if there's anything wrong with that guy's brain. What I do know is that what was once theoretical is now practical lawyering. And I know that the day after this decision came down, attorney Terry Lenneman put out a press release to his fellow attorneys announcing who his expert was and what results they had. And so whether you like it or don't like this use of neuroscience, it's showing up both prosecutors and defenders uh, need to be used to it. We've talked about those um, and uh, then let me just jump ahead. So this is the main point. You know, we could go, I've got a bunch more slides in the interest of time. I'll simply sum up and say a lot in law hinges on how brains work. All right, so that's our context. Now let's get back then to pulling this all together. Let me go back to the definition I offered at the beginning. You've now seen a variety and just even a small snippet of the legal use of governance and governance of neuroscience tools, concepts, and data. Um, here are, I think, three principles for moving forward. So first, I really like the idea of a broad definition. I would hope that our field includes everything that I just talked about and more. Second, I think we've got to think about both the role that neuroscience might play in law. So again, hey, we've learned something from neuroscience, let's bring it to law, but also the way that law can shape neuroscience, both the development of technologies, their use, and the nature and scope of research. And finally, I think we've got to be patient, really patient, um, and expect a lot of variation along the way, because when we talk about law and neuroscience, it's a particular part of the scientific menu connected to a particular part of law, and it's not going to develop evenly. So let me just say a, a briefly about these. So broad definition. Boy, I've already given you a bunch, but I could give you a bunch more work on elder law, work on pain, work on veterans' brains in the law, education law, all those little kids, like my little kids, how are they learning their brain? I mean, health law, there's just so much here. Um, there's a lot. I wish we had more time for it, we don't. Second point is this one. And I do wanna say that this is a place where the law and neuroscience as a field is distinct from a lot of the other areas. It is the regulation of methods is a big deal. For, in, for instance, here in uh, Minnesota, we've got a number of, uh, medical manufacturers, Medtronic, Boston Scientific, et cetera. When they hire attorneys, they are hiring them to work with FDA, to work with government regulator, to think about liability. 
And there are new methods coming. Here's one that I work uh, with colleagues on thinking about the legal implications of portable brain scanners. Uh, we just had a big meeting this past week with this working group exploring the ethical, legal, and social implications of what happens when the scanner comes out of the lab and into your doctor's office or into the psychology building or into the corner of the school. These things are possible. Uh, we need to think about them. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, one just uh, more point so I've, uh, is here on this idea of patience because I see I'm basically out of time. So, um, I really think that we're headed uh, in, in a really interesting and intriguing direction, this field of law and neuroscience. But at the same time, as bullish as I am about the future, I am reticent and hesitant about how long it will take um, the law to really change. And in part because we don't know how it should change, right? I gave you that example from before. But conceptually, here's one of the deep ideas. And I'll leave you with this, this thought. Um, this comes from uh, a book called The Path of Law. Uh, by um, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., who, by the way, some of you in bioethics would know, had some other questionable opinions. But on this point, in this book, I think was right to point out that precedent is not good enough. We don't keep doing something just because we've been doing it a long time. No better for a rule of, a reason for a rule of law than it was so laid down in the time of Henry IV. And still more revolting if the grounds upon which it were laid down have vanished long since. And that's really, I think, one of the ways in which neuroscience fundamentally will begin to reshape the way we think about law and the way we think about each other. What about our assumptions, both in our daily life, in our social life, in our legal life? Need to, what about those assumptions need to be examined? How might neuroscience and related fields help us to examine them? And then slowly but surely, how might we harness this science to produce more just, more effective, uh, more democratic outcomes. Big questions. I don't have the answers for any of them, but I think this field is headed that way. Uh, and I think we ought to define it broadly uh, so that we keep these many tendrils of, of conversation alive. That's what I want to say. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to say it. So thanks guys. And I'll um, hand it over. Dr. Reed, you're thank muted. You. There we are. Professor Shen, thank you so much for your presentation. I have a number of questions for you, uh, but we'll, we'll get to the questions after we hear from our final speaker of the morning, and that is Professor Stacy Tovino. Now, it is quite possible that she is the very first person I spoke to regarding the possibility of having this, um, this symposium. I attended the uh, Law and Neuroscience event at the American Association of Law Schools in uh, January, back when meetings were still taking place in person. And um, uh, Dr. Tovino gave a very, very compelling talk, very interesting talk. I thought it was risk-taking. You were doing investigating gambling disorders while teaching at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And now I've noticed you've moved to Oklahoma. Good for you. Uh, but um, so, um, I thought it was a very uh, compelling presentation you gave then. And we had a very uh, a good uh, conversation afterwards. You gave me some good pointers on, on helping to develop this uh, symposium. I wanna thank you for all those reasons. And I want to say that uh, and we welcome you here to the University of St. Thomas and, and please tell us more. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and a very special thank you to Allison Cole, Jack Buck, um, of course, Dr. Reed and the entire Journal of Law and Public Policy for the opportunity to participate in this Neuroscience and the Law Symposium today. I'm so grateful. Thank you for having me. As Dr. Reed mentioned, I wanted to talk today about a question that I dealt with on a daily basis for the decade that I lived in Las Vegas and taught at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and that even though I didn't think I would be still dealing with it, that I continue to deal with quite frequently now that I've moved to Oklahoma as well. And I'm actually so excited that I have the opportunity to speak Dr. Shen, because so many things that he mentioned are going to come up in my talk. Um, but the thing I want to focus on today is the very practical question of how non-criminal law, including, for example, health insurance laws, health insurance contracts, 
disability law, state rules of professional conduct, and state Supreme Court rules, how these non-criminal areas of the law should treat individuals who gamble and or individuals who have gambling disorder, and the role that neuroscience should or maybe should not play in that discussion. And let me just provide some background information before I go on. For the decade between 2010 and 2020, so just until this summer, I taught at the Boyd School of Law at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and my school of law was located just to the east or just to the right of the casinos that you see on the right hand side of the slide. I could easily walk or run from my office at UNLV or from my classroom or from the place I parked at UNLV to pretty much all of these casinos that you see right here. We had a whopping 104 casinos in Las Vegas, and that number counts businesses um, only with more than 15 slot machines or one with table games. So that number is actually much higher if you count the hundreds of establishments um, uh, such as like gas stations, convenience stores, uh, grocery stores, restaurants, and other commercial businesses that have fewer machines, as you can see right here. Now this is called Vons. This is actually the grocery store that was located one block from the really nice gated neighborhood where I lived in Las Vegas and where most of my colleagues lived. And when I walked into this grocery store, there was a Starbucks counter there as there were at many other nice grocery stores. And then just to the left of that counter were a bunch of slot machines, almost like a mini casino right there in the grocery store. And I remember when I moved to Las Vegas in 2010, when I would go to Starbucks in that grocery store at 6 a.m. on the way to work to get my coffee. And then when I would return to that same um, grocery store at 6 p.m. 12 hours later, um, the people that had been sitting at those slot machines at 6 a.m. were still sitting there 12 hours later at 6 p.m. And their kids frequently were parked outside that grocery store still waiting as they had been for about 12 hours. And for those of you who might not be too familiar with Las Vegas, this is very dangerous for our kids in part because in the summer, our area is very, very hot, as high as 125 degrees if you're a kid sitting outside a store on a parking lot. And also, unfortunately, because the area right around UNLV and the Strip and where I lived is pretty much ground zero in the United States for sex trafficking. Um, so children who are left um, alone or who appear to be lost are frequently scooped up. Now our state had a secret, which of course we didn't like to share, which is that up to 6% of our residents met diagnostic criteria for addiction to gambling or what the American Psychiatric Association calls gambling disorder, which means that no matter how hard they try, they can't stop gambling. They gamble when they feel distress. Even after a day of losing a ton of money, they'll return to a casino and lose significant more money. Um, and we call that chasing their losses. Most, if not all, have jeopardized or lost a significant relationship, not just partners and spouses, but usually child uh, children through child custody disputes because they left their kids in hot cars um, while they are gambled or something like that. They've also lost educational opportunities, career opportunities because they can't stop gambling, et cetera. So the funny thing is that when I moved from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas to the University of Oklahoma in Norman, Oklahoma this summer, um, I thought my days of being asked to talk about or being asked to think about the non-criminal, or should I probably say the civil and regulatory health law issues that are raised by individuals who gamble and or individuals who have gambling disorder, I thought those days were over. Um, because um, to me, UNLV, or I should say Las Vegas, is ground zero for gambling. And I really didn't know uh, much about gambling outside of places like Atlantic City in New Jersey, where I'm from, um, Biloxi, Mississippi, in New Orleans, Louisiana, where I went to college, and Las Vegas, Nevada, where I spent the last decade. Um, but the funny thing is that as soon as I got here, I realized that five miles away from the University of Oklahoma, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide in the red box, is a very big casino called the Riverwind Casino, which you can see on the left-hand side of the slide in the green box. And I can actually run or jog or even take a very long walk uh, to this casino from either my office at work or my home. And shortly after I moved here, I actually started feeling like Norman, Oklahoma, which many of you might not even know about, um, was almost like a little Las Vegas, complete with the most amazing individuals whose lives had become completely and incomprehensibly uh, devastated by gambling disorder. About 3% of our state residents are estimated to have gambling disorder, and we have an exceptionally high percentage of our state residents um, with gambling disorder who also have alcohol use disorder because our state has some of the highest rates of alcohol use disorder in the country. Now, I didn't know this before I moved here, um, but guess what? I moved from the state with the most casinos in the country to the state with the second highest number of casinos in the country. 
Now, most people who don't know too much about gambling actually have zero sympathy for the individuals I'm talking about, individuals with gambling disorder. Um, and whenever I'm asked to give a talk about the way that non-criminal law treats individuals with gambling disorder, um, I usually am either laughed out of the room or greeted with hostility, even just by discussing these individuals as a group of people. Sometimes I'm told they don't have the willpower to quit. Um, frequently, I'm told that gambling is immoral. Um, these individuals voluntarily started gambling, so they can obviously voluntarily stop gambling. Um, and these individuals are blown completely off, and no one seems worried about their plight or the plight of their children who are frequently uh, neglected, as well as the plight of their family members. But for those of us who have lived in places like Las Vegas, Nevada, or Saratoga, New York, which is where I was born, right outside the Saratoga racetrack, where I saw individuals who are addicted to um, betting on horses, um, or the shore in New Jersey, which is where I went to high school, or as I mentioned, Biloxi, Mississippi, or New Orleans, Louisiana, which is where I went to college, um, we see this a little bit differently. And especially for those of us who are passionate about both healthcare and health law and policy, um, I've had teachers and colleagues and neighbors and friends who have become addicted to gambling. Um, they not only lose their jobs, but their homes because they can't pay their mortgages. Many of them or most of them lose custody of their children, et cetera. So what do we know about gambling disorder? Um, the American Psychiatric Association tells us that this disorder aggregates in families and that this effect appears to be both based on both uh, genetic and environmental factors. We also know that rates of gambling disorder are higher within African American and especially here in Oklahoma Native American communities compared to non minority communities. We also know that individuals with gambling disorder have poor um, overall general health and utilize medical services at higher rates than other individuals. And we also know that gambling disorder kind of aggregates with depressive and bipolar disorders, as well as other substance use disorders, especially alcohol use disorder and especially here in Oklahoma, where we have such high rates of alcohol use disorder among Native Americans. We also know that individuals with gambling disorder have some of the highest rates of suicidal ideation and the highest rates of suicide attempt among individuals with any type of addiction, including individuals with alcohol use disorder and drug use disorder. More than one in two disorder gamblers um, have suicidal ideation and approximately one in five either complete or attempt suicide. At UNLV, I cannot tell you how many cross university tenured, chaired, professor shipped um, faculty colleagues I had who died by suicide, as well as not only um, cross university students like undergraduate students, but also law students as well. As a person who does health law and policy to me, just because of where I've worked, I think I feel like gambling disorder is like any other serious condition. And it's funny that we mentioned cancer early, earlier, because that's kind of how I think about it, meaning left untreated, it can kill or really seriously endanger the health, safety or welfare, not only the person who has it, but unlike cancer, or you might say like cancer, depending on whether it's genetic, uh, the children as well. Okay, now I mentioned, and now I'm going to talk about the neuroscience, but I mentioned that probably just because of the places where I've worked, like Las Vegas, Nevada, or the places where I've lived, like New Orleans, Louisiana, or um, at the Jersey Shore in uh, New Jersey, or Saratoga, New York, where I was born, um, and because I'm a lawyer, and because I do health law, again, I'm frequently asked to give talks to community members, and sometimes um, members of communities who uh, do not know much about gambling and who are not gamblers about the way that the law, meaning non-criminal law, treats these individuals. And in these talks, I just describe how the law treats these individuals. Um, so for example, many of you know that when President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law back in March of 2010, um, so obviously over 10 years ago now, about 10 and a half years ago now, he required states to designate something called these benchmark health plans. And these benchmark health plans were to serve as benchmark plans or reference plans for health plans that had to comply with President Obama's essential health benefits or EHB provisions, including their mandatory mental health and substance use disorder benefits. But if you go through these benchmark plans one by one, um, you can see that most of them or many of them specifically um, exclude and target gambling disorder from coverage. So you can see that here in the Iowa benchmark plan, you can see it here in the Nebraska benchmark plan, and you can see it here in South Dakota's benchmark plan as well. Now, this is notwithstanding the fact that many of the individuals who have gambling disorder that I know desperately want treatment to help them stop gambling. And this is notwithstanding the ready availability of effective treatment centers all over the United States, including in upstate New York, including in Biloxi, including in New Orleans, um, even here in Oklahoma City, um, close to where I work. 
And this is also notwithstanding the evidence which shows that gambling disorder by itself is actually more treatable and actually has higher sustained rates of recovery compared to substance use disorders, including alcohol and drug use disorder, which are covered under those same exact benchmark health plans. Now, in these talks I give to, um, I would say, legal, uh, public, and other kind of community members um, and audiences, I also talk about how the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, as well as many state um, disability non-discrimination laws, exclude from the definition of disability individuals who have gambling disorder. So say, for example, you're an individual who's lucky enough to have alcohol use disorder. Well, you, or a record, I should say, of alcohol use disorder, you are an individual who has a disability under federal and usually state disability law, and you have the right to request an accommodation if it's reasonable, such as going to an Alcoholics Anonymous or AA meeting at lunch. But if you're an individual who has a record of gambling, you are not an individual with a disability, and therefore um, you do not have any rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And therefore, if you request the same accommodation, for example, the, um, to take a leave during lunch to go to a GA meeting, which help may, uh, may help you kind of keep your distance from gambling, um, you don't have that right. In these talks, I also show how many state rules of professional conduct and state Supreme Court rules have special guidelines for attorneys to follow if they're trying to gain licensure reinstatement following loss of their license due to conduct that was fueled by alcohol or drugs. Um, but in a lot of the places that I've lived, many lawyers who suffer from addiction, they're not addicted to alcohol or drugs, they're actually addicted to gambling. And so many times they will lose their license um, due to behavior kind of fueled by gambling, and then they will get into recovery and they'll want to petition the Supreme Court to get their law license back. And since I used to defend doctors, I will see this among physicians and other healthcare professionals like nurses as well. They'll petition to get their license to practice medicine or nursing back. But the problem is that state medical practice acts, state nursing practice acts, and as you can see here, um, state Supreme Court rules that apply to lawyers, they provide special processes to help individuals with alcohol and drug use disorder, um, but they don't uh, provide kind of special processes or procedures to follow for individuals with gambling disorder. Now, as I mentioned before, I am not a criminal law person. I am a civil and regulatory health law person, which means most of the work I do involves access to health care um, and access to accommodations that will peop help people improve their health care. Okay, so when I have argued in the past that individuals with gambling disorder maybe should be treated like individuals with alcohol use disorder or drug use disorder under these non-criminal areas of the law, including regulatory and civil areas of health law. Meaning if I try to argue that individuals with gambling disorder should have insurance coverage of treatment services for a gambling disorder, if I try to argue that individuals with gambling disorder um, should be able to attend a GA meeting, a Gamblers Anonymous meeting at lunch, just like their colleagues who want to attend an AA meeting at lunch, and if I try to suggest that attorneys or doctors or nurses or other healthcare professionals who have a license to practice their profession should um, be given a shot at regaining their lost professional law license, just like attorneys who are in recovery or doctors or nurses who are in recovery from alcohol or drug use disorder, um, I can tell you that 99% of the time I'm actually greeted with hostility and skepticism. And many times I've actually been laughed or waved off and I'm a little bit older now, but when I started writing in the area of neuro law and neuroethics, that was about 17 years ago in 2003 when I started graduate school. And I was actually somewhat young back then. And my senior colleagues actually just said, you know, don't write or talk in this area because you don't look or sound serious. Um, you know, you don't want people to think, uh, you know, your, your scholarship is not serious. Um, but if I'm not laughed off, sometimes there'll be a kind person in the audience who will just say something like, well, can you tell me why we should help these people? Why do you think they're deserving of health insurance coverage? Why do you think they're deserving of some type of disability accommodation? Why do you think if they've been in recovery for a decade or plus, they might be able to get their doctor, their, their license to practice medicine or nursing or law back? And now coming to the focus of this panel, as well as the focus of the symposium, you know, I've tried a lot of things and I'm gonna talk about the things that have worked a second, but I have tried using neuroscience here. Um, in the past, I have tried to show how top neuroscientists who write in the areas or who um, study gambling disorder um, have shown in studies um, that the neural correlates of gambling um, addiction are similar to the neural correlates of craving that they see like in cocaine use disorder and other substance use disorders. 
Um, I have tried referencing neuroscientists to talk about how with gambling disorder, there's an alteration in brain chemistry, that gambling disorder is characterized by tolerance and withdrawal, as well as a loss of control, just like alcohol and substance use disorder. And I've actually tried quoting um, neuroscientists who conclude their um, medical journal articles with things like this. Given the association with poor quality of life and suicide, I think, or this, this, this series of authors is saying, you know, we think improved identification, prevention, policy, and treatment efforts are needed to help individuals with gambling disorder. But I will tell you that making neuroscience-based law arguments has not gotten me far at all when talking about individuals with gambling disorder for some reason. Um, I think in part, this is because I'm a lawyer and I have a PhD in medical humanities, which is a soft area. Um, it is not hard science. I am definitely not a neuroscientist like our prior speakers. Um, I'm So I'm usually told that I'm medicalizing bad behavior. I'm inappropriately relying on the DSM. I'm inappropriately relying on neuroscience which is actually quite interesting because for those of you who know my work in neuroscience and the law or neuro law and in neuroethics and the law, most of it was about 12 to 13 years ago, like the articles that you see here. And it was very cautious. And it's funny as I read it now, you know, a decade and a half later, I'm like, whoa, I was pretty uptight. I mean, it was cautious, right? And so it's interesting that now I'm being accused of um, medicalizing bad behavior or inappropriately relying on neuroscience to argue that patients with gambling disorder, if they want it, not should get out of criminal trouble, but should be able to access healthcare and accommodations like meetings that they want to attend. Um, so again, normally when I present talks like this, I'm actually somewhat laughed out of the room or heavily criticized. Um, but it's funny because after losing so many dozens, if you can believe this, dozens of faculty colleagues, I mean, people who have PhDs in very you know, difficult areas, um, after losing so many students at UNLV and seeing so many students here at OU who struggle with gambling disorder, I actually don't even care about being laughed out of the room anymore. I feel that there must be something about me that would put me on this path to talk about this. Again, because I was born in Saratoga, New York, outside a racetrack. I went to high school in New Jersey, near the Jersey Shore. Then for some reason, I went to college in New Orleans, where we got riverboat gambling at the same time. And then I spent a decade at UNLV, and now I jog to a casino every single day, um, just because it's where my running path take, has taken me. But if neuroscience hasn't helped me in terms of advocacy or treatment or care efforts for individuals with gambling disorder, um, has anything else, else helped me? And why is this helping me as opposed to neuroscience? And the answer is that yes, there are two other things other than neuroscience that have helped me in my kind of treatment and care and respect advocacy work that I've done. Um, and the first um, relates to a book that two of my health law friends wrote. And this book is called Health, uh, Healthism or Health Status Discrimination in the Law. But one of my good friends is Jessica Roberts. She's a health law professor at the University of Houston Law Center, and she has a background very much like mine. And then the other author is, Eliz author is Elizabeth Weeks, and she's, again, a health law professor at the University of Georgia School of Law. And again, she has a legal but not neuroscience background like mine. Um, and, and this wonderful book they wrote, um, they um, talk about a rubric, which you can see right here, that helps readers to determine whether particular laws or policies, like the health insurance policies I showed you earlier, um, like the Americans with Disabilities Act, like those state Supreme Court rules, um, like those state rules of professional conduct, whether they are engaging in what we call socially desirable health status differentiation, or whether they are engaging in socially um, undesirable um, healthism, which is really health status discrimination. Okay, and I've actually quoted successfully, meaning people kind of have bought my argument. Um, I've quoted successfully Jessica and Elizabeth for their recognition that law and policy sometimes can be animated by underlying um, stigma. Elizabeth and Jessica note, for example, that um, the Affordable Care Act, which many of us are familiar with, you know, singles out tobacco users and allows insurance companies to charge them higher rates. Um, and they think that there's no real reason for doing that other than pure animus, especially when a lot of smokers would really love to quit smoking, but they can't. So along those same lines, I have kind of said to my audiences, well, look, the Americans with Disabilities Act is singling out individuals with gambling disorder. These state benchmark plans are singling out individuals with gambling disorder. These state rules of professional conduct are not covering individuals with gambling disorder, but they are covering individuals with alcohol and drug use disorder. And some people have bought um, those arguments. 
I've also quoted Elizabeth and Jessica for their recognition and their explanation of the principle of health equality and their point that singling out specific individuals, and they talk a lot about individuals who smoke or overeat and therefore are overweight, but in my case, I would use gambling, but that singling out and excluding specific individuals in law and policies that provide protections or help ignores the inherent value of all people, including people who desperately want to improve their health. So I have actually somewhat successfully, meaning not gotten laughed out of the room, used Elizabeth and Jessica's rubric to argue, first, that health insurance coverage of gambling disorder treatments and services and GA meeting accommodations would promote and support healthy decision-making and access to healthcare, which could actually lower healthcare costs in the long run. And second, that singling out gambling, um, individuals with disorder gambling is stigmatizing and punishing and could actually increase health care disparities in populations and communities in which gambling disorder is prevalent, prevalent, especially in minority communities, for example, our Native American communities here in Oklahoma. Now that has helped a bit. And then the last thing I just wanted to say is that the second non-neuroscience thing that I think has helped more than anything, and it's funny that this can help more than neuroscience in this area, um, but the, the second and last kind of non-neuroscience thing that has really helped me respond to hostile audiences um, is, or are, I should say, narratives and stories from individuals with gambling disorder. You know, when I stand up there in my little Navy sweater as a lawyer, um, but not as a neuroscience and try to make some neuroscientist, uh, neuroscience based argument or point to something that Dr. Mark Potenza at Yale has said, you know, no one just wants to hear it. But if I'm preceded in my talk by an individual, especially someone who has high status, like a professor of law, or in this case, a lawyer, or on the next case, on the next slide, I'm going to show you an archaeologist. But if I'm preceded, in my discussion by a high kind of occupational status individual who is in recovery from gambling. And if they explain that, you know, despite all their education and despite their successful careers, how much they struggled with gambling, how badly they wanted to stop gambling, how many times they attempted and almost nearly um, successfully um, died by suicide, um, how they eventually uh, got into recovery in part because of state laws that diverted them out of criminal um, uh, treatment and into healthcare or uh, real treatment, I would say, um, and how they have regained their law licenses, they're giving back to their communities, and they're thriving once again. Um, that has helped actually more than any neuroscience-based argument or a neuroscience-based reference or picture of a brain scan or a reference to Dr. Mark Batenza at Yale um, that I could do. This gentleman right here is Doug Crawford. He's a lawyer in Las Vegas. And you know, over a decade ago, he really struggled with gambling. And as a result of it, did um, several things that violated the Nevada State Rules of Professional Conduct. So he lost his law license. Um, and he was diverted out of criminal processing and put in a um, not what most of you probably have heard of like drug and alcohol treatment courts. In Las Vegas, we have a gambling court. He was put into that. Um, he got treatment. Uh, he recovered. He has been abstinent for gambling, I want to say for like 13 years. And he donates now all of the money, um, a lot of the money that he makes from practicing law, from his very successful law practice, um, back to help other gamblers who are struggling with gambling disorder. And when he talks, I've noticed that people really listen. So maybe putting a brain, a brain scan or an image of a scan or a reference to a neuroscientist for some reason doesn't help. But when you put a lawyer in front of them, I should say an individual who's recovered from gambling disorder, who also happens to have a high status kind of profession, um, that has helped. Here is another former colleague of mine. Um, he is an archaeologist and a researcher with something called the Desert Research Institute, which is affiliated with UNLV in Las Vegas. And again, I would call him a high status individual in Las Vegas just because he's um, trained as an archaeologist and he works with the Desert Research Institute and he's referred to as a researcher. But the same thing, um, he um, is very generous with sharing how much he struggled with gambling disorder, how no matter how hard he tried, he could not stop despite racking up debt and despite um, losing or getting so close to losing custody of his two-year-old daughter. And he so generously shares his story of recovery. And if you look at the last um, little bit of, this is just a social media post, he posts quite frequently and he also speaks quite frequently as part of his recovery. But he's saying gambling disorder is a real, not fake, devastating and potentially fatal illness. You know, please treat it seriously. Um, please consider us and, you know, don't blow us off. 
So I just kind of wanted to conclude here by saying, you know, I've been writing and thinking about neuroscience based issues for about 17 years, meaning about since 2003 when I entered graduate school and focused almost exclusively on neuro law and neuroethics issues. My dissertation was in the area of functional neuroimaging in the law, but especially privacy. And I have seen in that time so many ways in which neuroscience has really helped law and policy discussions and also places where it seems like the public, the media and others are just simply not ready for it or maybe just don't want it. And I think gambling disorder is one of those areas where people are, for whatever reason, just not ready for it or don't want it. Um, that said, I have found health law scholarship relating to healthism or what we call health status discrimination to be very helpful. So I'm thankful to my colleagues at Georgia Law, Elizabeth Weeks and Houston Law, Jessica Roberts for that. And I've also found personal narratives and stories shared by individuals in recovery from gambling disorder um, to be helpful as well. So thank you so much. Pastor Tavino, Dr. Tavino, thank you for your your uh, uh, for your wonderful presentation. I'd like to. We only have a few minutes left, I'm afraid. So I'd like to pose a question and observation to each of our our panelists. I'm not sure how much time. Ali, uh, Miss Cole, you may tell me more regarding our yeah. time. We're at time, but I think that we have we can go a tad bit into the break. Five, ten um, minutes. Yes. Let me pose first to uh, Dr. Roski's the following question, uh, and that is, um, you you make the case that the brain is simply too complex for a, a final deterministic uh, solution, if you will, uh, and it's a question of complete knowledge. We lack complete knowledge, and and we cannot gain a complete specification of. of the brain, but you've said the same thing about, well, you haven't said the same thing about the universe, but you say that determinism depends at least on that supposition. And my question is, um, have you simply uh, perhaps asserted too much by saying that we cannot do this with the brain when uh, the determinists uh, do not say that, they, they rather proceed on the basis of a, a hypothetical question. Hypothetically, if we if we um, knew everything there was to know about the universe, we could come to a deterministic explanation. I'll pose that to you, uh, to you Dr. Roskies. I will pose to, uh, to uh, Professor Shin uh, the, the uh, following, and that is, um, uh, and you kind of came to the same conclusion I did by the end of your paper, but that is this. Perhaps we should speak of neuro law as broadly as possible. Perhaps it, if the brain is really our means of accessing the world, of knowing our bodies, uh, uh, of regulating our conduct or not regulating our conduct, perhaps brain science should and maybe eventually will subsume everything uh, we know about the universe within it. Um, and, and again, perhaps it's simply in, in our state of incomplete knowledge. We may not, um, we may simply not know that yet. That said, I have on my next page of notes, humility. The comparisons you draw between uh, lobotomies in our present state of knowledge should tell us every, uh, as, as a kind of uh, guiding uh, principle of investigation, we should be humble. Every time we try to apply science to law, simply because we uh, we're always proceeding in a state of incompleteness. And then to uh, Professor Tovino, a couple of observations. The first, um, I'm reminded uh, in your presentation of Stephen Paddock, the uh, Las Vegas mass murderer, uh, who killed sixty some people using a kind of um, jerry rigged machine gun from his hotel. He was a professional gambler. That was a spectacular act, a uh, spectacular in all the wrong ways, of course, a uh, form of mass murder uh, slash suicide. Um, uh, so gambling, and, and he was a professional gambler. Uh, might this have been a manifestation of, um, of gambling disorder? But then also let me pose this question to you, and that is, um, You've alluded to it at a number of points in your presentation, and that is the relationship of social status. The social status 
has, has a profound impact in how we view gambling, just as we, it has a profound impact in how we view cigarette smoke. And that is something that the other does, the working class. And uh, we are, we like to think of ourselves, uh, I think this is a very flawed way of viewing the world, but we like to think of ourselves as a meritocracy and they're just the social failures. Uh, and I mean that, I do not mean to endorse that perspective, not at all, but I pose that question to you as whether that is perhaps behind a lot of what we see in the discrimination against uh, uh, gambling disorder. So uh, perhaps we have a couple minutes, Professor Roskies. Yeah, so th thanks for your question. Uh, you're right that the philosophers who are hard determinists couch their claims in a hypothetical if the universe is deterministic then, right? But then they go ahead and they look at the brain sciences for evidence that the universe or the brain is deterministic. Um, and my talk aimed to say, you're not, find, you're not gonna find evidence there. Um, I do think that there is something science can say about it, and I think that something comes from physics, not from neuroscience. You're not going to you're not going to make headway on the determinism problem by looking at the brain, but you might, you know, make headway by coming up with the final physics theory. Um, and currently, there are two different interpretations of our best physics. One is deterministic, and one is not. So, um, so. I, I don't know whether that's uh, you know sufficient answer to the question. Um, I, I do think that you know we can argue about these philosophical positions, uh, hard determinism, compatibilism, mm -hmm. et cetera, uh, and and convince each other perhaps on philosophical grounds, although you know the history of philosophy has not been great for you know everybody coming to consensus but um but you know we can have this philosophical debate but when it's time to cash out that antecedent and say okay is the universe deterministic or not um neuroscience is not going to help us there thank you professor shin yeah well I, I agree that humility is a big part of it and i've um and a lot of the stuff i've written i've tried to push that there's a, a neat line that a neuroscientist says he says if understanding the brain is like running a mile we've come three inches and I, I I think on days that's right though I would say at least we're running the right race and I think there are certain um there are always there are hypotheses but are certain hypotheses right now about the role of the brain that I would find very hard um to imagine ever being disproved but they're really basic and they're not they're the sort of things like hey it's somewhere in this mess of 86 billion neurons and their connections. Integrate it with the rest of the body. This is one of the questions where the integration is happening. It's not happening in the big toe. It's not happening in the liver. It's not happening just in the, though those things matter too. And the other um, two things I would just say, I think that derive from humility is to say, if this is a tremendously big project and we're only gonna start to get at little bits of it, then we're a question of prioritization. Which disorders and diseases get looked at first which get ignored altogether, which groups, which groups brains get focused on initially and not what drive those things. And the last thing I would say is that the interventions to say that, you know, I take a really brain-based perspective. It doesn't mean that the number one intervention should be drugs. It doesn't mean the number one intervention should be, you know, electrical stimulation. Those might have a role. I mean, we're human, we're the most social animals on the planet. And so these social interventions matter so much the proof for that is that everyone on this panel, you know, what's the first thing when you do when you have a bad day? You find someone to talk to. And what do those drive loneliness? You don't have someone to talk to. I mean, what a wild creature we are that that's how we solve our problems is just talking and listening. I mean, it's, it's, it's wild. So um, I agree. There's a lot of humility involved. And for another day, since we're at St. Thomas, I have a, a, a presentation on the sacred brain. I think there's a lot to do with religion too, but that's for another day. Thanks for having well, us. Well, thank you so much for being here. And Dr. Tovino. Yeah, so you asked me two very good questions. And the first, I don't know the answer to, so I'm not a, psychi a psychiatrist. Um, and so I don't know about the violent impulses or um, other uh, kind of violent behaviors that might be associated with gambling disorder. So I'll pass on that question. But the second question you asked, um, I do feel qualified to speak to, which is, 
it is funny um, in healthcare when you're trying to make an argument that someone is deserving or worthy of treatment, it's like your audience wants something to grab onto. And whether that is some level of education, um, some indication from their perspective that this individual, if given help, will get better, et cetera. And so it is very unfortunate that when we have used people in recovery from alcohol, from drugs, from gambling, from sex addiction, from food addiction, et cetera, um, to put on a panel to try to make a, the point I can see audiences respond positively when it's a lawyer, a doctor, a nurse, someone who has special or maybe professional training. Um, but if we put an individual on the panel who might be homeless um, or something like that, you just see the audience not respect them. And it, it really breaks my heart. Um, so there must be some tie um, that I can't... Uh, put my finger on because I don't have training in this area. Again, I'm just a lawyer and a medical humanist between like respecting individuals and their status or something like that. But it is so very uh, heartbreaking to me because it is the individuals with the low status. You know, my parents were, for example, uneducated um, and people who are homeless that they need the most help. And it seems like they're the least respected. Probably, I, so my area is not disability law and I don't write too much in stigma, but there are other people who kind of are like me, like Jessica Roberts writes more about stigma. She could probably answer your question, but it's a good one. And I wish I knew more so I could deep, dig deeper there. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks to everybody. And let's again, uh, give a, a round of applause. Virtual thank you so much for participating. Yeah, thank you all for being thank here. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So now we are going to head into our lunch break. Um, although we were supposed to have a half an hour break, I think we are still on track to start back up at 1230 so we can gain back some time that we lost a little bit due to those wonderful and very thorough presentations. Um, so we will see you all back here at 1230. Thank you so much. Um, it is about 1229, and although I'm sure we could go on forever about the woes of <laughs> the virtual world that COVID-19 has led us to, I think that our attendees, and I know Dr. Reed as well, is also quite excited to hear your remarks today, Professor Spolsky. Yeah, so uh, with uh, that said, well, Dr. Reed, take it a away. Few introductory remarks, Allie. Uh, Dr. Sapolsky, I've long been an admirer of your work. And uh, your book, be uh, Dr. Sapolsky? Yes. Oh, there you are. You've moved on uh, my screen. <laughs> Zoom okay. and all this, that. This uh, so um, uh, your book, Behave, is, is, is a landmark book. But I want to call attention to a couple of your articles that um, I only recently had the chance to read. That The first is the frontal cortex in the criminal justice system, which is just... Uh, filled with extraordinary insights on the criminal justice system, extraordinary insights on, uh, on, on the human brain. Um, you make important points there, McNaughton, the McNaughton test, of course, uh, it has, is retrograde, and, and you make that point clearly. And uh, you also uh, just, you, you, you have oblique criticisms of legal reasoning thrown in that I find very helpful, that we should think about continuum, not categories. Lawyers are all about creating categories. Uh, we should think about multiple converging causes, not single elements of causation. I mean, you make just extraordinary points there that speak uh, uh, should speak to, to every lawyer uh, and law student in attendance. And your um, article, This is Your Brain on Nationalism. It, again, that's just an extraordinary article. Um, and uh, you begin with the premise that chimpanzees are, are territorial, uh, separate into groups, the other versus the in-group. And you draw some, uh, some uh, important comparisons to the way humans organize themselves and the way nationalism returns us to, dare I say, a kind of a primitive state of being that we, we should try to avoid. Uh, Doing a bad job at avoiding it. We truly are. Uh, 
um, with Dr. Sapolsky. Thank you so much for being here and, and I'll, I'll let you take the floor, please. Okay, well, thank you for having me here, Charles and Ali, and I greatly appreciate it. Um, although it's not clear what being here means anymore in our virtual world. Um, but all of you today have gotten to hear some wonderfully subtle, nuanced explorations of the intersection between law and neuroscience. Um, so my intent in this talk is to do anything but that and to be incredibly unsubtle and unnuanced and to, I think, perhaps represent a lunatic fringe in terms of the views of where the two fields intersect. And I think maybe the best way of summarizing it is um, that this will be a version of a talk I gave a couple of years ago um, at the Stanford Law School to first year students in their first week of law school. And the talk was entitled, Why You Should Quit Law School Immediately. And as far as I can tell, it had no impact whatsoever, probably just as well. But it is all from a standpoint that uh, to jump to the punchline. Um, I am a very, very hard incompatibilist. I believe there's no free will whatsoever, and it is going to have to utterly transform how we think about every aspect of our society, from how we judge harshly to how we praise and everything in between. So I'd like to start off with a landmark law decision, one that sort of informs a lot of what I'll be talking about. And this is back from 1457. This was a law case where a 10 year old boy in rural France was walking down the road and was attacked by a pig and her piglets. Um, and the pig proceeded to kill him. And the pig and her piglets proceeded to consume him. And the wheels of justice turning, the pig and piglets were brought to trial as was often the case at that time with animal trials and for murder. And the judge produced a Solomaic decision, which was the pig, of course, was completely guilty of murder and was hung, but the piglets were acquitted because the judge ruled they were too young to know better at that point. And many of you will recognize that, oh, some centuries later, Robert B. Simmons was built on that exact same logic. And then somewhere in the aftermath, people figured out, oh, that's not how behavior works. That's not how the behavior of animal work. They had no control over their carnivory. We jump a few centuries later when there was apparently, by most estimates, a shift in the axial orbit of Earth and that introduced roughly around 1650 what came to be known as the Little Ice Age. And it was another century and a half or so of a horrible downturn in weather throughout Europe. Crops failed, famines, hailstorms that destroyed crops in the middle of the summer, that sort of thing. And the savants and wise learned voices at the time had a very clear explanation for what had caused the Little Ice Age, which was obviously witches witches who were causing the hailstorms, and this led to no shortage of witches being burned at the stake. And then at some later point, people figured out, oh, hailstorms are not caused by demonically hanging out with Satan. That's not how the human potential for behavior works, and things changed. Then, in the aftermath of that, within a few centuries, there came to be some very, very clear legalistic attitudes about something that was commonplace then and commonplace thousands of years ago and well described in the Bible, which is someone having an epileptic seizure. They writhe, they convulse, they fall down, they have all of the symptoms that we recognize, which are exquisitely accurately clinically described in the Bible and historical texts and the incident described in Mark, where Jesus cured a boy of his epilepsy, a boy who had fallen down writhing, the falling disease, as it is known historically. And Jesus did the proper clinical intervention, which was to drive the satanic being infecting the boy out of him. 
And in the centuries after that, people were not quite as effective at being able to drive out the demons causing epilepsy. And there was moreover, more importantly, a shift in attitude of viewing the demonic possession of epilepsy, not as being a case of the sufferer of these seizures as being a victim of Satan, but rather being a collaborator with Satan. And this was most influentially stated in a book coming out during that time, 1487, a pair of monks, Kramer and Springer, who vote, wrote the textbook, the handbook of how to recognize demonic possession in people, how to recognize Satan's hammer, the Malleus Maleficarum. And this was one of the most influential books of the early centuries of publishing with printing presses and went through endless editions and explained all the ways for recognizing witches, all the ways for recognizing those who have taken sort of league with Satan and what to do about them. And firmly established among them was the view that part of satanic evidence is having an epileptic seizure. And the book had a very, very clear neurological clinical intervention recommended, which is to burn them at the stake. And the best estimates are that thousands of people, thousands of epileptics, almost certainly tens of thousands were burned at the stake as a result. And we see a woodcut here showing, fortunately, the demons being driven out of some of these epileptic witches there and justice being served. And then at some point, people learn somewhere around the 19th century, oh, it's not demonic possession. It's a disease. It's a neurological disease. And what we have learned since is that epilepsy isn't deciding to like sleep with BLs above. It's usually from having screwed up potassium channels in your temporal lobe. So we made progress there. And we even made progress of this sort in the last century. Looking at this, we have a whole world of puzzles built around one of the most devastating of psychiatric disorders, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, a tragic destruction of those who suffer from it, from the family members who were touched by it. Schizophrenia having a horrendous disease. And starting around the 1930s or so, there was a very clear explanation for the roots of schizophrenia. And this was something that dominated for decades. This was something that every highly credentialed psychiatrist was a believer in. This was something brought over by a psychodynamic view of mental illness in the 1930s when some of the leading lights of it fled Hitler and came to the United States. And what you would have is the following scenario. A child, a teenager, has been showing increasingly abnormal behavior, disordered thought, inappropriate affect. This child, this teenager, has begun to report that they are hearing voices that is getting to a catastrophic extent. And finally, the parents, the mother brings this teenager to a psychiatrist. They were fortunate enough to go to the most skilled, most credentialed, most prestigious psychiatrist around. And the psychiatrist confirms exactly the nightmare fear, fear that that mother has been having, which is, yes, this is this disease called schizophrenia that most of you have not heard of, would be the 1930 statement. This horrendous nightmare of a disease, and it is terrible, and we can't do anything to cure it, and this is what your loved one is stuck with. And at that point, the mother would invariably say something like, where did this disease come from? Where did this nightmare of a disorder come from? And the best of psychiatry, the best of medicine, the best of modern thought at that time had a very clear answer. Where did your child's schizophrenia come from? It came from you, you the mother. Because of your mothering style, you caused the schizophrenia in your child. 
And it even had an official term. It was called schizophrenogenic mothering, a mothering style that generated schizophrenia. Um, a few decades later, things became so much more humane. Insights showed that it was not just the mothers who could cause schizophrenia and their kids, the fathers could cause it too. Wow, progressive progress of all sorts there. And this came to be formalized in the view of the double bind high hypothesis of schizophrenia, parents still mostly mothers 95% of the time, but parents induced schizophrenia in their children by giving them highly emotionally charged conflicting situations. This is the mother who says, why don't you ever tell me you love me? Why don't you ever tell me you love me? I love you. What is that supposed to mean to me when you're just being forced to say this, where you're damned if you do or you don't, and out of this supposed terrible emotional double bind comes the disordered thought of schizophrenia. And that is what generations of parents of schizophrenics were taught. You generated this disease in your child by your terrible emotionally abnormal parenting. And parallel with that, those parents bringing their children to psychiatrists, neurologists, and being given the diagnosis of the then very new category of autism. Your child has autism. Where did this come from? Where did this disease come from? And it was caused by you. You, the mother, the term for the time came to be you and your refrigerator mothering the fact that you were incapable of expressing love and your child sensed this, or at the Freudian extreme, that autism was caused by the refrigerator mothering, caused by an unconscious Freudian hatred of your child. And that is what every best clinician taught their patients, parents at the time. Where did this disease come from? You caused it. You caused it by your heartless, incompetent, abnormal pathological parenting, and this is the cause of the disease. And then we learned something. In the 1950s, people first discovered what are now known as neuroleptics, antipsychotic drugs that help to cure, help to control the symptoms of schizophrenia, and they've got nothing to do with changing the mothering styles of the parent. They have something to do with blocking receptors for a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And it was by the 1980s that the first neuroimaging of schizophrenia occurred, and people noted for the first time, my God, there's structural abnormalities in the brain and everyone in the field gasped at that point collectively and said, it's a biological disorder. It is a neurochemical disorder, it is a neuroanatomical disorder, it is a disorder of abnormal function in the brain, it is a neurogenetic disorder, as we have since learned. And what you see then was an entire field of clinicians who had to say, my God, what have we done wrong? Because we learned it actually works differently. And an extraordinary episode happened in sort of the annals of autism research. Leo Kanner, one of the psychoanalyst pioneers who fled Europe and came to the United States and is the person who first formalized autism as a clinical disorder and is the person who invented the soundbite of refrigerator mothering. In his old age, Leo Kanner came to a parent support group, parents of autistic individuals, and he said, I apologize for the enormous damage that I did to all of you. We were so wrong. Look at the harm we did by not understanding this is a biological disorder. Now, what you begin to see as you push on with this is all of these lessons apply in current times as well. And now we have the realm of parents wondering why their children have not been learning to read effectively. Teachers, school counselors and such. And what we had was centuries up to very recent times of easy attributions of 
laziness, of lack of motivation, of that is why your child is not learning well. And in the past few decades, what we've learned instead is this disorder that we now call dyslexia involves structural abnormalities and the abnormalities in the cortex. Your cortex is wired up in a jumbled way. And as a result, letters are reversed or your eyes make uncontrolled saccadic movements. So you have trouble focusing on reading and oh, it's not their fault. There's something screwy with their brain wiring and the notion of what we now call dyslexia being attributed to laziness and lack of motivation began to seem as out of date and as brutal as deciding that epilepsy is caused by you deciding to consort with Satan. So what we've been seeing now are centuries worth of aha moments of people being forced to say, I had no idea biology had anything to do with this. And where this becomes most relevant in the world of sort of legal judgment of behavior and criminal law and such is the domain which in effect describes 99% of criminal acts, which is at some juncture, somebody had the choice to make between doing the right thing and doing the wrong thing, and they chose the wrong thing, and they made the wrong decision. Whether this was a decision carried out over the course of years worth of white collar crime and embezzlement, or whether this was the wrong decision carried out in a fraction of a second as to whether to pull a trigger, what this is all about is at some juncture, somebody had a choice between making the right decision and the wrong one, and they made the wrong one. And what we are learning is so much of this has to do with another realm of biology, another realm of, oh, I had no idea biology had something to do with this, having to do with a part of the brain called the frontal cortex. Frontal cortex is wonderful. And in retrospect, I realize I've spent about 40 years of my life and wasted it studying the wrong part of the brain, something called the hippocampus, which turns out to be boring. I should have been studying the frontal cortex all along. My neuroscientific life has been misspent. The frontal cortex is the coolest part of the brain. We have more of it than any other species. It is the most recently evolved part of our brain. It is the last part of our brain to fully mature, not until we are about 25 years old. What does the frontal cortex do? If you want to summarize a billion studies and a zillion careers worth of research, what the frontal cortex does is it makes you do the harder thing when that's the right thing to do. Impulse control, long-term planning, gratification post moment, emotional regulation. If you were sitting there and you were being tempted to do something, tempted to give into it, but you were managing to resist that temptation, it is because you have a frontal cortex that is functioning very, very effectively in that circumstance. So what we begin to consider is that juncture, the fact that Doing the right thing when it is a harder thing to do can take a whole lot of different forms. The cognitive realm of your frontal cortex working well is very rapidly trying to say the months of the year backwards when that's your task, because the much easier thing is to slide into what is more habitual. What takes frontal function in all sorts of settings here are highly varied and highly significant. Consider as follows. You were sitting there, you were being tempted to lie for some sort of personal gain, and you were trying to resist that. And what is shown in endless studies, neuroimaging studies, and so on, cutting edge neurosciences, your frontal cortex is working very hard at that point to keep you from giving into that temptation. But suppose at that point, you decide what the hell I am going to give in and indulge in this temptation. And that point, you need your frontal cortex to do a good job at getting away with the lie, at keeping track consciously of making the right amount of eye contact, 
of making sure your voice doesn't crack in your nervousness, of keeping track of what the lie was so you don't contradict yourself at a later point. In other words, we have a part of the brain here that is centrally involved in both resisting temptation and then wallowing in it efficaciously when you decide to give into it. By definition, then, we have a very complex part of the brain. And we have a brain that is absolutely essential to that moment where in a fraction of a second, you have to decide whether to pull that trigger. Whether that is in the context where pulling that trigger constitutes an, app an appalling damaging act, or in a different setting, you do the exact same thing with the muscles in your index finger and the same thing with your motor neurons up in your cortex, and you pull a trigger and in doing so, you have magnificently suicidally drawn fire to yourself so that some innocent people might live Pulling that trigger can be one of our worst moments, can be one of our best moments, can be ambiguously in between. And all of it comes down to that instant where we choose whether or not to pull that trigger. And what I want to review here now are all of the things that determined what you did in that half second, which make the concept of choice nonsensical. So you pull that trigger and we can identify the frontal cortical neurons that sent a signal to the premotor cortex and the supplementary motor cortex and the motor neurons that sent a signal with action potentials down to your finger and you pull that trigger. And we ask a question that we ask is every human out there making sense of our behavior. And that is often asked as a juror, why did that behavior occur? Why did he pull that trigger? And it turns out, the answer to it is immensely complicated because it is a function of everything from what occurred one second before to a million years before. What went on in the second before? And by now a huge literature has shown what sort of sensory stimuli, what sort of acute circumstances make you more likely to pull that trigger when that constitutes the wrong decision. One example, one example amid this fantastically interesting literature, you have a part of the brain called the insular cortex. Now, in most mammals out there, the insular cortex, it's very clear what it does. You take some lab rat and they bite into some piece of food that's disgusting and rotten and moldy, and within about a tenth of a second, the insular cortex is going to activate and it will trigger all sorts of reflexes. The rat spits out the food. If it's severe enough, its stomach lurches, it throws up. What does the insular cortex do in most mammals out there? It protects you from eating toxic food. It detects gustatorily disgusting things. And it does the same thing in humans. You take some poor Psych 101 volunteer and you stick them in a brain scanner and you give them some disgusting rotten food to bite into. And yes, about 80 milliseconds later, their insulin is going to activate and they're going to gag and spit it out. And that's great. But we're humans. We can do something fancier than that. Now take this person to the brain scanner. Don't give them something disgusting to eat. Just make them think about eating something disgusting. Think about like eating some grasshopper that's writhing and its little legs are pushing against your lips as you're trying to get it to end. The odds are you are going to activate your insular cortex at that point. Aha, in humans, it's not just about gustatory disgust, it's about imagining gustatory disgust. But now take things one step further, put that person in the scanner and don't give them something rotten to eat and don't make them think about something rotten to eat. Instead, show them a picture, a 1910 photograph of a happy, cheerful crowd around the body of a man who's been lynched hanging from a tree. Show them a picture of the concentration camp ovens. Show them the pictures of ethnic cleansing in the Balkans and anything. And there's a good chance the insular cortex is going to activate at that point. Not because you were feeling gustatory disgust, but because you were fearing moral disgust. And it turns out the neurons in the insular cortex do moral disgust for us the same way they do gustatory disgust. 
And clearly, I don't know, 50,000 years ago or so, when somebody came up with the idea of let's have moral norms, let's have norm violations be so extreme that we could formalize them. And we're now beginning to invent this thing called morality. There is like obviously like a committee meeting at that point of saying, well, we don't have enough time to evolve a new part of the brain. Hey, how about that insular cortex? It's this disgusting food, disgusting behavior. Maybe that's kind of similar. I know here, give me a shoehorn and some duct tape and from ever after your insular cortex is going to do moral disgust as well. And a neuron in the insula cannot tell the difference between disgusting food and contemplating a disgusting moral act. And that's why when something is morally disgusting enough, we feel sick to our stomachs. We feel like puking. Our stomachs clench. We are left with a bad taste in our mouths. And as a demonstration of that, shown in one study coming out of a group at Yale, you have somebody generate a disgusting taste in their mouth. They swallow some cod liver oil and the insular cortex is growing like crazy at that point. And you ask that person to judge somebody's moral act as praiseworthy, blameworthy, whatever. And when you have a bad taste in your mouth, you judge that act more harshly and you recommend a more severe sentence for that person because your brain is having a hard time distinguishing between gustatory disgust and moral disgust. And you recommend a punishment that is more severe than you would recommend at other times. And if asked why you did that, you would not attribute that to the disgusting taste in your mouth and your insular cortex. You would come up with a perfectly rational post hoc rationalization. So why did the person pull that trigger? You also have to ask what was going on in the minutes to days before? And now we're looking at issues of levels of hormones in your bloodstream. And picking a striking example here in terms of stress hormones, if you have been stressed during the previous minutes to hours to days, a part of your brain called the amygdala, which evaluates threat, which is central to fear, and anxiety, your amygdala is going to become more active so that a facial expression that you would otherwise judge as neutral, you now judge as threatening. Even when you are shown it subliminally, you flash up a picture of a tenth of a second of a face that would leave the amygdala in a coma in anybody else, but because you've been marinating your amygdala for the last few hours in high levels of these stress hormones, the amygdala reacts to that face as if it is threatening. The amygdala makes you more likely to decide, I need to defend myself under this circumstance. The amygdala and those stress hormones make you more likely to pull that trigger. And you can show this experimentally where you modify, you manipulate cortisol levels in people and they have to make decisions as to whether or not to pull a trigger at a hypothetical face and a hypothetical video game of threat. And this hormone makes those neurons more likely to decide there is a threat when there is no threat. And thus you are more likely to pull that trigger. And we all know endless examples of this in the criminal justice world and in the world of police officers pulling a trigger before they have processed what they are looking at. And when your stress hormones are elevated as documented, you, you a random subject, or you a trained police officer as shown in the studies, are more likely to decide that cell phone is actually a handgun that that person is holding and you are more likely to pull a trigger, all because of biology over which you have no control. But now, pushing further back, how about weeks to years before, what sort of circumstances make you more likely to have your frontal cortex, your frontal cortex to make the bad decision, the wrong decision, and pull a trigger in a disastrous setting? And the biology of that time period is relevant as well. 
all sorts of things. Neuroinflammation impairs function of the frontal cortex. PTSD causes the amygdala to grow larger in people. A totally bizarre, obscure, obscure subject. There's a parasite called toxoplasma, where if you're infected with it, you become more impulsive in your behavior. Or probably the most consequential one is if you have a concussive head trauma to the front of your head, the most common area, neurological jargon, if you have had a coup counter coup injury to your head and you damage the frontal cortex, you have a brain that is less able now to do the right thing when that is the harder thing to do. And as but one example of that, a substantial percentage of people on death row in this country have a history of concussive head traumas to their frontal cortex. And when that happens, you are not looking at somebody who is choosing to make the wrong decision. You are looking at a brain with some of its inhibitory circuits that have been taken out of the picture. But pushing even further back, how about back to adolescence? How about back to childhood, back to decades before? And it turns out an entire array of things, an entire array of factors influence what kind of frontal cortex you are going to have as an adult making that quarter second decision whether or not to pull a trigger. An array of events in your childhood is gonna result in a frontal cortex that is stronger or weaker or more impulsive or more rigid or whatever is going to result in a frontal cortex that is gonna be making different decisions not because of your choice but because how that frontal cortex was wired by the circumstances of your life early in development. And just as one example of it, and one that is like so outrageous that people should be like rioting at the barricades over this once this is figured out. Suppose you have made a terrible decision in childhood. You have chosen to be born into the wrong family. You picked the wrong room to sit in. You got born into a family with low socioeconomic status. Suppose you were a child being raised in poverty. And what an array of studies have shown by now is by the time you are five years old, by the time you are entering kindergarten, the lower your family's SES, on the average, the higher your circulating cortisol levels, the higher your stress hormone levels, not when you're being stressed, but when you're just sitting there, the higher, the more stressful everyday life is in the absence of overt stress. And what are one of the consequences of those elevated cortisol levels? They impair development of the frontal cortex. And by age five, the socioeconomic status of your parents is a predictor of how thick your frontal cortex will have matured into at that point, how metabolically active it is, and already at age five, how good you are at doing exercises and gratification postponement. And it is a predictor of the trajectory of the frontal cortex you are gonna be having as an adult. And no kid is really choosing which family they were born into. And this exact same theme, as we now ask the question, why did that behavior occur? And we now push further back into childhood and see all the ways in which an array of childhood experiences are going to influence the frontal cortex, the brain, the endocrine system you are going to have as an adult. And this has been formalized in an enormously important field in advances in recent years of understanding of formalizing what sort of adverse childhood experiences have this or that impact on adult behavior, on adult neurobiology. And out of this has come just the landmark ACE score, adverse childhood experiences. And you can get an official ACE score ranging from zero if you are immensely lucky, up to 10 if you are beyond bad luck and trauma in your upbringing. And what we now know in extensive literature is for each additional yes that you check off on an ACE inventory, for each additional point on there, there's an approximately 35% increased likelihood of you as an adult showing antisocial violence, of substance abuse, of being pregnant as a 15 year old, of criminality, all of these steps being built around 
what adversity early in life is doing to the sort of brain and the sort of endocrine hormonal systems that you are wiring up and that you will now be having for the rest of your life. So that seems like that's really getting at the root of some of these effects over which we have no experience, but you gotta push even further back. For example, back to fetal life. Once again, if you have foolishly imprudently chosen the wrong womb in which to develop, if you are exposed to elevated stress hormone levels as a third trimester fetus, where are the stress hormone levels coming from if your mother is stressed by poverty, by abuse, by psychiatric disorder, by famine, et cetera, et cetera. If you are being exposed to elevated stress hormone levels, you cause what is called an epigenetic change in your brain, in your amygdala. And as an adult, your amygdala is on the average going to be bigger than normal and more reactive than normal and more likely to decide that a neutral face is in fact a threatening face all because of those events you had no choices about back during your fetal life, along with all these others. Now, stepping back even further, we know by now there are all sorts of genes that contribute to likelihood of making the wrong decision. As but one example, one that has been very intensely studied, a gene called MAO alpha, monoamine oxidase alpha, do not write it down, it's irrelevant, it's got to do with a neurotransmitter called serotonin, but MAO comes in two different flavors. And what we now know is in animal studies, if you got the bad version of MAO, you are more likely to be aggressive. And how about in humans, if you've got the bad version of MAO, if you were born with that gene over which you had no control, you are more likely to evidence antisocial violence by the time you are a young adult. If, and only if, that genetic vulnerability is coupled with being abused in childhood, a gene environment interaction, no childhood abuse, and it doesn't matter which version you have. So genes are playing a role in it. Not a deterministic role, I emphasize here, because there's a real temptation to get way overly impressed with what genes can do to behavior, but genes as vulnerabilities, potentialities, and genes as predispositions. Okay, so you're now back to being a fertilized egg and when you were nothing more than genes and stuff going on then is pertinent to whether or not you will pull that trigger. Remarkably, you've got to push even further back because it turns out the sort of cultures your ancestors were inventing centuries before have something to do with the likelihood of whether or not you were going to pull that trick. And by now, an entire literature has shown this individualistic versus collectivist cultures, your eyes in milliseconds look in different places in the picture. If your ancestors were herders versus farmers versus hunter-gatherers, you were more likely to have different sorts of religions that you formed. If your ancestors were desert dwellers, they are more likely than chance to have set things up so that you were now a member of a monotheistic religion versus if they were rainforest dwellers, you were more likely to be polytheistic. And most relevant here, if your ancestors were inventing what is called a culture of honor, most common amongst nomadic pastoralists, most common where you see high rates of violence built around social norm violations, violations of honor, retribution, clan violence, you know, the Hatfields and the McCoys. And there's a very, very convincing literature on how the well-documented of culture of honor in the American South, leading to elevated levels of one very clear category of violence, descends from the fact that the people who settled the American South were not Puritans in New England or Quakers in the mid-Atlantic states. They were crazy ass shepherds and you know, folks from Scotland and Ireland and Northern England, and they brought the indigenous culture of honor there. And what people know is the culture of honor of your mother, as has already been documented, is going to influence how long she's going to hold you when you were a baby. 
how loud, how many decibels she is going to sing lullabies to you, what the latency is when you were crying before she picks you up. In other words, from within moments of birth, how your brain is being wired together by experience is being influenced by the ecology that led to the culture that your ancestors came up with. And finally, of course, all the way back evolution, we have evolved to be a particular type of primate that has particular patterns of aggression and people even understand the evolutionary neurobiology of that. Okay, so what do we have here is a long, long list. Why did he disastrously, stupidly, impulsively, imprudently pull the trigger? Why did he choose to do so? And what we take to be that choice is the outcome of the biology that went on everywhere from a second before up to a million years before over which we had no control. And I think what we wind up seeing here is a very important point, one emphasized by Francis Shen in his talk, where let's look at the chronology of some of these discoveries about the biology of behavior. Now, I'm not actually sure if there was a journal of porcine criminality in France in the 15th century, but what we begin to see as the first real examples, 1850, the first evidence that if you destroy the frontal cortex, you get someone who involitionally violates social norms. 1860, the first paper suggesting that epilepsy was a neurological disease. And what you see there is more and more of these findings. I show this in a different way, remarkably similar to a figure that you saw in Shen's talk. And what we see here, are just take a random sampling of subjects where we are learning that, oh, biology influences our behavior in a powerful way of which we are not conscious and look at the number of studies in these areas. Just one example of it, the fact that the hormone oxytocin has something to do with how readily mammals, including us, trust other individuals or not. And 99% virtually of what we have learned about what oxytocin does has come in the last 20 years. And this is the case with all of these fields. And what we have at this point is us sitting at a juncture where we have to say what's going to happen next. What's going to happen next is we are just going to get more and more of those insights. And what I say here, I think in a way that will seem provocative, but I think is absolutely the case. What we call free will is the biology that has not been discovered yet. So what do you do with that? What do you do in the face of somebody who, if by age five, already has an A score of six and is virtually guaranteed to have a life with antisocial behavior ahead of them, and you were asked to judge them? What do you do with someone with frontal cortical damage from a concussive head injury who is, what do you do with any of these examples of biological shaping? biological roots of our behavior. Well, one thing you can do at that point that is totally, completely useless is to advocate reforming the system. Let me show what reform of criminal justice would look like if you are taking that stance rather than recognizing the biology of who we are. And this example of reform comes from that great bleeding heart liberal, a doctor named Johann Weyer in the 16th century, who published an influential book at the time. And what he focused on was criminal justice at the time, and what was one of the well understood ways to figure out if somebody was a witch. How do you figure out if somebody's a witch? Here's one of the things you would do at the time, which is you would sit the person down and you would read that person the story of Christ's crucifixion, Christ's crucifixion. And at that point, if the person failed to cry at the heartbreak of what was done to our Lord, if the person failed to cry, that was the diagnostic symptom that they were a witch and you should burn them at the stake. 
So where did Johann Weyer came in? He came in and had a very important reform of the system there. He came in and he said, yes, 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 of course there are witches and demons. Yes, 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 of course a way to find out is if they don't cry at the story of our Lord's crucifixion. And yes, 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 the appropriate intervention at that point to keep society safe during our like witch wave that we're undergoing is to burn them at the stakes. Yes, all of that's true, but keep one thing in mind. Notice that an awful lot of these witches that we burn are older women. And it turns out I, as a doctor, have noticed that as people get older, potentially women, there's atrophy of the lacrimal glands in your eyes. And sometimes people can't produce tears because the glands have atrophy. So the next time you believe you have discovered somebody who is a witch and carousing with Satan and you are all set to burn them at the stake, make sure first that there's not some mitigating circumstances circumstance that they actually have their lacrimal grants of atrophied with age. And as soon as you can rule that out, then go ahead and do the right thing and burn them at the stake. This is what reform of the criminal justice system looks like in the context of what we now know about not only the biology of lacrimal gland aging, but everything else about how our brains work. And just to show what a total bleeding liberal heart Wire was, his book was banned by both the Protestant and the Catholic Church. So what we are left with here is instead a much more radical intervention because this is not a case of reform. What we see is if you truly follow the logic of all of these findings and where they're overwhelmingly likely to continue to grow, what we're going to see is every one of the words on top here is completely scientifically irrelevant to making sense of our behavior. And what we are left with is a model that we all function with. What do you do when a car's brakes don't work? You sure as hell don't let it go out and drive because it's going to injure someone. It is going to cause damage. If you can fix the brakes, go ahead and do it. And if you can't fix the brakes, what you do is you lock the car up inside a garage for the rest of time. And this is the intervention. But the critical thing is nobody sits there and says that, that car deserves not to be able to be driven in a nice park on a Sunday afternoon. What we have done is we have subtracted a notion of blame and evil and volition out of it entirely. And this is going to sound like an absurd reductionism, but this is the same model we have to have for ourselves. And if you say, oh my God, that is so dehumanizing to like view us as nothing more than mechanistic reductive machines, that's a hell of a lot better to sort of you know, do that to us, dehumanize us that way, rather than to demonize us with sermons about the rotten state of our soul. And what we're left with is this notion that I fully believe in, which is free will is the biology that has not yet been discovered. That's what we call it until we figure out what happens. So what are you supposed to do that with that from a legal standpoint? And all I can say here is you have to operate with two certainties from what we know about the history of all of this. The first is a lesson of the history of epilepsy and the transition of epilepsy from being demonic possession to a neurogenetic disorder of potassium channels doing screwy things with your action potentials. What we have learned is it is virtually guaranteed that the judgments you make now about the causes of behavior, and especially the harshest judgments that you make, future centuries, people will look back at you and they will say, my God, the ignorance at the time and the damage that they caused to people who suffered for things that they were not responsible for. What the history of theorizing about autism and schizophrenia teaches us is, there's a pretty good chance that in your own lifetime, in your later years, you are going to look back and say, my God, the things that I believed then before people knew X, Y, and Z, the damage that I did. And what we see here is the lesson over and over is we haven't a clue 
the subterranean biology that is shaping who we are in ways we have no control over. We haven't a clue that we are there, that they are there, and we better be damn sort of conscious of that fact every time we judge someone harshly. Now, if that sounds extreme enough, what I want to spend the last couple of minutes on is taking on a category that is even more difficult, more difficult than convincing us not just to subtract Satanism out of our views of epileptic seizures, but to subtract responsibility and volition out of our views of all criminal behaviors. Okay, that's going to be a hard thing to do. I mean, we've proven we can do it. We do not think of epileptics as being demonically possessed. We think of it as being heartbreaking tragedy. If somebody who with no history of epilepsy has a grand mal seizure while they are driving, lose control of the car and injure someone in the process, but we know that it is an outcome of pure damn crappy neurological luck that that happened. That was not an evil soul committing a crime. We can do that. We have shown we can do that. It's taken us 400 years to do epilepsy that way. It's taken us 50 years to do that with schizophrenia, but we can do that. What's a much tougher domain is one that in some ways is more pertinent, I would guess, to everybody sitting, sitting and listening to this lecture, because the odds are you have a certain profile. The odds are with a great frequency in your past, someone has said something to you, has said the following words. Nice job. Good job that you did. Good paper good stance that you argued, good charitable act, good empathic notion, nice job that you did that. Nice job, nice job at choosing to have done that good thing. And just to make it utterly absurd, think about a circumstance where someone will say, oh, you have such lovely cheekbones, thanks. Thanks, thanks for making it sound as if I chose to have the zygomatic arches of my skull have a certain shape to them. And just as it is going to be utterly irrelevant to think in terms of blame and punishment, it is actually just as irrelevant to think in terms of praise and differential reward. Now, here's an example of where we hit a wall with this. So your kid brings home this wonderful, wonderful sort of grade sheet, their report card, that's what they're called. And you have two options to respond to them. And one version, as has been studied wonderfully by a Stanford colleague of mine, Carol Dweck, you could sit there as a parent and say, wow, what a great grades, all of that. You must be so smart. Or wow, you must be so smart. What you are implicitly also doing them, teaching that a whole lot of effort at something is an indication that you're not so smart. You should be able to do it effortlessly and some try as And every neurotic parent out there who can tell you about direct studies and don't say you must be so smart, say you work so hard. But what that taps into is an utterly false dichotomy that we have here between the biological stuff going on in us over which we have no control and all the stuff we do with those biological tendencies that are a measure of our gumption and self-discipline and tenacity and all those admirable traits, which comes up with a totally false dichotomy. Yes, you can have the biological abnormalities that produces a pedophile. That's out of your control but it's in your control whether or not you resist those urges. And that was absolutely aired in an influential op-ed piece during the Jerry Sandusky trial by a legal scholar. Yes, there is a genetics towards proclivity towards alcoholism. You have no control over that, but you sure can choose not to enter that bar or not. And what has the last 45 minutes of this talk been about? The stuff on the right is as much an outcome of your biology and one second before to one million years before as the stuff on the left. And the stuff on the right over and over and over is the circumstances that have brought you to this moment and the sort of frontal cortex that you have. 
Now, a way to appreciate that as well is to go back to our ACE scores and are seeing have the totally out of your control, lousy luck of winding up with any of those adversities and we see this relationship. And what lots of us here in a setting like this are the outcomes of instead are not our ACE scores, but what I am calling our RLCE scores, our ridiculously lucky childhood experiences. And I've come up with a completely arbitrary list of 10 of them or so, and they show all of my biases as to what counts as good upbringing and stuff, and they're put up in contrast to the ACE scores. And what we know just as well is somewhere lurking in, there are similar numbers that for every increased number you have on your RLCE score, you're gonna have roughly a 35% increased odds of all of these wonderful good outcomes. Again, totally subjective. I happen to like musical instruments. I think that writing a good five paragraph essay is probably a good thing to aim for. I once knew all the words to kumbaya. But what we see is all of the lessons about the biological lousy luck over which we have no control that brings us to our million years worth of scores of outcomes of adversity. It's the exact same thing going on with the random luck that have brought us what we would think of as the ridiculously lucky ones. And all of these insights that are pertinent to how we judge them and their bad behaviors are just as pertinent to us and how we are praised inappropriately and rewarded inappropriately for the best of our behaviors under which, over which we have no control. Okay, so this is a lot here. And what I should admit to at this point is, amid my being totally intellectually at peace with the notion that we have no free will whatsoever, I have no idea how we're supposed to function, truly, truly accepting all of this. And I proved to myself over and over again, whether I am reacting with visceral rage when hearing about some horrendous mass shooting and where for three and a half seconds, before I am able to go through the biology of it for three and a half seconds, I think, yeah, fry that son of a bitch who did that act. Yes, definitely throw a federal hate crime at him so he can get the death penalty before I say, whoa, he had nothing to do with that. And I have just as much trouble having to go through all the biology when for three and a half seconds after someone might say to me, Wow, nice paper you published recently. And for three and a half seconds, I feel as if I had something to do with that before I go through. It is incredibly hard and I have no idea how we are supposed to function. Nonetheless, we have proven with the likes of epilepsy that we can think this way. And what I think we're left with at the end is amid my vast confusion as to how we're supposed to function, nonetheless, three things come through to me over and over. If in the face of the notion that, oh my God, we lack free will, we even, we have much less than I thought we had, there's more biology, we are nothing more than less than some biology, and we fall into existential despair, what that means is you're one of the lucky ones because what you're finding out is the things you've been rewarded for and praised for had nothing to do with your choices and were the outcome of biology. If instead, what you have spent your life doing is being punished for and judged harshly for the belief that you had choices over things that you were not, a lack of free will is not grounds for existential despair. It is grounds for the most liberating state you can imagine. The second punchline is when you really, really accept this, it is clear that you have no more right to claim that you have a right to anything more than anyone else does. The notion of entitlement is biological, scientific gibberish. We have no more rights than anyone else because we have no more to do with who we are than anyone else did. And finally, and what strikes me as the most important point, and one that I constantly have to struggle with because it is so hard to truly think this way. But if you truly, truly recognize the extent to which we are nothing more or less than our biology, there is never a rational reason for hating anyone for anything they've done any more than there is a rational reason for hating the damage caused by an earthquake or what a tornado has done. And none of this is easy. 
And none of this is easy in the context of the legal system. And it sure is even harder in the context of how we view the rest of our lives. But I am convinced looking at the history of how we have come to think more this way in some domains, that all that can come from this is vast amounts of social good. So thank you for your attention. And I'm assuming most of you are not going to quit law school tomorrow as a basis of this, but it would be nice if this is kept in mind as you go into a profession where you judge people for things over which biology gave them no control. So thank you. And um, Ali, um, I have a question for Professor Sapolsky. And I know that Dr. Roskies has a question for uh, Professor Sapolsky. So let me ask my question first, if you will. And that is, I want to dwell for a moment and ask you to comment on, on the word meritocracy. It has become a word that is overused in the English language. And I, I shall tip my hand by saying I think it is socially damaging. It distorts our politics. It, 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 it is self-congratulatory. Uh, self it is a way of, uh, of telling the lucky elements of society, nice job there. I, I'd, like, I'd like to know your thoughts on this now that I've shared mine. I, I fully agree. And sort of Michael Sandel at Harvard has been very sort of articulately speaking with the same stance that you and I appear to share. Yeah, it's a way of formalizing unequal playing fields. And it's a way of giving attribution to things where there is no attribution. And occasionally it could be instrumentally useful in the same way that parents saying, wow, you must have worked so hard is instrumentally more useful than saying, wow, you must be so smart as long as we recognize that is an instrumental tool that is not a statement of the biological reality. And in the same way, in some circumstances, something that would vaguely resemble punishment is going to have some instrumental value in terms of deterrence and such. But nonetheless, it's within the larger picture. Merit is another one of those words that should be as obsolete as blame and evil and responsibility and soul. Well, well thank you. And, and Dr. Roskies, you have a question also. Yeah, I have a, many, and I, I think we won't have time to delve into them enough. But um, so I, I will refrain, Robert, from telling you that uh, it was a really nice job on this talk. Um, but uh, I did very much enjoy the talk. And I think many of the things that you pointed out are, um, you know, to the extent that people realize what an effect environments have on the developing brain, um, whether they're physical environments or social environments, I think, you know, to the extent that that can motivate us as a society to uh, create more even playing fields, I think that all of this is to the good. Um, but all of that is also compatible with out. Uh, you know, inferring from the fact that we see effects that are statistically uh, significant to the absence of any control or free will on the part of the agent. I think, I, I don't see that, certainly does not follow as a logical consequence. Um, and you can imagine that you could, you know, significantly impact impact people's capacities and therefore various outcomes uh, without uh, determining their choices or uh, you know getting rid of free will and if you have a threshold for responsibility that um, you know may take into account mitigating factors but nonetheless acknowledges that there is such a thing as choice um, then I, I don't think you need to, to go to your sort of completely dehumanized um, version of the world without acknowledging the, the parts of this that could be used for social good. So um, I guess I want to, I, I don't expect to convince you, but I'd like to push you, um, you, you know, to at least consider the fact that there may be space between 
the idea that we are biological machines and the idea that we are therefore determined and have no role in what we do. Well, as, as the audience might guess, Dr. Roski's and I have been happily intellectually interacting and differing about these issues for decades. And as I promised, I, I represent the lunatic fringe outlier in sort of the spread of ideas. Um, again, I think choice is an illusion. Um, and I think a world in which you can reject that notion on the basis of things like limit experiments where we're talking about milliseconds of what's going on in the brain when the infectious disease load of your ancestors 500 years ago is a predictor of how xenophobic the culture is now on earth, it shows it's simply different scales. And I think every time you can manipulate somebody's behavior with hormones, with sensory information, with deep brain stimulation, et cetera, et cetera, where somebody changes their behavior, comes up with a post hoc attribution when that was not actually the case, it winds up being very challenging. But just to sort of find a, a ground for compromise here, this is what I say when I'm trying to be a house, a good house guest, which is you don't have to like agree, there's no free will whatsoever, but I think what most of us would agree is there's a whole lot less free will than we used to think. And free will is winding up being jammed into smaller and smaller places as the last century of biology has over and over taught us to say, oh, I had no idea biology had something to do with that behavior. And frankly, the cramped spaces that free will is being pushed into are less and less interesting. And if at the end of the day, you want to claim free will, and I'm, I'm trying not to be too snarky here, but if you want to claim free will in explaining why you flossed your upper teeth this morning first instead of your lower teeth, go ahead, be happy. We only want you to be happy in life. Um, I truly think that when you look at the range of influences, choice and free will is a myth. And it is unbelievably hard for us to figure out how we're supposed to function given that because I sure can't. And I admit that readily. Well, if I, if I might. Oh. Um, well, we have some questions from the chat. I was hoping to get answered after Reed. Well, I, I just want to observe uh, that when I hear the two of you exchange views, I really see two different versions of great humanitarianism coming through. Uh, Dr. Sapolsky, an emphasis on, on, if you will, humility, an emphasis on, on lack of harsh judgment and on respect, uh, broad respect for others. And, and Dr. Roski is trying to rescue the, uh, and um, preserve a concept of human autonomy, which is the, a fundamental keystone, cornerstone our concept of rights, our concept of obligation. I see both of you um, in the lens of, of great humanitarianism. So thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Our first question from the Q&A um, is from Alex Klein. Um, and he wants to know that if free will is non-existent and biology explains every action of human behavior, how come people or animals make different decisions even if they are the result of identical circumstances? Could it be answered by biology we don't understand yet? And do we have any idea of the answer to that question at this point? Um, it's a great question. And it just as one clarification, when I sound like some crazy like biological fundamentalist, it's all biology, it's all biology. It's all the biology of how it interacts with environment. They're utterly inseparable, that whole song and dance. But so where does it come from that you get two very different sets of behaviors from people raised in identical circumstances? And the answer is they're not raised in identical circumstances. And one like striking biological example of this, identical twins, identical twins, the exact same genes, genetic determinism, you should have the exact same trajectory. And it turns out there's variation in identical twins as to where there's a split in the circulation in the placental artery. And thus, how much of the circulation is shared or not shared between the two identical twins? and thus how similar or dissimilar 
the hormone levels are that they're exposed to, the nutrient levels. And it turns out what type of vascular environment you spent nine months in as an identical twin is a significant predictor of some degrees of magnitude of differences between identical twins as adults. In other words, if from step one, you already can't even control the environment of where the artery splits into in a placenta, and that's significant, or as documented by the first moments of birth, there are already epigenetic differences in blood cells in identical twins, the answer is environment is never ever the same because butterfly effects abound, tiny differences turn out not to be tiny. Thank you so much for that response. And another question from the chat. I know we're over time, but I want to make sure we get to the plethora of questions we received for you. Um, how do you account for the individuals who seem to defy their genetics or upbringing and seem to change their trajectory for their descendants? That's wonderful. Um, the stress field these days is dominated by people studying resilience. Who are the outliers? We're under every point of adversity you can imagine, where does the strength come from? And we don't know much about it yet. Um, and astonishingly, not every individual who was abused as a child becomes an abuser as an adult. And what we've learned in fact is far fewer of them do than one would have expected. Astonishingly, there was a minuscule subset of people who came out of concentration camps in some bizarre way strengthened, having found their God, having found their purpose in life. There are room spaces for coping for resilience and it's no more or less biology than any other. It's a lot rarer and it's a lot less understood and it's incredibly important to understand. And having said that, what we should definitely not do is use that as some sort of judgmental sort of hammer at this point of saying, hey, why can't you be like these other people who pull it together and get over their clinical addiction or get over their major depression or get over their PTSD or some such thing? Look, that person did. Look, that person had a rare, poorly understood biology that most of you don't have and they were the lucky one. Thank you so much for that response. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, we have a question in the chat that is asking, how is, um, how is this dehumanizing? Um, they feel it's actually the opposite in that the place of the frontal cortex is behavior which makes it totally human. Good, and I agree. The, the dehumanizing is one of the sort of critical negative responses to this stance. And my response there was to instead use the word liberating. If it's dehumanizing existential despair, where's our purpose? What does it mean that I have loved who I have loved for, for reductive biological reasons, et cetera, et cetera. When you really frame this correctly, this is enormously liberating. And I had an intensely moving exposure to this a few years ago when I was trying to research and write about the history of schizophrenogenic mothering and how it was finally gotten rid of in psychiatry circles. And it turned out in the 1980s, there was a group founded in Madison, Wisconsin that eventually turned into an organization of tens of thousands of people of parents of schizophrenics where they were a support group and eventually an advocacy group for biological research and eventually an advocacy group for getting rid of schizophrenogenic mothering from medical school curricula, from psychiatry residency curricula and such. And two out of the three founders are still alive. They are both in their late nineties, mothers of schizophrenics. And I got to talk to each of them for a few hours each. And there is no way to describe how liberating it was for them the first time they grasped the notion, it was not my fault that this happened to my child. I did not do it. And I think under this circumstance, and very much in line with what Charles was saying, there is, God help me with a sound bite like this, but there is a liberatory neurobiology to go along with liberation theology and such. Um, when done right, um, if you despair 
at the insights into biology, it means you're one of the lucky ones. What biological insights about our behavior will mostly do is be enormously liberatory. And I think that's great. Dr. Spalsi, thank you so much for that wonderful keynote and your answering to questions and engaging with Dr. Roskies. Uh, we are so grateful that you agreed to be a part of our symposium. There are a few more questions for you in the Q&A if you would like to take the time to respond to them. Um, but in the interest of time, I think we are ready for our 15 minute break before our final panel for the rest of the day. If we could all give a great large thank you to Dr. Spalski one more time, that would be lovely. Well, thanks. Thank you so much. Let's begin then with our afternoon's presentations. And uh, we will begin with um, Tammy Adini Pikun. Uh, did I get that right? Uh, close and okay, close enough. Thank you. And uh, she will be talking. Uh, she is a doctoral researcher at Wake Forest University, and uh, she will be addressing uh, questions regarding compulsory detention and uh, the forced treatment of mental health patients and whether this always constitutes a breach of human rights and international law. So um, I, will, uh, I will let you begin. Thank you very much for being here at the university, even virtually. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Allow me to share my slides so that you can all easily follow along. Yeah, okay. So I'll be, um, the question for today is, is compulsory detention and involuntary treatment of mental health patients always a breach of human rights? Why is it important that we discuss the human rights of persons with mental disabilities? Uh, traditionally, mental disability had not been regarded as a human rights issue. Disability was seen only as a medical problem of the individual who requires a treatment or cure in order to make them an equal member of the society. However, by viewing disability as a human rights issue, we are made to focus on the inherent equality of all people, regardless of abilities, disabilities, or differences. And it further obligates society to remove physical barriers to equality and encourage inclusion of people with disabilities. Governments do not possess the power to grant or deny human rights and freedom. Persons possess rights simply because of their humanity. Thus, persons with mental disabilities need not prove that they deserve certain rights or that they can be trusted to exercise them in socially and culturally acceptable ways. International human rights law can therefore serve as a basis to challenge unjust treatment of people with mental disabilities even in the face of popular or political objections. This topic is also important because there are a lot of countries that currently do not have provisions for mental health rights. Consequently, persons with mental disabilities may lack valuable legal protection rooted in human rights or even where available under law, such protection may be under enforced. There are two popular myths that are fraud misperceptions about persons with mental disabilities and perpetrated enduring negative stereotypes. As a result, these myths have become pervasive and influential on the public discussion surrounding mental disability and the right to mental health. The first myth is the myth of incompetency, which relies on the false assumption that persons with mental disabilities cannot competently make decisions or grant consent when in actuality, mental disability is very substantially. A person's right to mental health clearly may be undermined if he or she is erroneously assumed to be incompetent. A second destructive myth is a common misconception that persons with mental disabilities generally pose a threat to others. Research on this issue demonstrates that persons with mental disabilities have no greater propensity to commit violent acts in comparison with persons who do not have a mental disability. Moreover, as we know, most violent acts are committed by people who do not have a mental disability. Nevertheless, the media often gives disproportionate attention to the rare cases when a mentally disabled person commits a violent crime. 
Even a single high profile incident of this nature can fuel public outrage and stigma against all persons with mental disabilities and additionally may provide the motive to enact more severe mental health laws. Several international human rights instruments are available for the protection of persons with mental disabilities. However, the United Nations principles for the protection of persons with mental illness and for the improvement of mental health care is the principal source of law within the United Nations system. It is commonly referred to as the MI principles. These principles, while not formally binding, serve as influential aids in the interpretation of treaty obligations. The United Nations Mental Illness Principles begins by enunciating fundamental freedoms and rights to such things as the best available mental health care, respect for inherent dignity, protection from physical or other abuse, and degrading treatment. It recognizes the inherent difficulty in protecting human rights in mental institutions and thus provides for a duty to treat patients in the least restrictive environment and to maintain and improve their autonomy. The United Nations Mental Illness Principle adopts three legal standards and procedures for involuntary admission to a hospital. A mental health institution may involuntarily admit a person only if one, she has a mental illness diagnosed under internationally accepted medical standards. Two, there is a serious possibility that immediate harm will happen to her or to others. And three, if she is severely mentally ill, has impaired judgment, and there will be a drastic deterioration of her illness if the facility does not admit her. To ensure that an involuntary admission meets the preceding requirements, a patient will receive a fair hearing by a judicial or other independent and impartial review body. During this hearing, the patient has the right to representation can call independent experts and can review all evidence given and the reasons for the review body's decision. The mental illness principle contains the most direct expression of human rights in the context of mental illness issued to date by the United Nations. Another provision available is the Inter-American System for the Protection of Human Rights. This system resides within the jurisdiction of the Organization of American States. Human rights in this system are protected under several multilateral treaties. The Organization of American States, through a resolution, also established the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights to monitor and report on compliance of member states with these rights protected under the American Declaration. The American Convention on Human Rights of 1969 aims to eliminate all forms of discrimination against persons with disabilities. Hey, how are you? and encourages states to make efforts toward completely integrating persons with disabilities into the society. While this convention has not yet gone into effect, it holds great promise for promoting the human rights of persons with mental disabilities in the Americas. Two obvious obstacles may hinder widespread implementation and enforcement of international human rights treaties. First, these treaties directly apply only to countries that have ratified it. Therefore, countries not signed to the treaty are not legally bound to follow the right to health as outlined in the provision. Second, the level of implementation is partially contingent on the resources of the particular country. Under the progressive realization standard of the international regulations, the right to health is not equivalent to the right to be healthy since the attainment of good health depends on multiple determinants, including biological preconditions and the income of a nation. Therefore, governments with insufficient resources, such as low income nations, do not have to fulfill a right to health with any degree of immediacy or haste. I now move on to the essence of my discussion today, which is the compulsory compulsory detention and involuntary treatments of mental health patients in mental institutions. An individual with mental disabilities liberty would be said to be infringed upon when without appropriate due process, they are confined against their will and without justification. Even where such detention is warranted, they are typically not provided with humane living conditions. 
Various international human rights framework guarantees the right to liberty and security of an individual and also lists the circumstances upon which governments may justifiably deprive persons of their liberty. The mental institution must inform the victim of the reasons for their psychiatric arrest. And under the United Nations mental illness principles, all persons are entitled to a fair hearing by an impartial tribunal or court to review the reason for the detention. An individual is also entitled to an enforceable remedy in damages. I'm going to focus on compulsory detention as it pertains in the European system because the European Court of Human Rights has been highly active in protecting the human rights of persons with mental disabilities. By contrast, the institution of the inter-American system have historically exhibited far less interest in addressing mental health issues. Article five of the European Court of Human Rights lists the only circumstances in which governments may justifiably deprive a person of their liberty. It allows for, in quotes, the lawful detention of persons for the prevention of the spreading of infectious diseases, the detention of persons of unsound mind, and the detention of alcoholics or drug addicts or vagrants, end of quote. The European Court of Human Rights, therefore, allows the involuntary detention of persons of unsound mind with other individuals marginalized in society without a criminal conviction. However, the fact that an individual is in poor health for mental illness, dependent on alcohol or drugs, or has no visible means of support should not in itself warrant detention. An additional finding of dangerousness and the fact that the person will benefit from being confined are what is necessary to justify detaining people who belong to these groups. Despite the European Court of Human Rights failure to state clearly and precisely a rigorous justification for detention on grounds of mental disability, the court has, however, imposed reasonable strong standards under Article 5 of the European Convention on Human Rights. The first standard is that the detention must be lawful. Article 5 essentially requires that the detention must conform with the relevant domestic laws. This is so as to avoid governmental authorities making arbitrary decisions. The European Court has stated more generally that lawful detention must also be consistent with, with the purposes for which a mental health facility is confining the individual. Put another way, the government must demonstrate a reasonable relationship between the objective, which is to provide care and treatment in the person's best interest, and the means used to achieve those objectives that is reasonable procedures and the conditions of confinement. Governmental action will not be said to be reasonable if it is aimless. The second standard is that the person must be of unsound mind. The entire foundation of mental health law rests on a reliable diagnosis of mental disability. Without confirmation of this status, individuals should not be subject to confinement without conviction of a criminal offense. The European Court of Human Rights requires a finding of unsoundness of mind to justify confinement in a mental hospital. Therefore, the European courts would not permit the detention of a person simply because his views or behavior deviate from the norms prevailing in a particular society. For the detention to be lawful, three minimal conditions must be observed. One, the state must establish through objective medical expertise that the individual is of unsound mind the European Court has found the provision of liberty without first consulting a medical expert to be unlawful. The second criteria for lawful detention is that the mental illness must be of sufficient seriousness to justify the provision of liberty. The third criteria is that the validity of continued detention depends upon the persistence of such a mental disorder. Accordingly, even if the person had a sufficiently serious form of mental disability at the time of admission, the hospital must discharge the patient when she achieves a state of mental health that no longer warrants confinement. The third standard imposed by the European Court is that the person must have the right to a review of his detention by a court. Everyone who is deprived of his liberty by arrest or detention shall be entitled to court proceedings by which the lawfulness of his detention shall be decided speedily and his release ordered if the detention is not lawful. A review of detention must achieve two clear purposes. First, 
The review must examine whether authorities have acted in accordance with the applicable procedures and criteria as set forth under domestic law. Second, the review must examine whether authorities have co complied fully with the European Court of Human Rights. The authorities must have followed all of the standards set in it, including the prohibition against arbitrary detention and the requirement of independent medical evidence demonstrating that the person is and continues to be of unsound mind. Article 5 of the European Court of Human Rights also provides that everyone who is compulsorily detained shall be informed promptly in a language which he or she understands of the reasons of his arrest and of any charge against him or her. This provision extends to compulsory detention under mental health law. The condition of detention in the mental health institution. Human rights law that apply to persons with mental disabilities usually focus primarily on ensuring that standards and procedures for involuntary detention in the mental institution is being followed and that there is an opportunity for meaningful periodic review by a court or tribunal. But international human rights law does not stop there. Rather, it further sets minimal standards for the condition of detention in a mental institution. This is so as to ensure a therapeutic environment and prevention of neglect and abuse of patients. Article 5 of the American Convention establishes that there shall be a right to humane treatment. This proviso protects detained persons from exposure to conditions that may demean them and result in a deterioration of their mental health. Inhuman and degrading treatment does not require a malicious intent. Mental health professionals who seclude or restrain patients may be in violation even if their purpose is to provide therapy for the patient or security for the mental institution. Since these patients are vulnerable by means of their mental state and their dependence on the government to meet their needs, special scrutiny of the conditions of their confinement is important. In Ireland versus United Kingdom, the European Court set the standard for inhuman and degrading treatment. Treatment will be said to be inhuman if it, re if it reaches a level of significance involving considerable mental or physical suffering and where the patient has undergone humiliation or debasement. Inhuman and degrading treatment depends on all the circumstances of the case, including the nature and context of the treatment, the manner and method of its execution, its duration, its physical or mental effects, and in some cases, the victim's sex, age, and state of health. The European Court has also applied these protections in two important cases to persons with disabilities confined in prison, in prison settings. In Kenan versus United Kingdom, the case involved the suicide of a mentally ill man confined to a prison segregation cell after he assaulted two prison officers. Did the deputy governor extended the prisoner's sentence by 28 days and placed the prisoner in segregation for seven days. The court found that a lack of effective monitoring and informed psychiatric input by prison officials demonstrated significant defects in the medical care provided to the mentally ill person. Taking into account the prisoner's vulnerability and the authority's obligation to protect his health, the court determined that the serious disciplinary punishment threatened his physical and moral resistance and adversely affected his personality. The European Court found that these actions violated Article 3 of the European Convention because they constituted inhuman and degrading treatment. In the second case, Price versus United Kingdom, a court sentenced a woman with significant physical disabilities to jail for seven days for contempt of court. During this period, the prison officials confined her to a regular cell that did not have appropriate facilities for a person with disabilities. Thus, the applicant had no choice but to sleep in a wheelchair. She was unable to use the toilet facilities or access the light switches and emergency buttons because they were all out of her reach. She experienced serious medical problems as a result of the condition of her detention. The court expressed that in determining whether a treatment is degrading, it should consider whether the person's intent was to humiliate the victim concerned. 
The court noted that even if it did not find a emulating purpose, it would not automatically decide that there was no violation of Article 3. In this case, the court did not find that the prison officials meant to embarrass the woman, but it nevertheless held that detaining a severely disabled person under these circumstances violated the European Court of Human Rights prohibition against degrading treatment. As seen in their both cases, severe maltreatment, neglect, or humiliation of patients or placement of patients in an in harsh or unsafe environment is enough to violate an individual's human rights. A court has a responsibility to protect patients from serious forms of maltreatment, even if administered similarly under the guise of medical expertise. Since the purpose of a compulsory detention on the grounds of unsoundness of mind is to heal the patient, such a detention should take place only in a facility equipped to provide minimally adequate care and treatment. Such adequate standards of treatment would help guarantee that a person's mental health does not further deteriorate or actually improves during confinement. The Inter-American Commission has adopted a more direct stance than the European Court in requiring governments to protect persons with mental disabilities from inhuman and degrading treatment. In Victor Rosario Congo versus Ecuador, the Inter-American Commission found Ecuador in violation of Article 5 of the American Convention, which guarantees a right to humane treatment. A person with mental disabilities taken into study was not cooperating with interrogators. Two days later, God struck him on the head. The rehabilitation center employees did not give him any medical treatment for the resulting injury, and they left him in his cell for 40 days. Eventually, authorities took him to a hospital to treat his severe dehydration, but Mr. Congo ended up dying in that hospital. The Inter-American Commission acknowledged that the United Nations Mental Illness Principle should act as guidance for determining whether the person received humane treatment. The commission found that keeping a person in isolation itself can constitute inhuman and degrading treatment. But when the person in isolation has a mental disability, this could involve, this could involve an even more serious violation of the state's obligation to protect the physical, mental, and moral integrity of persons held under its custody. The commission cited poor conditions and lack of medical treatment as factors in determining whether degrading treatment has occurred. The commission concluded that a violation of the right to physical integrity is even more serious in the case of a person held in preventive detention, suffering a mental disease, and therefore in the custody of the state in a particular vulnerable position. This case is important and noteworthy for several reasons. First, it was the first time that the Inter-American Commission addressed the rights of persons with mental disabilities. Secondly, this case set a strong precedent for the protection of these rights under the American Con Convention, firmly establishing Article 5 as a powerful tool to help prevent harmful detention and treatment in mental hospitals and related facilities. The holding of the American Commission presented a compelling connection between the right to humane treatment and the protection of persons with mental disabilities under confinement. Third, the American Commission based its conclusion on prior holdings by the European Commission and the European Court of Human Rights, as well as on the United Nations mental illness principles, due to the absence of precedence within its own system. This recognition and acceptance of other related sources of international law bodes well for the future development of the inter-American system. Rights and protections of persons with mental disabilities will develop more rapidly if the Commission continues to build on the, juris, on the jurisprudence of the more established system. In conclusion, what is the future of human rights and mental health? International human rights law and institutions can do so much to promote good mental health in the population and improve the lives of persons with mental disabilities. The various institutions for the protection of human rights provide opportunities for substantial human rights protection for persons with mental disabilities at both the individual and communal level. These international bodies have a potentially powerful effect on the lives of persons with mental disabilities. 
Decisions made by these bodies become principles, which in turn clarify the scope and application of human rights law for the protection and promotion of the rights of persons with mental disabilities. Adjudicatory mechanisms allow for the detection and prevention of human rights violations. Individ individuals may bring their grievances directly to obtain specific relief from violations. The ability of individuals and in some cases, non-governmental organizations to directly assess these institutions allows victims of human rights abuses to take more proactive steps to seek justice. Access to regional courts has also provided an opportunity for victims of human rights abuses to receive direct redress through compensation or otherwise. The United Nations system continues to progressively enhance its human rights framework through efforts to enact new instruments, both binding and non-binding, to protect mental health within human rights law. The goal is that initiatives such as the proposed International Convention on Disability and the ongoing mandate of the Special Correspondence on Health and Disability Rights would advance the development of stronger, more enforceable rights for persons with mental disabilities. However, human rights standards that will protect and promote the interests of persons with, with mental disabilities do not have to solely exist at the international level. National governments should work on incorporating these standards into their domestic legislations Many countries are beginning to undertake serious efforts at mental health law reforms. However, many others continue to have antiquated and obsolete laws that do not conform to human rights standards or do not provide adequate authority to implement these standards within a national system. Countries looking to establish significant protections for persons with mental disabilities should either modify their national legal system to conform to international human rights standards or incorporate international instruments such as the United Nations Mental Illness Principles as precedent into their national mental health schemes. Thank you. Tammy, thank you so much for your presentation. I have some questions for you, but as I have done uh, consistently uh, today, I will save the questions until the conclusion of the other two uh, pa uh, panel members of their talks. And so I shall begin by uh, introducing our next speaker, uh, Rose Tempowski. She is a British trained lawyer. She is admitted to practice in, in New York. And um, she wishes, uh, she plans to speak today on um, the developing brain, on uh, the brain uh, as it develops uh, from childhood through what I would might describe as a kind of prolonged adolescence. Uh, it, uh, and uh, you address specifically in your paper, a movement called Raise the Age, in your proposal, a movement to raise the age, uh, by which you mean the, the age by which one can be tried as an adult in the, in the criminal justice system. Uh, I'm keenly interested in, in your presentation and uh, I, look I look forward uh, to your contributions. I think they may be quite helpful to us here in the United States because this is a significant debate with, with wide divisions in uh, politics and law. So thank you so much for, for submitting a proposal. Thank you for, so much for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. So yes, thank you very much to the University of St. Thomas and uh, for the very interesting symposium we've had so far today and to Dr. Reed and Ali and Jack for all of their organization. Um, as Dr. Reed said, my name's Rose Tempovsky and I'm joining you all from Nottingham today in the UK um, where I'm a doctoral candidate at Birmingham City University. Um, and I'm also a lecturer at the University of Law. I'm going to present to you a paper based on my doctoral research that is co-authored with my supervisors, Dr. Sarah Cooper, Professor Maxine Linton, and Jill Malloy. So if you just bear with me while I share my screen. So this is a model for analyzing and grading the quality of scientific authorities presented to state legislative committees in the United States. 
I'll begin by contextualizing the project for you, um, discussing the legislative era that it sits in and examines. Um, I'll then talk you through the methodology for developing this grading model and how it was used to analyze scientific references presented to state legislative committees. And I'll conclude by sharing with you a snapshot of the results of the model across four states and what this tells us. So we've known for centuries, essentially, that young people are not as thoughtful as adults. Aristotle said that the young are heated by nature as drunken men are by wine. St. Augustine recognized that free will was constrained in the young. And Shakespeare basically said that nothing good happens between the ages of 10 and 23, just fighting with your elders and getting people pregnant. Since the advent of MRI and fMRI, we've now got a body of neuroscience and alongside it, social science, which confirms that these anecdotal historic observations do have a scientific basis. Longitudinal studies have confirmed that human brains continue to mature and restructure throughout adolescence, with the prefrontal cortex responsible for executive functions maturing into an individual's 20s. To paraphrase Professor Sapolsky from earlier, this is the part of the brain that helps you make the right decision when it's hard to do so. Studies examining adolescent decision making demonstrate that young people prioritize reward when assessing risk. They can take more risks in so-called hot contexts, and they're more likely to take risks in the presence of their peers. Beatrice Luna's 2001 fMRI study um, showed that decision making in adults differed to that in young people, with executive regions responsible for focus, planning, performance monitoring, and error spotting being used automatically by adults, but much less by teenagers. And these findings have motivated arguments that the immaturity of an adolescent brain could impact criminal culpability, a point which has been recognized by the US Supreme Court in 2005 in the case of Roper. So since 2005, there's been a series of US Supreme Court cases that have dealt with juvenile criminal culpability from Roper to Graham to Miller and Montgomery. You've heard various people speak on them earlier today, but the court has begun to recognize this emerging neuroscience and this dominant theory that decision-making in youth is affected by brain development. Um, and this transient nature of it, because it's developing, makes them more amenable to rehabilitation. And it's for this reason that the United States was chosen as a jurisdiction for this research project. So in conducting a literature and legislative review, in fact, it features some of the speakers today, um, it was apparent that post Roper, a movement in juvenile justice legislation was occurring. This map shows the um, age limit, the upper age limit for juvenile court jurisdiction in each of the United States in 2007. As you can see, North Carolina and New York had an upper age limit of 16. 11 others, including Texas, had an upper age limit of 17, and 37 had an upper age limit of 18. By 2014, four states have raised their age of juvenile jurisdiction to 18. By 2019, five more states have raised their age to 18. There's a clear national consensus of 18 being the upper age of juvenile jurisdiction. Only four states at this point exist below this, Georgia, Michigan, Texas, and Wisconsin. However, in addition to this, there's one state, Vermont, which has raised its upper age limit to 20. It's gone beyond the national consensus of 18. And this era of legislative movement has been dubbed the raise the age era. Alongside this legislative movement in age of jurisdiction, there was also a movement in transfer laws. These were the laws that were brought in mostly during the tough on crime era, late 80s, uh, early 90s, that swept more young people into the adult criminal justice system. For example, um, statutory exclusion laws meant that if you committed a certain crime, you would be tried automatically in adult criminal court. Direct file laws meant that it was up to the prosecutor. Um, they could um, they could choose to directly file an adult criminal court and didn't have to rely on a discretionary waiver from the judge. 
these were now beginning to be adjusted or eased in this raise the age era as well. And this paper focuses on these two types of legislative change. In looking at the proposed legislative changes in these areas and trying to determine what extent did brain science play a role in it, I started to look at, well, where did brain science have a chance to interact with the legislative process? And I settled on legislative committees. Committees would hold public hearings and invite witnesses to submit testimony for or against proposed testimony, sorry, proposed legislation. And this testimony could be retrieved um, and examined for reference to adolescent brain development science. On the slide there, you can see examples of some of the testimony. I focused on examining witness testimony in four states. Wisconsin and Michigan were chosen because at the point of research, they hadn't raised the age to 18. Michigan now has. Um, and Vermont was, uh, and Connecticut were also chosen. Vermont, because it was the standout state, the one that had gone further than anyone else, and Connecticut because it was repeatedly trying to go above 18 also. In wanting to collect this data, some research questions filtered out, including, was there any method for filtering the science that's been presented to the legislature, or determining in fact whether it was good quality science that was being presented? Who are the people who engage in this process? And what themes reoccur in the witness testimony? I needed to develop a model for analyzing and grading the quality of the science presented. So that's what we had to do. This is the first draft of the model. And initially I explored pedagogical research. Um, I started thinking along the lines of how one might grade say an undergraduate dissertation, giving the science a grade out of 100 from zero being completely void of science to exceptional at being 100. I looked at what would be considered good quality science and the hierarchy of reliability in scientific studies. Criteria were picked such as whether something was purely anecdotal based on opinion, or whether it was say a randomized controlled trial. Was it performed in animals or humans? Was it peer reviewed or not? If it was peer reviewed, was it in a scientific journal or something adjacent? These criteria evolved, oh, and by the way, I'm not expecting you to be able to read everything that's on the screen, they're, they're just for illustrative purposes. But these criteria evolved and I realized I broadly had two categories of criteria. Ones which analyzed the quality of scientific communication, the arguments that had been put before the legislature, and ones which graded the quality of the underpinning scientific authorities. So the model was then split in two, which would allow for an x-axis grade and a y-axis grade to be awarded to the uh, testimony and allow this to be plotted on a graph. And at this point, the scale also reduced to five points. Um, there was much more value in making a determination between something that is a three and a four, say, than something that say a 67 and a 68. It meant much more being on a five point scale. And when a satisfactory iteration was reached, I undertook, I guess, a sort of beta or beta testing. Um, I adapted the model to, instead of refer to adolescent brain science, to refer to vac vaccination health science and ran a test with it uh, on some compulsory vaccination legislation to assess whether the model actually was suitable to its task, um, but without jeopardizing my my study by going straight into my de uh, determined data. So once I was happy with it, tweaks were some tweaks were made on, based on that, that testing um, and the model was now in its, its final form. The first grade awarded would be an X axis grade and this would be for the quality of the scientific communication. Has it communicated this theory regarding adolescent brain development and its link to juvenile justice? Something here scoring a five would make reference to adolescent brain development. It would do so in the context of the juvenile justice system. It would make links between brain development and decision-making in young people, link that to criminal culpability and either critically analyze the evidence base or explore the inherent uncertainty of scientific conclusions. The second grade awarded would be on the y-axis. And this would be for the quality of scientific authorities. 
Was the underpinning science robust enough to be relied upon? Was this science something that should be reaching the legislature? Something scoring a five here would cite multiple authorities, weigh and critically discuss them, provide pin sites to statements uh, in the authorities which supported the arguments being made, cite to peer reviewed ju uh, scientific journals or professional equivalents, might be systematic reviews or meta-analyses of other studies such as randomized control trials performed in humans. So I'll share with you now um, a snapshot of the results. The, the model was, was used to analyze just under 700 pieces of publicly accessible witness testimony across these four states in the time period 2000 to 2019. This time period was chosen because it spanned the SCOTUS jurisprudence mentioned earlier, and it just predates this raise the age area, which seems to start in 2007. Here you can see, you might just not quite be able to see the end depending on where your Zoom windows are, um, but here you can see the relevant legislative activity in this period. Red shows failed bills, green shows enacted bills, and at the end you'll see orange which show um, pending legislation at the time of the close of data. You can see that post ROPA 2005, there is an increase in legislative activity. All the witness testimony was analysed and it was graded with the model. And here you can see the percentage of testimony in each of the four states, which does mention adolescent brain development science. So you can clearly see that brain, sti brain science is an established theme. This graph shows the x-axis scores, the scientific communication scores, the grades rather, for the witness testimony analysed. It shows that the most common score is zero meaning most testimony didn't mention brain development science at all. But of those that did, three is the most common score. This is an argument which references brain science in the context of the juvenile justice system and links it to decision making. Five is the least common score. And in fact, only three out of the almost, um, I forgot the number, I think it's 236 documents that reference brain science. Only three of those actually reach a five on the uh, on the grade for scientific argument. This graph shows the y-axis scores, the scientific authority grades. As expected, the most common score is zero. It would be the same as the x-axis. And this means that there was no reference to brain science. But if we exclude that, we can see that the next most common is a one. This grade means that the testimony made a scientific argument but it didn't offer any authority for that argument. It suggests there's authority out there by saying that, you know, that there is science, but it doesn't give any signpost as to what that science is or where it can be found. None of the near 700 documents in total scored a five for the quality of their authorities. Scientific, this shows that scientific authority, sorry, scientific arguments are entering the legislative process. They're not necessarily, or rather they're entering this legislative process, but they're not being backed up by robust and reliable authorities. This chart shows the combined X and Y result plotted on an axis. And it allows us to look at which documents would be considered in air quotes, good quality science by the model. In other words, which, which score above a three in both scales. We can see here that the majority of testimony that makes, um, a, the, sorry, we can see that the majority of testimony, in fact, actually does make a good scientific argument, but it doesn't offer a uh, scientific authority. We can also see that if we were filtering this testimony, which mentions brain science, only that in that top right quarter um, would, um, would be considered good by the model, scoring above a three in both, in, on both grades. And that amounts to 16% of the testimony which mentions brain science. So 16% of the scientific arguments uh, in front of the state legislative committees. The model also allows for some comparison between the states. Now, as mentioned, this is just a snapshot of results I'm sharing with you. But if we look at Vermont with juvenile jurisdiction of up to 20 compared to Wisconsin, which has an upper limit of 17 um, and hasn't yet raised the age to 18, we can see that there are differences in the distribution of grades. 
most notably, Wisconsin doesn't have any grade fives for scientific argument communication. Moving on to compare the scientific authority grades, we can see that testimony in Wisconsin provides scientific authority much less than Vermont. As a reminder, only scores above a two mean that authority was provided. These results will be explored further in the article. Moving on to the next question I aim to answer when analyzing this testimony, which themes recur? Here you can see that alongside brain science, a number of themes did exist. Many are exactly what you would expect. Concern regarding serious offenses, other states practice, victims rights, recidivism, etc. You can see that the two most common themes which arise are resources. In other words, funding or staffing for these changes in raising the age and adjusting transfer laws and also recidivism. The final finding that I'm sharing with you today is, um, is in this snapshot. It relates to who engages with this public process. The authors of the witness testimony were recorded and categorized. The most common category of author was non-governmental organizations, either for or non-profit, for example, the ACLU. And this was followed by state departments. For example, testimony from the Department for Children and Family Services or the Department for Corrections. In Vermont, state departments, in fact, actually overtook organizations as the most common authorship group. But in all of the three other states, it was organizations being the modal group. Other groups who engaged were religious organizations. And this group was particularly heavily involved in Michigan. Citizens, citizens who were personally affected by the juvenile justice system law enforcement organizations, lawyer organizations, such as the um, state of the state, um, the organization of public defenders. Um, you'll note that the least represented group are doctors or scientists. So just to provide some conclusions to those few research questions I mentioned earlier, is there a method for filtering the science presented or determining which is good? Well, no. And if we use this grading model, then only 16% of the scientific testimony would be ranked as good science. Who engages with the process? Well, non-governmental organizations were the most represented group with scientists and doctors being the least represented. And which themes recur? Brain science does feature as a theme but the most common themes are resources and recidivism. This concludes the snapshot that I'm sharing with you today, but this will be explored further in the paper that's ultimately presented. Thank you very much for listening and I'll hand over to Dr. Reed. Ms. Tempowski, uh, thank you for a marvelous presentation. I've been taking copious notes as you've gone along. I have some questions for you, but again, I'll reserve those questions to the conclusion of our, our afternoon uh, session. So I will now uh, introduce um, Melissa Hamilton and uh, her co-author, uh, John Phillips Bourne. And um, some words about each. Uh, Melissa Hamilton uh, has written, uh, I came across this article uh, recently. It's a very, very compelling article. It is, um, on uh, debating algorithmic fairness. Uh, very uh, compelling article, very, um, um, uh, very good research on the question of how do we do risk assessment? Uh, how do we make use of, of, of science with risk assessment? And you point out some fundamental flaws with that, including issues of structural racism and questions of that sort. It's a very good paper. Um, and John Phillipsborn, uh, Mr. Phillipsborn is an international lawyer. He's a criminal defense lawyer. He um, has a practice based in San Francisco, California. And I'd like to welcome each of you here this afternoon. Thank you so much for uh, participating in our program. Thank you so much for submitting a proposal and uh, look forward to your, your presentation. You will be speaking on the uh, uh, competence assessment 
in ingredients. Uh, so I look forward to both of your presentations and, and thank you so much. Thank you. And I want to lend also my uh, appreciation to Dr. Reed, Allie, and Jack for a just wonderful um, symposium today. And we're at the end and hopefully we won't disappoint you at the very end of it. Uh, so yes, our, our topic today is the intersection um, of competency to stand trial assessments and neuroscience. So we've already been introduced, thank you very much, but I just wanted to mention that um, my co-author, Mr. Phillips Worm, will take, be taking over this presentation about halfway through, but he has, uh, so what we wanted to do was to collaborate, um, me as an academic and he as a practitioner, he has uh, many years of experience with uh, competency assessment in very important cases. So he brings a uh, practical and experiential um, flavor to it that's been very important. I've learned so much from him about on that. So what we're going to cover is some of the basics of what is what is competence to stand trial. Um, from a legal perspective, we are focused on US law, although um, most common law countries have some type of competence requirements so that um, a lot of this information is relevant to uh, many countries. Uh, we'll briefly go through the traditional competency assessment methods and then introduce how neurobiology and neuroimaging can um, provide some additional and helpful information, but then also discuss some uh, reservations about uh, the role of neuroimaging. So the basic rule is that an incompetent defendant cannot be tried. Um, so, for, so for this uh, matter, uh, competency is represents the most common forensic mental health evaluation in the criminal law area. Uh, in the US, uh, incompetency is suspected in about 10 to 20% of defendants, and that actually may be a low figure. Um, and in, again, in the US, this figure is at least over 60,000 competency evaluations are done every year. Uh, this particular figure is about 20 years old. It's, uh, we don't have a more recent national picture, uh, but there have been some studies of some states in which that indicates that competency evaluations have increased twofold and even threefold in some of these states. And I think it just went forward a bit too, uh, too many two slides. Um, can I go back? There we go. So um, competency, the idea of it um, came from common law several centuries ago. Now in common law, they actually were terming it originally as insanity, but the basic rule was that you, um, the law would not allow the prosecution of an insane person. And the reason was because they basically were absent from the trial process. Now the US Supreme Court in more recent times have um, in, embrace um, the idea of competency as a requirement to prosecute a person um, as a constitutional requirement. Because the, uh, the way the US Supreme Court, for example, in the case I have up there, Indiana versus Edwards, um, acknowledges that the criminal law um, respects the person's autonomy, here the defendant's autonomy, to be recognized in, to, in terms of their ability to make important decisions, such as whether to plead guilty or whether to testify in one's own defense and the one's autonomy in terms of being able to communicate effectively with their own attorney. But it's also about dignifying the defendant as a human being because the trial is of the defendant, not of his lawyer. And so it requires that he be able then to, be, to present his own case or if he's not, then not to try the person and then it's overall an aspect of fairness of the um, criminal adjudication, because um, in, uh, at least in US law is, the criminal law is adversarial. And if you have one of the parties be incompetent, then the other party has too much power here being the government. So what does competence mean? Well, the Supreme Court then has developed a, what they call a due process floor because competency is a due process right. And here are some of the uh, functional angles that are required is that the defendant, for example, be have a rational as well as factual understanding of the proceedings. For example, does the defendant know what crime that he, is, he or she is being uh, prosecuted for? Um, they have to show that the individual has a capacity to understand the objective of the proceedings. For example, does the defendant realize that if he or she pleads guilty, what is going to be the result um, and how is it going to affect their life? Another aspect of this is 
does the person have sufficient um, and present ability to consult with counsel with a reasonable degree of rational understanding? And then finally, the, also the capacity to consult with counsel to assist in preparing the defense. Competency is, for example, um, is a status. It is not a defense. So, so the competency assessment has nothing to do with the guilt or innocent of the particular defendant. But what you can see here in these four aspects is you can imagine the role that neuroscience can play in terms of explaining deficits in any of these areas and these types of cognitive and social functioning um, uh, tasks for an individual. But this is an interdisciplinary task because even though competence is a, a legally defined um, condition, it is assessed by mental health professionals. Um, so there's, uh, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that many of the laws about competence require there be some evidence that the defendant has some type of mental disorder or intellectual disability. And that requires then a mental health diagnosis. Uh, common underlying diagnosis for purposes of competency hearings are psychosis and dementia, among others. But you can imagine neuroevidence then can be helpful here to provide an independent and authoritative backup to the mental health professional's diagnosis. Uh, the neuroevidence, um, such as imaging or uh, neuropsychological testing, it could be neurochemical studies or blood chemistry studies, can also provide a separate basis for a diagnosis uh, where there might be, for example, findings of metabolic disorders, lesions of the brain, um, and these can the uh, neuro evidence may even provide um, evidence that is separate and apart from what the underlying um, psychiatric or psychologic diagnosis may have been able to do. The second issue here is it requires there be evidence uh, that the defendant is suffering some current functional impairment, current meaning at the time of the trial. It is not relevant or it's not dispositive whether the person was competent at the time they committed the offense. Uh, and this actually relates to the first um, uh, discussion in this particular session, the very first one, which um, she described that people who have a mental disorder may not be impaired at all. They may be fully functional. And so what the competency law here requires is um, some mental disorder and related to some functional impairment in the aspects of the prior slide, as I mentioned. But you can imagine here um, where neuroimaging may be um, helpful for this functional impairment. So it could be, for instance, that the neuroevidence can make a, a connection between the mental disorder and the intellectual um, disability, as well as a symptom of, or in, help explain a symptom of either the mental disorder or the functional impairment, and then tie it to some kind of brain function. It could be, for example, the relevance of a head injury, which the per defendant may have suffered because of military service or a serious auto accident, for example. There's also in these cases a common concern about the defendant malingering, i.e. they're faking either the mental disorder or functional impairment to get out of being prosecuted. And the neuro evidence then may help with proving or disproving whether the person, um, this particular defendant is faking and may be able to alleviate the concerns, for example, of the judge. Then there is another aspect that neuro evidence can be relevant to because the law here asks, can the subject be rehabilitated and be put on trial at a later date? Because even if one is the defendant is found incompetent at this time, doesn't mean that they're free of prosecution forever. If they are rendered competent at a later date, then they can be tried at that time. And the state does have an interest in prosecuting people who are believed to have committed criminal offenses. And so there's an interest when the person is competent that that trial continue for purposes of serving um, justice. So how has this the assessment model for competency been developed? And I just briefly go through this because then we'll progress up to how neuroscience is relevant. The original idea was that individual psychologists would do um, clinical interviews of the particular defendant and to assess their cognitive functioning and then to develop their own clinical judgment as to whether the individual defendant was competent or not. Well, at some point then in about the 1970s is um, in some states move these competency assessments to mental health hospitals under the aegis of psychiatrists who lent their, um, their skills and knowledge about medical diagnostics. 
and they focused on symptoms. They started then, the uh, psychiatrist started to develop a kind of process with a template uh, that was based on a psychiatric diagnosis as well as treatment. Um, and then they added on some questions that were relevant to the competency, competency as to the functionality that was previously mentioned. Well, by now though, the psychiatrist, uh, sorry, the psychologists were a little bit concerned that uh, what the psychiatrists were doing in terms of these questions of competency was not verifiable. And so the psychologists used, um, at least those who had training in forensics, then started to develop what were more standardized assessment tools uh, about competency questions. And, these, uh, and they improved these standardized tools to be more relevant to the legal question of competency relevant to the due process floor, again, that was mentioned before, um, to, and also to work on the reliability of these instruments. As an example of this, a very common one is the MacArthur Competence Assessment Tool for Criminal Adjudication. It is a, a paper and pencil test given to the defendants when they're being assessed to assess various aspects of their understanding, their appreciation of the criminal adjudication, reasoning, and communication skills. Uh, some of the questions are designed, at least from this particular standardized debt test, designed specifically for the defendant's case, but then other questions are more about um, using hypotheticals. Still, despite the um, benefits of this progressive movement for the standardized test, there are still prof some professionals that were concerned with whether even standardized instruments were reliable enough. But more importantly for our purposes uh, is a more recent progression was an interest in understanding more about what are some of the potential causal and contributing factors either to the mental or to the mental disorder that's relevant or to the functioning or actually uh, malfunctioning in terms of the competency questions. And therefore we have the role of neuroevidence. We bring this to this regime then is the legal organization in the psychiatric forensic assessment, which is the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law, importantly have come out with um, several standardized manuals for the forensic psychiatric assessment of competence specifically. Um, as early and importantly, as early as 2007, this particular um, organization then was highlighting the import, potential importance of uh, neuroevidence to these assessments. For example, um, it mentioned the idea that the assessor, if there are imaging studies that are available, they ought to be reviewed. Um, and this was reiterated in the 2018 um, update of it, now the practice resource for this. And also these manuals are important because they assist in explaining that neuroscience tools are contemplated as useful to um, competence uh, uh, assessment uh, for some of the reasons that I have stated. But now these particular um, uh, uh, manuals are available to inform uh, judges, in, um, counsel, as well as forensic experts that there are now more standardized processes to follow and how important it is to have a multidisciplinary process, including bringing in the idea of neuroevidence. And then the final slide before I give it over to uh, my partner here is the textbook of forensic uh, psychiatry produced by the American Psychiatric uh, Association. Um, has a chapter on neuroimaging and forensic psych psychiatry. And more specifically within that is a section, uh, subsection specifically on neuroimaging and criminal competencies. And it has a pretty um, uh, interesting quote here that uh, we wanted to provide um, that gives you the basis for this. Uh, neuroimaging techniques, particularly when combined with collateral psychological and neurological, neuropsychological testing can help identify the existence of structural or functional brain abnormalities that might cause deficits in the, fun, in the fundamental abilities associated with the competence to stand trial. So in some, um, they're, the experts then in neuroscience are looking for to bring new tools and bodies and knowledge to the multidisciplinary teams and standards. And even though one final note is, even though I, we have mentioned here some of the psychiatric uh, forensic assessment tools is there are there are relevant um, textbooks and practices from the psychological uh, forensic psychology as well. So I will now hand this over. If 
I can figure out how to oh, how to stop sharing. There we go. Well, good afternoon, all, and I'm grateful to see that there are still a few people who have stuck around to listen to us having uh, played in a bar band through my college career. It's very difficult to take the stage last on a Friday afternoon, so I'm grateful to you, and I'm also grateful to my professional partner, Melissa Hamilton, for starting off our discussion um, as I page up to my starting point, just to comment, having actually worked on casework with Robert Sapolsky and knowing some of uh, the speakers who've taken the dais this afternoon, part of what Melissa and I are talking to you about is operational information about neuroscience in the courtroom. You've heard a lot of overarching discussions. Uh, essentially almost philosophical discussions uh, and policy-based discussions about neuroscience and law. What we're talking to you about is what's operational, issues that actually surface on a daily basis in adjudications throughout the country. Neuroscience and the neuroscience techniques and methodologies tend to surface most in higher-end litigation either where you have a demanding judge, where you have a judge whose system allows sufficient funding of mental health, forensic mental health practices in court, federal courts, death penalty cases, for example, but also where you have well-trained forensic scientists and well-trained lawyers. So I start us out on a, on a slide that makes reference to a guy who was uh, who started out his career as a lawyer who became disenchanted with the law, who became a licensed psychologist and became disenchanted with psychology because his interest was the intersection between law and psychology. And what he saw is that the mental health professions were not answering critical legal questions. The tools of the forensic mental health or the mental health professions were not really addressing relevant questions. And Jay Ziskin, for those of you who are law students and are contemplating going into practice as practicing lawyers, Jay Ziskin is at this point, he's deceased, but he was one of the persons who actually began promoting the notion that forensic mental health is a specialty area. It's not sort of a casual excursion for people who are in psychiatry and psychology and want to spend time in courts. Melissa talked about the fact we wanted to also explain to you that there is a line of thought and Francis Shen has actually written a bit about it in his work about skepticism of neuroscience in court. And part of the reason for that skepticism is skepticism of people like me, meaning a practicing criminal defense lawyer who may get his greasy little hands on an expert who uh, may actually come to court either misapplying or overstating the, uh, the the realities of what neuroscience tools like neuroimaging tools, like metabolic uh, measurement devices, brain, brain uh, metabolic measuring devices, what neuroscientific tools can actually bring to the table. Part of the reality that exists and part of the reason why I think neuroskepticism is still around but is slowly and grudgingly giving way a little bit is uh, that uh, those who are on the scientific end of things, and this um, quotation is from an article written by three uh, medical professionals two of them neurologists, who, who are explaining that lawyers and scientists come to court with different agendas. Now this, interestingly enough, I would say from the viewpoint of a lawyer is an overstatement of the thirst for objective truth that's shown by scientists in court. And I say this because if you look to see the recent history of 
bench sciences and uh, identification sciences in courtrooms. It was actually lawyers who most recently disproved the notion of the uniqueness of fingerprints, which would have been considered a, a almost heresy uh, about 15 years ago, had, had uh, there not been zealous advocates who were taking a look at the science and were seeing some chinks in the armor and we're seeing some holes in the verifiability of some of the theories. And the same is true, generally speaking, in what's going on about the advent of neuroscience in court. Uh, science professionals are right to be concerned about advocates overstating what the science says, and that's part of the concern about neuroscience in court. But at the same time, as these authors point out, there are contributions that brain imaging, and remember, neuroscience is not only brain imaging. Neuroscience has to do with the areas of science that analyze brain function, with some of the philosophical issues that have been discussed here today, with the notion of brain chemistry, brain structure, br uh, brain metabolic, uh, or the, the uh, metabolic function of brain tissues, uh, brain electrical activity. This explains why organizations like the American Psychiatric Association have put out papers that on the one hand uh, point out that there have been great advances in clinical neuroscience. Clinicians use neuroscientific tools to um, address various issues in brain function. Uh, on the other hand, one of the concerns is that in addition to the benefits that neuroimaging and some of the neuroscience methods can bring to the table, there are concerns not to overstate the correlation between, for example, what's shown in neuroimaging and the ability of, uh, uh, of the requisite professional to actually link a particular imaging study to a definitive diagnosis of psychiatric illness. And to be clear, in courts, when you are presenting evidence about competence or when prosecutors are trying to demonstrate uh, either that the defense's evidence is overstated or incorrect, or when prosecutors may be taking the position that an individual is competent when the defense is claiming that she or he is not. Part of what people are doing is bringing in information from a number of different areas of sciences, not just the neuroscience bit. Examples of what might actually be produced would be, for example, there was a volumetric study, a brain volume study, a brain density study uh, brought to bear in a particular case. And there's a wealth of the literature. This is just one example of that literature that has correlated cognitive decline with uh, a change in gray matter volume over time. Older individuals who have pronounced changes in gray matter volume may show signs of dementia. So it makes sense that a court or the parties in a case where the theory is that there may be dementia involved would look towards this kind of information. Similarly, memory problems, which tend to be tested or screened for initially using psychological tools, can be screened for, can also be investigated using imaging studies. Based on, if you take a look at the bottom of this slide, you see there's an article cited that goes back quite a ways to 1995. Research has been going on in this particular area for some period of time. So the notion is there has been a robust developing uh, arena of neuroscience that's been focused on the assessment of decline in memory and in language processing, uh, 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 the achievement of a slightly better understanding of what areas of the brain are implicated where you see a decline in certain functions. So. 
let's give you a, a specific example, kind of a, uh, it, an example that covers quite a bit of the field. Uh, I, Dr. Kassam is a board certified pediatrician, has a successful practice, and all of a sudden he is suspected of committing federal offenses. He's overbilling federal agencies for medical services. Further investigations done by federal authorities, and he seems to have been losing a lot of money at casinos. And we heard a little bit earlier today about the neuroscience of gambling disorders, uh, but that's not the focus here. What happens is Dr. Kassam ends up being hospitalized after having had uh, a heart attack. He's been in a coma for some period of time comes back out of it, miraculously seems to be doing better, actually passes his renewal pediatric boards, resumes his practice of pediatric medicine, and then is brought into federal court where his lawyer says, you know, one day this guy seems to be doing well. He's right on the right page. He's responsive. He seems, he's jovial. And the next day his mood has changed. He's tangential. I can't get him to focus. He doesn't remember things. He is volatile. And uh, as a result of the behavior, a number of studies are ordered. 10 different experts are brought in. Neuropsychologists, let me just read quickly to you from the list that's set out by the judge. The judge points out that in this inquiry, there uh, is a neurologist, there are neuropsychiatrists, there are neuropsychologists, there was a neurosurgeon who were brought in uh, and there's a specialist in nuclear medicine, all of whom are brought in to shed some light on some aspect of the claim dysfunction. A government expert hypothesizes this guy seems to, he, he's an unusual presentation for someone who has dementia. But at the same time, there are some experts in neuroscience who look at various forms of imaging and brain metabolic studies who say, um, you know, we see this kind of inconsistency in the psychological testing, but if you look at the longitudinal testing that's been done of this man since he's been hospitalized, it's clear to us from a diagnostic standpoint that there is evidence to support the notion he has dementia. That gives the judge a greater amount of confidence that uh, there's a good reason to err on the side of finding this man incompetent and at least adjourning the proceedings. So you have other examples that are on these slides of situations in which someone is either acting out in certain ways or seemingly being unable to assist counsel, uh, unable to understand uh, his own position in relation to the legal proceedings in which Again, the inquiry is into dementia, and uh, to be, I, I do want to underscore that there are more conditions than dementia that are investigated through the uh, the assembly of neuroscience, uh, more conventional psychological evaluation, forensic evaluation, psychiatric evaluation. Last couple of observations for those of you who are thinking of becoming courtroom lawyers. Interestingly enough, some researchers have looked at instances in which Strickland error or claims of ineffectiveness in representation in criminal cases were looked at. And you see that in cases in which there was a reason for lawyers to at least consider the involvement of neuroscience, just under a third of the reported cases in which such uh, factual predicate exists, defense counsel were found to have inadequately used neuroscience, meaning usually people either didn't know enough to, to try to consult with a neuroscientist or did not bring neuroscience to bear and were found essentially to have likely committed some form of malpractice. So we leave you with the thought that uh, 
but a truism uh, in terms of competence assessment. And remember, the basis for competence assessment is essentially humanitarian, and it's also ethical, and it also has to do with basic constitutional values. We want to ensure that the person who is facing criminal sanctions, who is facing trial, is present and is able at least to participate in, in a way that recognizes his or her autonomy. Turns out that the feeling is that neuroscience has been underused in this area. And so our feeling is that neuroscientists are a valuable part of the picture. They're a valuable part of the set of individuals who can produce useful data to courts in these settings. And the, to the degree that there have been concerns about sort of overstating the reach of neuroscience, that may actually occur, but it probably will occur less in competence assessments than it would elsewhere. So thank you so much for having allowed us to present. And uh, I know both of us appreciate it and uh, wish you a very good weekend. Dr. Reed, did you want to ask some questions to our final panelists of the day? Yes, you have to activate, activate my video, however, because I'm getting a message saying you have deactivated it. Okay, now we'll start it. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. Yes, I have questions for each of our speakers. Thank you again for participating. And I'll begin with, um, with Tammy. Uh, oh, I'm getting another message that the video has been stopped. Allie? Your video is on, Dr. Reed. It is on. Okay, then I'll just uh, get rid of that message. Okay. Tammy, I will begin with you, if, if that's all right. And um, I see in your paper, you make some very in interesting, important points about um, compulsory treatment and about it, its potential for human rights abuse. At the same time, however, you also discuss um, the question of uh, conditions of detention and uh, questions of, of unsound mind, uh, to use the legal language. Uh, unsound mind um, is by definition a form of, 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 of mental disability. So I see a tension in your paper. We, we have on the one hand uh, a, a, a freedom protected by human rights law. Uh, not to be compelled into mental uh, treatment, uh, psychiatric treatment. On the other hand, we may have a class of, of disabilities, unsound mind, uh, legally recognized at law, where uh, a, um, a defendant uh, may be uh, greatly benefited by treatment. How do we resolve that tension between, the one hand, free, it, it, it's a tension that replays itself continuously in American law, and I don't think we've answered it perfectly domestically either, but how do we resolve that tension in international law? Okay, um, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, that was exactly why I brought out those two, um, those two topics. Because yes, on one hand, um, the condition of detention in the mental institution, in mental institution, has to be discussed because there's this. Um, um, how do I put it? Because usually the standards and procedures usually um, do not comply with human rights standards. But at the same time, we have to understand that there are people that have mental disabilities and they need to be confined in mental institution. But just because they need to be confined does not, and that doesn't give um, is, um, mental institutions the right to degrade these people. And that is why um, I mentioned uh, some cases because it is actually quite common in mental institutions where we see people with mental disabilities being treated inhumanely or being treated as the, um, as the law puts it in and degrading treatment. So that's why I brought out those three cases to show where the courts 
and decided that these are the these are the and these stipulations are what would amount for um, are what would amount for um, are what would constitute a inhuman and degrading treatment. So, yeah. <laughs> I think I don't know. That's just what I can say for now. Yeah. Oh. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah, can you? I, I, yes. I, I think the key that unlocks the. Uh, this dilemma that solves this dilemma might be, let me propose this to you and, and see what you think, might be a robust notion of human dignity. Bring in the concept of dignity as it has been developed in international law and focus on the dignity of those found uh, of unsound mind. And perhaps dignity may, in the particular case, uh, suggest some form of, uh, of medical intervention done appropriate to the, the, the individual's uh, position. Does that, might that be a, a problem, a way of relieving this tension? Yes, you are very correct. Because um, when we view disability as a human rights issue, we'll be made to focus on the inherent equality of all people. So yes, focusing on the dignity of persons with mental disability, we, and enable us to also ensure that their human rights are being protected. Well, thank you, thank you. And, and I have uh, then uh, uh, questions for, for uh, Rose, if I might. And um, you, you um, make the point that the quality of uh, the use of signs uh, the quality of argument is often very, very poor in front of state legislatures. And so it leads me to the question, why? Is it a, a lack of sophistication on the part of the, um, the advocates uh, or a, a strategic division, a decision on the part of the advocates? that legislatures may simply require things, if I may say so, to be dumbed down? Or is it uh, possibly the lack of sophistication on the part of, of state legislators that uh, they need something presented to them simply without a lot of, um, a lot of scientific uh, overlay? That's one question I have for you. And if I can turn the pages on my notes, I'll have another one. And that is why are doctors the least represented before legislative committees? Um, I'll suggest possibly a lack of, uh, of organization or perhaps a sense of disciplinary restraint, but I see that as very puzzling. I see that as, as, uh, as a question in need of uh, a further answer. I'll, I'll let you uh, develop those points, thank you. Thank you. Well, both very good questions and both I'm not 100% certain I can answer yet, Dr. Reed, but they sort of might form the next steps chapter of my dissertation when, you know, you know what, what further questions are raised that we would like to explore from this. The, the first point you made about argument being poor and asking why, well, often the argument scored, well, I say often, but some of the times the argument did score good, it just wasn't uh, underpinned with scientific authority. So there wasn't evidence to prove that argument. It was a successful uh, argument, perhaps. Yes. But not um, necessarily a scientifically valid one. Exactly. And maybe maybe sh we should value the success. Yes, possibly. Uh, when I um, plot my uh, grades on the grid and I break it up to the four quarters, um, I, I call that bit my, my bluff zone, you know, you're, you're putting things forward, but what, what's under, to underpin it? And your point about whether the legislature needs it in this sort of dumbed down form is a really valid one. And my, my undertaking my research, I've started to realize, actually, is there a huge scientific literacy issue? Um, and, you know, this was spoken to by 
by some of the speakers today about how, how lawyers interact with science, how do politicians interact with science? They're not scientists. Um, so is it just that it needs to be communicated in this manner to them? And I, I'm afraid I don't have the answers yet, but it has given me more questions to ask. I have uh, met some state legislators. I know some state legislators and I know that they're not scientists. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, uh, well, um, Additionally, as well, some, just as a point of interest, I noted when I was reading these documents, some in some of them, you could see that there clearly had been some sort of letter writing campaign that had been organised. As to whom it had been organised by, it wasn't always clear, but you would see the same language repeat itself um, throughout various different pieces of testimony. So there obviously was some sort of or, um, campaign organisation behind it, pushing it, sharing these ideas that young people should be less culpable, I say should with, in italics, be less culpable for their crimes because of their developing brains. Um, so pushing these ideas through, but again, not communicating them with the, the authority to the legislature. Um, going to your second point about why the doctors are least represented, again, I don't have an answer, it raises more questions. I wonder whether either they are unaware that this is how they can communicate with the legislature, or whether they are taking alternate routes to communicate with the legislature, and this isn't their primary source of, of putting forward this science, whether there is, you know, and obviously we know, you know, currently there are obviously scientific advisory boards which are uh, do are involved in, in legislature. In the UK, we have something called SAGE, which is taking on a, a significant role in the COVID um, situation. So whether they've, they've, they've dis, you know, dismissed this as being the way of engaging with the legislature. But what this, I mean, as far as I can't answer those, but what I can say is that citizens are mentioned in this science. These ideas have filtered through. People are interested in them and they are trying to communicate them to the legislature as a theme we're interested in as your citizens. So whether then obviously as our elected representatives, this should be reflected in um, our legislature, I, I, I think is at least an interesting finding, if not the answer to your questions, Dr. Reed. Well, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And then a question each for um, Professor Hamilton and, and Mr. Phillipsborn. And um, that is um, to um, uh, Professor Hamilton. And uh, we sp uh, you, you spoke uh, repeatedly of, of neuroimaging and its role in, in the courtroom. And um, I am wondering, uh, let me pose a, a question here. Do we use neuroimaging as frequently as we do in the courtroom because that is the sort of data that works with judges, uh, that judges like, let's, let's draw a, a crude uh, division between hard data and soft data. Hard data might be the, uh, uh, the, uh, the neuroimaging, uh, something that is, is visible to, uh, and, and clearly explained and visible uh, to a judge or uh, as opposed to, let us say, a, a psychological evaluation written up after uh, some hours of, of therapy? Is it simply that forensically, probatively, uh, courts like neuroimaging because it gives them something hard to go on? That's my question to uh, Professor Hamilton and to, um, to John Phillipsborn. You made the point uh, that um, uh, it takes, uh, High-end litigation is where we see these issues raised most frequently, and that raises immediately in my mind issues of equal access to justice. As, as you know well, we have a crisis in the United States uh, of unequal access to justice. It, 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 it's, a, it's a profound shame uh, on the United States that we have this inequality of justice. And uh, so let me ask how do we begin to address the, the, uh, the inequality dimension of this? Because I, I think clearly that uh, that was something you, 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 you did not touch on, but uh, I, I, I suggest considering. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, very good questions. Um, in terms of the focus on neuroimaging, um, as one of uh, Mr. Phillips' slides indicated, is a picture is worth a thousand words. So even though there are other types of neurological evidence, 
it's the you know brain imaging just resonates and you're right with judges is that it's it is more observable to them than a psychiatrist or a psychologist um, giving a diagnosis um, it is um, and then when you have you know a, a expert that's able to articulate and point to parts of the brain and you know indicate here is a malfunction or here is brain damage uh, that just resonates with judges um, it, as well as uh, even though neuro evidence is relatively new, the idea of brain damage being relevant to criminal behavior and, and, co and as well as uh, cognitive ability has been known for much longer. So that particular piece of information uh, has been um, understood by even civilians for quite a, a longer period of time than a lot of this other types of new stuff. Um, but very, uh, I think your observations are um, various. Thank you. Um, so Professor Reed, maybe just a quick word on question one, uh, as somebody who's actually presented uh, neuroscience evidence in court, J just so it's clear mainly to, again, to students who might be looking on and who are trying to get a picture of what it means to present evidence in court, uh, the reality is today, again, if we're talking about high-end litigation, the presentation of whether it's evidence from a diagnosing psychiatrist or psychologist or from a neuroimaging expert is going to be much more extensive than having a talking head in the courtroom. And um, at first, while it was true that the emphasis on presentation of neuroimaging uh, studies was to point at a screen, Today, a lot of uh, a lot of the explanation that goes into uh, neuroscience-based testing, neuroimaging uh, testing results, has to do with how you produce those images, whether the images are actually uh, useful, whether they're pointing to the correct areas of the brain, to whether they whether the technology is localized, the issues. So it's fairly sophisticated stuff. And again, as you know, uh, if you happen to have a, a cultured judge, a, a smart person who has an understanding of the science, then you get high end uh, consideration of well presented evidence. If uh, there are unequal, um, it, it, if there's either unequal knowledge in the courtroom or to get to your second question, a lack of resources, sometimes you're just stuck with a picture uh, that may or may not tell anyone anything. So on your second point, as you pointed out, uh, equal access to courts, equal access to justice is uh, a scandal to cut to the chase in certain parts of the United States. But to, to try to blend our discussion today with uh, your question, um, if you're talking about people who are litigating in federal courts that are funded by Congress, when Congress uh, um, has been relatively generous, you have a system in which funding uh, uh, tends to be more generous uh, of, for the presentation of, of uh, this kind of evidence when indigents, when poor people are the defendants in cases, you probably get a higher quality of access in federal court, although even that depends on what part of the country you're in. But, but uh, like many older lawyers who've been around for a while, I'm, I'm involved in groups that are litigating right of access to resources and, cor and courts in parts of the country in which uh, we're still debating whether people should get uh, paid for lawyers, whether Maine should have a, a state public defender system, whether Louisiana should be finding people's um, files from Hurricane Katrina. Uh, whether Georgia should have adequately funding defense. So that is a major issue and probably the subject of an entirely separate conference 
about the topic of access to justice. And I'm glad you brought it up. And the last thing I'll say on that is the problem that you mentioned is aggravated by COVID and by the fact that the fabric of our courts today has changed. What it means to be in court, in jail, subject to trial in the days of COVID is very different. And imagine in places in which judges don't have access, ready access to the internet. There are no internet facilities in a jail and jailers aren't bringing people to court. How does that working out? So a uh, very vital topic you brought up. Well, uh, Professor Hamilton, uh, John Phillips born and everyone, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we have some questions from the chat. For these All right, we should go to the questions then. Um, so one question we have um, is for uh, Mr. Phillips Warren and Dr. Hamilton. Um, this person is wondering what your thoughts are on the possibility of neurological evidence indicating that someone is not competent to stand trial, but all other evidence, including the defendant's own statements, indicate that they are competent. Should the judge disbelieve or disregard the neurological evidence in that case? Well, uh, the reality, uh, I, I think, the questioner may be thinking of a scenario that that probably does not exist the way the questioner asked the question. Um, people who are the subject of competence assessments will be interviewed. It isn't the statements to police that may have occurred six months earlier, or a year earlier. Uh, it's uh, the the forensic interviews that occur of the individual will be part of the picture, but it's not only what the person says, it's really a sum total of the, of, uh, the picture that's arrived at during the assessment. Even if neuroscience isn't involved, uh, the, the weight of the evidence usually given by a judge will be on a, um, and I've sat as a judge, uh, a, on occasion in criminal proceedings, um, the weight of the consideration will be on the quality of the report you're getting from the mental health professionals. And you, your attention may be called to uh, how coherent and uh, seemingly capable the accused is. So in that sense, the, uh, the statements will figure, but otherwise they may not. Was muted. Thank you so much for that answer. And then we have one more question also from the chat for Rose. Um, and this person's wondering if there's a danger of undermining the legitimacy of judicial of the judicial or the legislative process by relying too heavily on scientific advice in a system like the UK or the US that at least purport to base its legitimacy on the support of the people generally. Sorry, Ali, could you just repeat that, please? Yes. Is there some danger of undermining the legitimacy of the judicial or legislative process by relying too heavily on scientific advice in a system similar to the UK or the US that at least purports to base its legitimacy on the support of the people generally? Right. Yes, well, I mean, what is what is good about uh, the state legislative committee public hearings is they are open to the people generally. So these are when you know when, when I talked about who are the authors, they are citizens, they are the people, they are the electorate who are is presenting this science to the legislature. So I don't think that that science coming in through that route would undermine um, the legitimacy of the legislature. Um, however, what what could be a problem and what is a problem is science is uncertain. It evolves. What is true in science one day is not true in science the next day because as we um, gather more evidence, our conclusions change. But law requires finality. Law it needs that certainty, and obviously it takes time and effort and and a vast legislative process to change a law. And when we see it change. It then, in response, you know, may take a very long time to evolve. So, for example, um, in the tough on crime era, the late 80s, early 90s, every single state in some form took some sort of action, legislative action, to sweep more young people into its adult criminal justice system in response to what they saw of this perceived um, uh, increase in juvenile crime. That then abated around, you know, the, the mid-90s um, and now states are slowly trying to roll that back and we are 
you know, 20 years later, and they're still trying to roll it back. So this this finality is what I think possibly could lead to some undermining um, here. So hopefully that, that answers the question. Thank you so much for your questions. Um, given the fact that it is almost 345 and we're after our running time, I think that we might have to leave the rest of our questions from our audience um, for a later time. But I want to take a moment to extend my deepest gratitude to all of our presenters today. Um, your words have been, it's absolutely a fabulous symposium. Thank you for all of your hard work, all of your dedication. Thank you for responding to every single email I sent you all, particularly because there were quite a few. Um, I also want to extend my thanks to Dr. Reed, our faculty advisor um, for moderating today. I also wanna particularly thank um, Dean Fisher for opening his remarks today. Um, Jack, who has been my right hand through this entire process. I literally could not have done this without you and our journal couldn't have done this without you. So thank you so much for that as well. Um, as well as Carl Erickson, Shannon Ekman, who were our backup tech people today as well, and the rest of our board, of course, our entire journal membership as well. Um, there are three people in particular from the university I need to thank. Um, Carrie Hilger, who designed our entire program and put together all of the graphics um, and all of our marketing materials. Um, Angela Dizik, who is our event planner at school, who helped guide me through setting up the Zoom webinar and how to navigate planning an event in a virtual world. Um, and of course, Xander Moser, who was our resident IT guy on hand today, who has literally saved us multiple times throughout the day and has taken every question, every email, and truly was absolutely integral in making today happen. So thank you to all of you. Um, Jack, do you wanna end the day? Yeah, I just wanna thank all the panelists again for taking the time to be with us today. We really appreciate you contributing to our journal. And I reiterate all of Allie's thank yous. And I wanna give Allie a huge thank you for making this happen today. I saw how much time she put into it and navigating all the communication with all the panelists and everyone on our journal and Dr. Reed. So we really appreciate it, Ali, and the symposium couldn't have been better. So thank you for all the, oh, sorry. Oh, there we go. If I might uh, add a bit, I would like to reiterate, Ali, Jack, and the other members of the journal, you've been fantastic over the last couple of months as, as we've organized uh, this event. I wanna thank you both, I wanna thank you all. Uh, for participating, uh, for, for helping with, with the, the event. And I want to thank all of our participants, all of our contributors. I look forward to, to reading uh, your, your, your written texts. Uh, I think we have the uh, promise of a great uh, journal here, a great uh, collection of essays that will advance the field and, and I think will accomplish real and substantial justice in, in a number of areas of, of law thanks to what has been said and done and, and explained here. Thank you so much to everybody. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a lovely rest of your Friday and a fabulous weekend.